Good afternoon. I'm going to call the. Um, good afternoon. Yoo hoo! <laughs> That's what I say to my dog. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to call this meeting of Collingwood Council on Monday, March 18, 2024, to order. Uh, we're going to start with the reading of the land acknowledgement, and Councillor Houston will be doing the honors today. For more than 15,000 years, the First Nations walked upon and cared for the lands we now call home. Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe, and many others who are families, friends, and communities the way we are today. The Town of Collingwood acknowledges the Lake simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty of 1818 and the relationship it establishes with the original inhabitants of Turtle Island. We acknowledge the reality of our shared history and the current contributions of Indigenous people within our community. We seek to continue empowering expressions of pride amongst all the diverse stakeholders in this area. We seek to do better and to continue to recognize, learn, and grow in friendship and community, nation to nation. Thank you. And I'll just acknowledge that uh, Councillor Perry is joining us uh, remotely today. Welcome. Thank you for being there. Uh, next item on the agenda, I'm looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. The recommendation before us is that the content of the council agenda for March 18, 2024 be adopted as amended. There's two amendments. The first is bylaw number 2024-021, which is added. And secondly, T2024-03, the 2023 investment report also added. Uh, Councillor Potts, seconded by Deputy Mayor Fryer. Um, all, any comments or changes? All those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest today? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, as per my previous declaration of a non-pecuniary code of conduct disqualifying interest uh, due to a relative owning the property, I will ask that 7.2.1 be severed for P2024-05, the section on 500 Hume Street, as I won't participate. Um, in addition, I would ask that uh, that item be handled after the other two. And if it is successful, uh, then there'll be the bylaw at 9.1 that I also would stay out for then. Thank you. Are there any others? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're on to community announcements. We'll start with you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, on April 4th and 5th, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Grey Bruce and Simcoe West will be holding their 44th feature fundraising bowl for kids' sake here in Collingwood. Information can be found on the website, graybruce.bigbrothersbigsisters.ca. Hope to see everybody out. Uh, on March the 8th, I represented council at the flag raising for International Women's Day. Joining were councillors Doherty, Potts, Ring and Baines. Executive Director Allison Fitzgerald of my friend's house also participated and provided very important remarks about the future or further commitment that needs to continue to eliminate bias, discrimination, and violent treatment of women. I express Council's appreciation for their vital contribution the my friend's house staff and volunteers provide toward making Collingwood a better community in this regard. Uh, they are seeking to build a new facility and donations are always uh, welcome. Uh, and that is at their, you go on their website at uh, myfriendshouse.ca to get further information. Finally, on March 13th, I also represented council with councillors Jeffrey, Doherty and Ring at the Heritage Award presentation to Terry McDougall and Stuart Hunt, the owners of 20, 291 and 293 Pine Street, formerly known as the Stoutenberg House. Their house is actually outside the Heritage District, but as with most of their neighbours, commitment has been made to restore to the original. I express Council's appreciation for their community-minded efforts. Heritage Committee member Margaret Mui was on hand as well, so I conveyed Council's appreciation to their tremendous efforts. She happened to show me her brochure for one of the uh, 2024 walking tours, and it's extensive. Uh, great job, because it's certainly a, a difficult task. And those were all that I had, Mayor Hamlin. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeff Brown. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Hamlin. And I too also enjoyed that. It was a great celebration of the uh, heritage designation and the, the award. 
Um, so firstly, the Calling the Blues uh, begin their playoff run for the second round uh, against the Oakfield Blades on Friday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. So we have that to look forward to. And um, coming out of the Hockey Battles Cancer by the Collingwood Blues organization, the chemotherapy care gift totes have now been ordered and are available while quantities last. If someone you know is about to undergo is under or is undergoing chemotherapy treatment, please refer them to admin at seawoodblues.com or visit with a blues executive during the game, or you can phone me and I will make sure you get connected. And... Um, so I just, uh, Mayor Hamlin, wanted to add to your uh, media statement with respect to the Premier's visit. And I also want to extend a, a few appreciations, um, particularly to MPP Saunderson in arranging the hospital tour and a visit with the Collingwood Blues organization as the defending Ontario champions. Um, I'd like to also thank the other four mayors who supported and allowed us uh, to get to a position where a Premier would come and look at our hospital. And um, I was also pleased that the Collingwood Blues organization introduced some arena staff that were available on hand to the Premier, recognizing that their contribution is what makes our arena so great uh, for the hockey players to play in. So I thought it was a, a great um, gesture on behalf of the Blues. So, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you, Worship, um, to this evening, um, or I guess this afternoon. Um, the first uh, is uh, to remind the public that there will be a public consultation for the Master Transportation Plan um, on Monday, March 25th, between 6 and 8 p.m. at the th on the third floor of the Collingwood Library. I know there's uh, many members of our community who have a great interest in this project. Uh, so this is your opportunity, although it will not be the only one. Uh, and uh, secondly, just um, to wish uh, all of those in our community who are celebrating Easter or Ramadan over the next couple of weeks, um, all the good wishes uh, for these high holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Houston. Uh, just one announcement from me. Uh, Saturday, March 30th, the downtown BIA will be celebrating Easter. So from 10 o'clock to 3 p.m., the Easter Bunny will be in downtown Collingwood handing out treats. At 10 a.m. in front of the Collingwood Museum, the BIA will be hosting an egg hunt for children 10 and under. And then throughout downtown, between 10 and 3, will be uh, special eggs hidden in store windows. And uh, you can pick up a ballot from town hall and, and count the eggs for a chance to win prizes. That sounds good. <laughs> uh, Councillor Potts, go yeah, ahead. Thanks, Mayor Hamlin. Um, the directors of the Collingwood Sports Hall of Fame are inviting the residents of our community to submit nominations for consideration uh, for the member induction of the Collingwood Sports Hall of Fame. Nominations within the builders, athletes, and team categories will be accepted uh, with a deadline of Friday, March 29th uh, at 4.30 p.m., and those are to be submitted to the Collingwood Library. Um, in May of 2024, a press release will be issued to recognize these honoured individuals and teams from our sporting dinner and ceremony planned for fall of 2024 and just to note that this does mark the uh the 50th year since the hall's inception in 1974 so any questions there's the sports hall of fame website or i can certainly be contacted through the town of collingwood website with my my uh contact information thanks Oops. Councillor Ng. Thank you very much, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, I'd just like to add to uh, the comments by Deputy Mayor and Councillor Jeffries about the uh, Heritage Award going to uh, the residents on Pine Street. Just an uh, interesting uh, tidbit I'd like to add to the end of it. Anybody that's been a long-time resident in Collingwood knows that, that that home was known as the Stoutenberg Home. And, uh, and something that I didn't realize, but this is one of the few if not the only one that has a heritage designation as a semi-detached building. So I just thought I'd throw that in. And uh, the Terminal Point Project Presentation, joined Collingwood Mu Museum staff for a presentation by the Town of Collingwood's Project Manager, Adam Gallant. Uh, Manager Gallant will dwell on into information pertaining to the terminal's history, present, and potential future. 
The presentation is tomorrow evening, Tuesday, March 19th at Simcoe Street Theatre, 65 Simcoe Street. The doors will open at 6.30 with the presentation at 7. Uh, admission is free, but the seating is limited. And just another note on the public library, um, uh, at the, or at the public library, at the Conway Public uh, Community Flagpole, uh, flag raising will be held in support of IT Starts campaign uh, on Thursday, March 21st at four o'clock. Uh, IT Starts, you'll see our, our little uh, display out in front of our desks, is an annual public awareness campaign led by the County of Simcoe that promotes and encourages collective action against racism and discrimination. And that's all I have. Thank you. Councillor Baines. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm pleased to announce that the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust's uh, next film in its Be the Change film series is scheduled for Wednesday, April the 17th. The film is The Last Stand, uh, a documentary specifically mm. on those individuals uh, uh, protesting, if you will, to preserve uh, old growth forests all around the country, actually. And uh, just a personal note to mention, following up on the Deputy Mayor's point about Big Brothers, Big Sisters uh, bowling on April 4th and 5th, I believe, I will certainly be attending, as I'm sure all my colleagues will, and we will attempt to redeem our performance from last year <laughs> and would <laughs> indicate to any uh, citizens who are willing to sponsor us by a donation to Big Brothers, Big Sisters, I'm sure it will incentivize us <laughs> to do better this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Just a couple of library announcements I have. Uh, the library will be running its first Deaf Cafe with Deaf Doula and Elizabeth Matos on Tuesday, March 26th at 2 p.m. in a safe space that is, the, that is an opportunity to increase awareness of our finite lives with a view of helping people make the most of their remaining years. You can register online through the library website or email Lori at lcrossin at collingwoodpubliclibrary.ca. And on March 26th at 3.30 p.m., the library will be partnering with Catulpa, Catulpa Community Support Services to offer an information session on the Ontario Autism Program. The session is aimed at those supporting a child with autism or those pursuing a diagnosis. You can register online at collingwoodpubliclibrary.ca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Um, I have always shared a keen interest in getting some post-secondary going in our community. And although nothing's happened yet, I just wanted to report where we are. Uh, so with Georgian College, uh, once I discovered that uh, there really weren't any college level courses being offered here, I started pursuing uh, Georgian College. and. Uh, some will recall I had a meeting with our community. I invited members of the community and council, and we met with some members and had a tour of Georgian College. And then there was a meeting with the business community in Georgian College, and then I went out and uh, also met individually uh, with the president. And I've been told, just wait, just wait. So anyway, the next thing that's happening is Georgian College is going to create a strategic plan. And lo and behold, I've been invited to participate in a survey. So it's this week. Uh, I have spoken to Councillor Ring, and he has great interest in uh, our college programs being expanded. So he's going to participate uh, in that discussion and uh, maybe take the lead on, on this college uh, business to get this going. So uh, just to let the community know, uh, still hot on this. Uh, Lakehead University is uh, also um, a post-secondary that I have been pursuing, particularly because they offer engineering programs. And we have a lot of engineering firms in our community that have told me that in particular is something they wish that could be offered here. Um, and uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, we were invited to come out myself and uh, Director uh, Valentine, who's the head of our Economic Development Department. And I'll just report we had a really positive meeting uh, with the senior administrators at Lakehead uh, in, at their Aurelia campus. They are great. They are just going on. They're on fire. I'm going to say that. They're on fire. <laughs> so they showed great interest. And uh, as soon as uh, there's more to report on this, I think we'll need uh, initiative from council to pursue that. So I just wanted to share where that was at. Um, also, as uh, as known now, uh, 
We were very fortunate to have uh, Premier Ford join us uh, in town hall last week and then do a tour of our hospital. Although I have uh, several people in the Premier's office that I'm close to, I have never had the opportunity to sit down with the with the Premier one-on-one -on -one and have a discussion. And I am so happy to report he was very attentive. <laughs> he listened politely, not only politely for half an hour, but he was very, uh, he, very he very much appreciated uh, what I was saying to him. And I started with, you know, the basics, which was, how has our community changed since 1986 when the shipyards closed? Because he hadn't been up here since then. So there was lots to tell, lots to say about what's happening here lots to say about what we wish would happen here with the province's support. Uh, and as Councillor Jeffrey mentioned, uh, we had the great fortune to be able to have him tour our hospital. And um, because he asked, because this was a working session and he asked we not to have hordes, uh, you know, around, this was kept um, a bit under the, uh, under the, uh, what would you call it? was not broadly broadcast, <laughs> except for those who were participating. So when he went into the hospital, there were lots of patients and doctors and nurses who had no idea who was coming. And I have to say, after the, oh my goodness, it's Doug, uh, the next thing people said was, Premier, we need a hospital. It was like, couldn't have been planned better. <laughs> So, uh, and I'll, also I'll just say a number of times uh, during the walkthrough, he assured everyone we met that we'd be getting a new hospital and he would move it along. Okay, he didn't give a date. <laughs> but anyway, I just took that as awesome that he came and he paid attention and uh, we'll all hope good things come from that. So the last thing I just want to mention are some uh, dates of significance here. Uh, there are three dates around spring that are celebrated in our community. The first one is Nowruz, which is the Iranian New Year, which is, celebrates uh, the first day of spring, the renewal of nature, and the promotion of peace and solidarity. That's March the 21st. And then Holi, which is a Hindu celebration on March the 25th, also marks the arrival of spring, the triumph of good over evil, and the sharing of community and good food. And lastly, of course, the Christian festival of Easter, uh, which this year is March the 31st, includes a celebration of spring, hope, and new life. So all these wonderful things happening uh, to celebrate uh, this time of year and um, those special ceremonies of each religion. Uh, this Saturday, uh, after the state funeral for the former Prime Minister, Brian Maroney, at 1 p.m., for all those who are, you know, I'm going to watch, uh, is Earth Day. Earth Hour is at 8.30 on Saturday, and this is the, jo the globe joining in to switch off for one hour and give an hour to the Earth. So uh, hopefully you'll also all join council in turning off your lights for an hour, 8.30 Saturday. Okay, that's it for community announcements. Uh, deputations are next, uh, and the first one is about the water levels surrounding Cranberry Lake. If I could invite Heather, Heather McCleary and Nick Best to come forward. And I can say I've had some discussions uh, with Councillor Baines, and he has a motion he's going to move following uh, the discussion. So go ahead. Worship, um, councillors, staff, and of course, thanks to all the audience for being here. Um, I'm Heather McCleary. I live at 15 Woodland Court. I'm the past president of our Condo Corp, and I'm joined by Nick Best, president of Tanglewood Condo Corporation, Locke McLaughlin, a Tanglewood board member, and Kevin Marshman of Woodland Court also participated in this presentation. On behalf of a large number of residents in the Cranberry Marsh area, let me thank Council and staff for this opportunity to discuss our concerns about the alarming speed at which the water levels in this area are rising. It is creating a serious impact on the wetlands, including the flora and fauna wildlife habitats therein. Mature trees are drowning, and because of the high water level, they are not being replaced by younger ones or other appropriate vegetation. We already have a serious issue with emerald ash borer, which is depleting previously healthy trees, so this makes tree loss in the area even more critical. It leaves birds and other wildlife without their uh, tra uh, traditional homes and environment, and it robs the marsh of the trees absorbing moisture to keep the water levels in check. If the situation is not remedied quickly, the residential developments that abut the Cranberry Marsh will be flooded as water is already pooled on their property. 
Next slide. Please. Oh, you're great. <laughs> this is a map of the area we are discussing. Cranberry Marsh is located south of Highway 26 between Cranberry Tra Trail East and Cranberry Trail West. It is a very large marsh area. A little bit difficult because I don't have a pointer to show everything, but I think most of you know where this is since you're here. The map also shows the six stages of the Tanglewood development, our area, Woodland Court, and the major culvert right under Cranberry Trail East, where the water should exit, heading to Georgian Bay. Next slide, please. The issue of ineffective water drainage has been brought to the attention of many town officials over the past few years. We have been in contact with more than 100 households in the adjoining area, and a number of them acknowledge that efforts have been undertaken periodically by town staff and officials in response to requests to address such issues as block drains, ditches, and culverts. Let me assure you, these efforts have been greatly appreciated. Slide four. However, we are here to tell you that the issue of water levels in the Cranberry Marshland area has yet to be resolved successfully. Indeed, the problem seems to be gaining momentum. In fur th with, further, with further housing developments looming, the final solution to the flooding may involve several town departments. We understand that the Nautawasaga Valley Conservation Area and other provincial entities may also have a role to play in assessing the current situation and assisting in finding long-term solutions. In the meantime, we think there may be some relatively quick and seemingly simple steps that can be taken to lessen the problems of poor drainage and flooding in these wetland areas. I'm going to address the impacts we are seeing in the area, and Nick will discuss what might be causing some of the problems and make some suggestions for fixes. Well, what we are seeing. Slide five. While the comments that follow are focused primarily on the marshlands surrounding the wood, Woodland Court area, we want you to know that water levels are rising across the extended Cranberry Tree uh, marshland area, as attested to by residents to the west as far as Silver Creek, to the east as far as Harbour Street, and to the south between all of Tangwood and the Georgian Trail. Just look at that gentleman in hip waders on Dawson. We have been led to believe that the Cranberry Marshland was initially intended to serve as a primary, if not sole drainage solution for the entire area we are speaking about. At the outset, prior to the increased number of residential developments, the marshland was able to effectively serve this purpose. However, water levels in the Cranberry Marsh have risen significantly, which has caused the shoreline water to increase dramatically. Slide six. In 2002, when the homes were built on Woodland Court, and until recently, residents could walk, snowshoe, and snowmobile the Cranberry Marsh Trail and connect to various other trails in the area. We have indisputable evidence of the terrain during this period. George Christie, when asked about the water levels during the previous years, remembers using a lawnmower to keep the trails passable. Under the direction of George Christie, a boardwalk construction project commenced in 2016 on the eastern section of the trail, starting near one of the paths uh, cutoffs to Highway 26, and just immediately behind Pretty River Academy. The boardwalk has been extended section by section annually over the ensuing seven years, enabling, enabling partial use of the original trail. Slide seven. The photos in the previous slide and the current slide illustrate the significant increase in marsh water levels over the past few years. The section of the trail beyond the existing boardwalk remains unusable and the viability of the boardwalk itself is now under pressure as water levels surrounding Cranberry Marsh have continued to rise unabated. In January 2024, water levels on the Cranberry Marsh Trail were measured at 29.5 inches in depth and within three inches of the boardwalk deck at the 725-foot mark from the Pretty River Academy, Cranberry Marsh Trail's junction. At some points, the water level is at the same level as the boards in the boardwalk. Now Nick would like to discuss the, discuss the causes and um, what we can do about it. Next slide, please. Thank you, Heather. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Councillors. What do we think are some of the causes? Slide eight, 
Uh, firstly, this situation has been created in some significant measure by changing water flow patterns caused by the numerous current residential developments. It will be exacerbated even further by those being now constructed and future ones. As we know, developers typically cut down all the trees, remove the topsoil, and add three or more feet of fill. This changes the terrain considerably, and hence they are required to produce stormwater studies for town approval. In 2006, a major stormwater management report was requested by the town when Sierra Building Group sought permission to build a series of developments called Tanglewood along Cranberry Trail East. This report looked at the entire watershed area draining into the Cranberry Marsh. The report by Crozier and Associates is dated May 2007. One of its objectives is, to, is set out in paragraph 3.1 sub 4, which states, and I quote, for future developments north of Georgian Trail that drain to Cranberry Marsh, including Tanglewood, we recommend stormwater mitigation measures that can be implemented to maintain Cranberry Marsh water surface elevations at existing levels without causing upstream or downstream impacts, end of quote. When looking at the final recommendations, there is nothing dealing directly with this objective. Earlier in the report, there was a reference to open ditches being used, but in our opinion, this has clearly not worked, as these open ditches have not been maintained and are now largely blocked by trees and shrubs, and we know that the current level is well above what it was in 2006. We should point out that water levels when we took the measurements in January of this year are deeply concerning, given that the levels during the winter season are typically significantly lower than those in the spring and early summer months. Slide nine. Secondly, the culvert and ditch located at Cranberry Trail East and Woodland Court, the only water exit for the marsh, was recommended by the Crozier Report to be built to withstand 100-year storms. It was. However, it's not working effectively now to control water levels. The water flow immediately preceding the culvert entrance is impeded as considerable forest growth has fallen to block the necessary robust flow. The culverts under Cranberry Trail East and Dawson Drive have high levels of silt and water flow in the eastern ditch of Cranberry Trail East is impeded by vegetation and reed growth. The ditches themselves may not be sufficiently graded to facilitate good drainage. Simply put, the water is coming in at a greater rate than the water can and is getting out. Slide 10. Thirdly, we further suspect the water levels in the marsh area have risen in large part as a result of the numerous beaver dams in the area. It seems the inadequate drainage has created ideal conditions for the beavers, who simply accepted the invitation to move into a newly created paradise. Beavers pose a particularly challenging issue. What are our suggestions and requests? Effective and inexpensive solutions have been achieved in the very large Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve, southeast of Edmonton, Alberta. Pond leveling at Beaver Hills has enabled a wetland habitat for the beavers and other wildlife while simultaneously reducing flood risks and maintaining a forest environment. For particulars on this, please see the TVO documentary called Beaver Hills. David Moot, golf course designer for Cranberry Golf Course, is also proposing a form of Texas Dam, which allows for control of the water levels. This approach sees a rectangular horizontal drainage tile being installed below layers of varying gradients of granular material in the bottom of reinstated channels with the banks planted with wetland and coastal vegetative species designed to retain the integrity of the channels. Slide 11. As the town of Collingwood is one of the major owners of the Cranberry Marsh, we look to council and the town to resolve the water management issue around Cranberry Marsh on a priority basis through three separate initiatives. First, we seek the council's direction to town staff to clear silt, debris, and vegetation from the culvert, the ditch, and the area behind hole 17 of the Cranberry Golf Course to enable the unimpeded flow of water from the Cranberry Marsh to Georgian Bay. It's of note that a recent announcement was made concerning the clearing of the culvert and shoreline of the Pretty River Dyke. We suggest a similar program be conducted in the Cranberry Marsh area. 
We believe that this problem can be solved by creating a more effective exit route or routes from the marsh to the large culvert under Cranberry Trail East. Second, we request the council direct town staff to investigate the pond leveling solution utilized in Beaver Hills, Alberta, and the form of Texas Dam solution proposed by David Moot and report back to council on their applicability. Third, we request that <coughs> council and town staff and all interested parties undertake a comprehensive review of the water drainage flows in the Cranberry and Silver Creek areas with a view to implementing a new drainage solution that reduces standing water in the area so that forest habitat can survive and thrive. We, however, reiterate that a solution is required now. We cannot wait for a two-year study and a further two years to decide any future solution, how any future solution will be paid for and by whom. Slide 12. So in conclusion, we are hopeful, indeed confident, that by all parties working collaboratively, we can resolve these rising water level issues. We offer our help whenever and wherever necessary. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to the two of you and your group uh, for that thorough explanation of, you know, what appears to be a serious problem. Very grateful for your to coming here. And I know some of our counselors uh, have been out and uh, explored that area with you and the issues. Um, and council, I think I'll just move up uh, from the end of the agenda, um, a notice of motion uh, that Councillor Baines wants to bring, because I know you won't want to wait here for hours, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for that to come forward in the agenda. Thank <laughs> you, Your Worship. Yes, Shall I read the whole notice of motion then? Sure. Whereas the Cranberry Marsh and Creek watershed is reportedly to be approximately two feet, 0 0.60 meters higher, than the average level in the last 10 years, and this has been and has been this way for two years now. And whereas this high water level is dangerously threatening the adjacent boardwalk and causing many trees bordering the marsh to die due to the high water level. And whereas there are many stakeholders bordering the marsh, bracket condominium corporations, residents associations, Cranberry Golf Resort, trail users, etc who are alarmed at the high water level and are very concerned about the spring runoff expected within weeks. And whereas there are a number of regulatory bodies, bracket Town of Collingwood, MNR, NVCA, and others, who may have authority to effect change and take corrective action to resolve all or parts of this situation. And whereas residents groups, condominium corporations, Cranberry Golf Resort, and others have expressed concern and agreement to take what steps they can within their ability, as this is a shared responsibility of all stakeholders surrounding and utilizing the marsh save and accept the beavers, I would think. Uh, be it resolved that the Council of the Town of Calling would direct staff to report back on remedial steps that can be taken to lower the water level of the Cranberry Marsh as soon as possible in order to avoid a possible flood this spring. And that furthermore, staff consider recommendations to get all stakeholders together to discuss long-term solutions by all parties to ensure a manageable water level going forward. Okay, thank you for that. So that's read in. This will be uh, discussed and council have opportunity to ask questions to staff and so on at our next council meeting. Okay, so uh, you are free to go. There'll be no other discussion about this here, but you're also welcome to stay. It's fascinating here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our public meeting will be next. Oh, that was the hardest part so far. Uh, while, while they're clearing the room, Council, um, one of the staff who's in the back, no, they're not listening. I'll wait. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I was just going to. 
Hey, if, if you can speak outside in the hallway so we can continue our meeting, please. It's not best. Okay, the next matter up is going to be our public meeting. Can you just talk? Okay. Okay, so I'll just uh, read in the introduction. Welcome to Collingwood's public planning meeting for a proposed zoning bylaw amendment for the property municipally addressed to 7914 Poplar Road. This is located on the north side of Poplar Side Road, west of High Street. Just a note, no decision will be made today. The purpose of this meeting is to introduce the proposed development and obtain public comments on the planning applications. The meeting will begin with presentations by staff and the applicant. Members of the public will then be invited to offer their comments or questions regarding the proposal. Once the public portion of the meeting has been completed, no more public comments or questions will be allowed at today's meeting. I will then ask council members if they have any questions. Once all public and councillor questions and comments have been received, staff and or the applicant will have an opportunity to respond or provide clarification if appropriate. All questions and comments specific to the purpose of the subject applications will be addressed in a future staff report. It is very important that the town receive the correct names, email addresses and mailing addresses, including postal code, of individuals having an interest in these planning applications. If you plan to speak to the committee at this meeting, or if you wish to be notified of any future council or committee meetings concerning the application being considered, you must provide this information. Under the Planning Act, only those who have verbally expressed any comments here this afternoon or provided a written submission of any comments prior to council's decision have the right to appeal any decision of council to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And if you do not make an oral submission this afternoon or a written submission to council before council makes a decision, you may not be added as a party to the appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal, unless in the opinion of tri the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. This meeting is being recorded and streamed on the municipal YouTube channel and broadcast on Rogers TV. Your name, address and comments and any other personal information you disclose are being recorded according to the Planning Act, the Municipal Act and the Freedom, Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. All oral and written comments received will become part of the public record and made available to the applicant, committee and council. The minutes of this meeting will also be available to the general public on the town's website. I will ask that planning services also confirm that notification to the public has been given as required by the Planning Act within their presentation this afternoon. Again, I'd like to remind everyone that no decision will be made today and the application will be considered by council at a future meeting. Hello, go ahead, Hello. Uh, community planner Tickle. Good afternoon, council members, members of the public. Uh, my name is Justin Tickle. I'm the planner assigned to the file for proposed zoning bylaw amendment for lands municipally addressed as 7914 Poplar Side Road, also known as Summit View Phase 3. The lands are also subject to a draft plan of subdivision. However, today's public meeting is for the zoning bylaw amendment application. No public meeting is required for a draft plan of subdivision. Next slide, please. The agenda for this afternoon will follow the town's standard public meeting format. Mayor Hamlin has already introduced the public meeting. The remainder of the meeting will consist of confirmation of public notice, overview of the town's development review process, application summary provided by staff, and a brief presentation on behalf of the applicant. There will then be time for public comments and questions, followed by council comments and questions. Next slide, please. In accordance with the Planning Act, I can confirm that notice of public meeting was published and circulated on February 21st, 2024. Notice was given by ordinary mail to every owner of land within 120 meters of the subject property and published in the Collingwood Today online newspaper. Next slide, please. 
So this slide provides a general overview of the town's development review process. Pre-consultation was held with the applicant in 2021. The applicant submitted a complete zoning bylaw amendment application on November 28th, 2023. The application was deemed complete and a notice of complete application was circulated on January 5th, 2024. The application was circulated to various town departments and external agencies for review and comment. And that brings us to step six, the statutory public meeting. This afternoon, we received comments from members of the public on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Next slide, please. So the subject property is located on the north side of Poplar Side Road and west of High Street. The existing residential Summit View subdivision wraps around the subject property to the north and west. Town-owned lands in a lone single detached dwelling are located between the roundabout of Poplar and High Street and the subject lands. The property is approximately 6.89 hectares in area and is presently vacant but used for agricultural purposes. The applicant's agent, Corey Chisholm of MHBC Planning, is in attendance this afternoon and will be speaking to this application briefly following this presentation. Next slide, please. The subject property is currently designated as residential on Schedule A of the town's official plan, as are all surrounding lands to the north, east, and west. Lands to the south of Poplar Side Road are within Clearview Township and identified as rural within their official plan. Next slide, please. As shown uh, on the left of this slide, the property is currently zoned Holding 6 Residential 2nd Density, or H6R2, on the west side, and Holding 6 Residential 3rd Density, or H6R3, on the east side. As shown on the right of this slide, the purpose and effect of the proposed zoning by amendment is to rezone the subject property to Holding 6 Residential 2nd Density Exception, H6R2X, and Holding 6 Residential 3rd Density Exception, H6R3X, to facilitate a proposed residential subdivision. The proposal would also shift the boundary between the two zones to the west and rezone portions of the subject lands to recreation or rec to facilitate pub public parks which I'll go over in those uh, more detail on the next slide. Next slide, please. The proposed plan of subdivision is not the application for today's meeting and is subject to further refinement through the review process. However, the plan does help to illustrate the proposed zoning bylaw amendment that we're here to discuss. On the left of the screen is the proposed draft plan of subdivision. Lots on the west side of the subdivision in light yellow are proposed to be zoned holding six second density residential exception. The proposed use for lots in this zone would be for semi-detached dwellings. The exception requested is to permit 50% lot coverage for a bungalow semi-detached dwelling and 45% for a non-bungalow semi-detached, whereas 45 and 40% are currently applicable. Lots generally located in the middle and east portion of the property indicated in orange are proposed to be zoned holding six residential third density exception. The proposed lots in this zone would be for townhouse dwellings. The exception requested for this zone is to require 50% maximum lot coverage for bungalow townhouses, whereas currently this provision is silent for bungalow townhouses. Areas shown in green, with the exception of Block 41 in the far northwest corner, are proposed to be zoned recreation or rec for public parks. The red line indicates the approximate boundary between the two zones currently on the property. The boundary between the yellow lots and the orange lots slightly to the west of the red line aligns with the proposed zone boundary. I've also noted on this slide a driveway connection from the proposed Street B to the town-owned lands to the south, which has been identified through technical comments to provide for vehicular access to the town-owned lands. As such, area zone for recreation in that area may be refined prior to recommendation advancing to Committee of the Whole. Next slide, please. In terms of comments received to date, Planning Services has received some plan, uh, public comments. One letter signed by 13 residents of Lockerbie Crescent requested inclusion of local convenience commercial uses, expressed concerns regarding dust from future construction, and a desire to preserve trees along the southern portion of the eastern lot line with High Street. General questions have also been received from an adjacent resident on Archer Avenue regarding drainage. And lastly, one member of the public has expressed concerns with traffic from future development on the town-owned lands to the southeast coming through the Summit View subdivision rather than High Street. Planning Services has also received technical comment from a number of commenting departments, external agencies, and peer reviewers as listed on the slide. Technical review of this proposal is still underway and additional comments from agencies may be forthcoming. I would note the public comments, as well as comments resulting from technical review, will inform the future recommendation report and may result in further revisions to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Next slide, please. So next steps following this afternoon's public meeting, next steps include reviewing and considering comments received from the public, town departments, and external agencies, refining the proposed zoning bylaw amendment as necessary, 
and preparing a staff report with recommendations to Committee of the Whole and Council on the proposed zoning by amendment. It's anticipated that a recommendation on the draft plan of subdivision would proceed at that same time. Council would then render a decision to approve or refuse a zoning bylaw amendment and a notice of decision would then be circulated to all individuals and organizations who have formally requested notice and also would be published in the Calling with Today online newspaper. Next slide, please. Should anyone wish to submit comments or concerns following this afternoon, you're welcome to email myself, Senior Planner Tickle, or submit written correspondence to Town Hall. Members of the public can provide written comment up until Council renders a decision. Next slide, please. To stay informed, uh, members of the public can check the town's website on an ongoing basis to review committee and council meeting schedules and agendas, or alternatively, there is an option to subscribe to receive email updates regarding upcoming meetings of interest to you. Next slide, please. Planning services would also like to provide an overview of what constitutes formal notice under the Planning Act. The Planning Act requires that notice of complete application and public meeting be given to every landowner within 120 meters of the subject property and by posting notice on the property or by publishing a notice in a local newspaper. Planning Services goes beyond the Planning Act requirements by publishing the notice in the local newspaper and mailing notice to landowners within 120 meters of the subject property. The Planning Act also requires that notice a decision to be, be provided to each person who filed a written request for notice. Planning Services will endeavor to provide a courtesy email to members of the public who requested notice and or provided comments when a staff report is being advanced to Committee of the Whole or Council. Courtesy notices are not a requirement under the Planning Act. However, staff are working to ensure interested members of the public are made aware of updates to the development. We would encourage individuals who are interested in developments to visit the town's proposed major developments webpage to stay up to date on development proposals they may have an interest in. Next slide, please. If any members of the public wish to receive notice of council decision, please provide your contact details, including your name, email, and mailing address on the form provided in council chambers on the table over there to my left by the door uh, this afternoon, or send an email to myself at the email address provided on the screen. I'd like to remind everyone that the purpose of this afternoon's meeting is to, re to receive public comments and share information regarding this proposal, and no decision will be made today. This concludes my presentation, and I understand that the applicant's agent, Corey Chisholm, is here this afternoon and would like to provide some brief remarks on the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, and I apologize for not recognizing your well-deserved promotion to senior planner. I'll, I'll do better next time. <laughs> uh, yes, please come forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Hamlin, members of council, uh, town staff, and members of the public that are in attendance here today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Corey Chisholm. I'm a partner with MHBC Planning in our Barry office, and I'm here as the planning consultant on behalf of the uh, the owner for the proposed development. Uh, also here today, uh, joining me, uh, we do have a representative from the owner, uh, as well as from Tatham Engineering, uh, the engineering consultant that completed uh, the vast amount of the engineering studies and reports uh, in support of the proposed development. Um, before I get started, I would like to take the time to thank uh, town staff for their efforts to date on this file. It has been a collaborative and iterative process uh, to date. We have been having uh, discussions on this site uh, dating back to when we were working on the uh, adjacent development, which was done by the, uh, the same owner and largely the same uh, consultant team. Um, and we are uh, we have presented preliminary plans earlier in the process. We did go through the formal uh, pre-consultation process with town staff. Uh, and the plan you see before you uh, is the culmination of uh, some previous uh, changes that were made to address some of the preliminary comments and feedback uh, we had received through that process. Uh, Mr. Tico uh, had a very uh, detailed presentation, so I'll go through mine. I'll try to be quick uh, and then happy to answer any questions members of council or the public may have. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as, as mentioned, the location of the site is uh, largely at the northwest corner of the roundabout at High Street uh, and Poplar Side Road. Um, and it is, we, we view it really as an extension of the adjacent development to the north uh, and west. It is the same owner that's proceeding. Uh, they have owned these lands for some time and it was always envisioned uh, to be a natural extension of that uh, development. 
Uh, so as you will see, when we get to the plan, there were road connections accounted for in the previous development. So those were set when we came to, to lay out this site. Um, and another uh, nuance is the stormwater management pond on the, the adjacent site was sized to accommodate these lands. So uh, having one pond is, is typically more efficient than having two smaller ponds. Uh, so that's why uh, you won't see any stormwater management pond located on these lands. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I did briefly introduce uh, ourselves and Tatham Engineering. Uh, we also had soil engineers uh, involved in the project. Uh, and through pre-consultation with town staff, there was a very long list of uh, reports and studies uh, that are required to form a complete application. Uh, our client has worked through that process. Um, all of those reports and studies were completed uh, and submitted to form a, a complete application, which is why we're now here before you this afternoon. Uh, we have received a uh, first round of comments uh, on some of these reports and studies, and I think there may be some uh, that still are forthcoming. Uh, so following the meeting today, we'll see what feedback we get from council and members of the public, uh, and then we'll work uh, with our client collaboratively with town staff to address any comments on the various reports and studies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as mentioned, the site is designated residential in the town's official plan. Uh, there is a, a secondary uh, schedule, which is, isn't shown here, but it, there is a split density on the site. So typically the western portion of the site is within the town's low density designation, uh, and the eastern side of the site is within the town's medium density. Uh, that same split did continue northwards on the adjacent development, uh, which is for anyone familiar with that development, there are townhouses and semis. Uh, kind of skewed towards the eastern side of that site, whereas as we go west, uh, the, the built form transitions into uh, predominantly single detached dwellings. Next slide, please. So within those uh, different designations, there are bands we have to hit uh, for minimum and maximum uh, densities that are permitted. So in the low density portion of the plan, uh, it is a fairly narrow range. The minimum is 15 units per hectare and the maximum permitted is 20 units per hectare. Uh, this aligns with the area on our plan where the semi-detached units are proposed. And right now we're coming in right in the middle, uh, around 17.1 units per hectare. Uh, with the medium density portion uh, of the site, there is a larger ban with the minimum being 20 uh, and the maximum uh, up to 55. And we are coming in uh, just over the minimum at 21.7 uh, units per hectare. And that aligns where the townhouses are proposed uh, on the site in keeping with the adjacent development to the north. Next slide, please. So here's the schedule for the proposed zoning. And um, essentially that border between the, the hatching on the left and the stripe on the east is where that uh, density divide uh, lies. Uh, so the, the lands in the hatching on the left or west side is where the semi-detached units are proposed and uh, where the striping is is where the townhouses are proposed. And that denser hatching, as Mr. Tico pointed out, is the recreation zone that's proposed, which aligns with the two areas where there's proposed parks. Next slide. Uh, I'll actually skip over uh, these two slides. Uh, Mr. Tico went through the 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 details of the proposed zoning. Uh, I will just say for context, we are proposing the identical zoning that was implemented on the adjacent lands. Uh, so the different parameters, the setbacks, the lot coverage, uh, the height, that will align with the what's permitted on the adjacent development. And the only deviation from the standards in the town's uh, zoning bylaw is on uh, maximum lot coverage. And um, we are seeking uh, some increases of 5% uh, which was previously uh, approved on the adjacent development uh, and is in keeping with the approach uh, some other uh, newer developments have been taking in town. Next slide. So here you can see a, a colored version of our proposed draft plan. Uh, so the yellow color along the left is the semi-detached dwellings. Uh, those are 9.15 meter wide units, uh, which is uh, approximately um, 30 feet. Uh, and those would be the same size as the semi-detached dwellings uh, that are found within the adjacent development to the north. Uh, the orange color on the site is the proposed townhouses. And here there is a difference between the townhouses that uh, are now built in the adjacent development. Uh, the adjacent development had six meter wide townhouses, which are typically the, the smallest size um, seen across the town. Uh, and on this portion of the plan, we are proposing slightly wider townhouse units of 7.5 meters. Uh, the key design difference really 
from a width perspective, they're they're not dramatically wider, but it that extra width does provide the ability to uh, have just the garages attaching, and then that allows you to have um, a door out the back of the garage. So the interior units can get access directly uh, through their garage to their uh, rear yard, whereas with the narrower units, we're usually relying on a, an easement for um, the interior uh, unit owners to access their uh, their rear yards. Um, next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation, and uh, looking forward to hearing any comments from members of council and the public. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So uh, I'll start by asking if there's any members in the gallery here in council chambers who would like to address council. I'm not seeing any. Are there any online comments? Oh, yes, please come right up. Please come to the uh, microphone and name, address, serial number. My name is Andrew, Andrew Weiselreg. I am a resident of uh, Lanter Fly Hollow. And um, I, I understand that development is going well in, the, in, in Collingwood, but um, I have some objection regarding the urban uh, design because it's basically car friendly, not exactly people friendly. You have to use car to go to basic shopping, to to do everything in the new developed area. So uh, my my proposition is my proposal is to include some kind of the, for example, walking or uh, building. Uh, the area which you can have basic uh, shopping, for example, uh, you can walk basically for walking. Because right now, I think that in the world, you have tendency to go from car, from using car or transportation for walking is better for general health of the people. And I think that this direction should be including included in the uh, development of urban development in Collingwood. So thank you very much. This is my just only. Thank you for question. sharing that. And thank could you, you give us your address, please? 67 Lockerbie Crescent. Thank you. Thank you. Did I see someone else in the gallery who wanted to uh, step up? No? Okay. Uh, anyone online, clerk on this? Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, we do. We have the Collingwood Climate Action Team, I believe, uh, representative would like to address this application. Fantastic. Okay, go ahead. Mute. Here we go. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, you're clear. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor, Councillors and staff. Um, my name's Brian Vermander, and I am co-founder of Collingwood Climate Action Team and CCAT, as you know us, and I'm Director of Programs. I'll keep this short today to make a single point and request using this development as an example project. There are no new updates today on CCAT, nor the presentation we made last year, which included a discussion on municipal climate lands, process, and tools. Five years ago, the town declared a climate emergency, similar to many other municipalities. Many of these municipalities have actively implemented the use of a climate lens and process, along with sustainability standards. Five years ago also, CCAT was founded and we've grown considerably, and I'm pleased to say accomplished a fair amount. We have started an initiative called Greening Home Energy Program, which focuses on informing, educating, and mobilizing several audiences including developers, home builders, HVAC contractors and suppliers, and of course, our residents. And in summary, to reduce or eliminate their fossil fuel energy solutions for new and existing homes. New home buyers are looking for a healthy, green, low carbon footprint and affordable, clean operating costs for their homes today. 
anything built today or in the near future with fossil energy, that is natural gas for home heating, hot water, and cooking, which is the current paradigm, will continue to pollute and contribute to increased GHGs in our town and the planet for at least 10 to 15 years, maybe even 20 years, before the system is changed. The need and timing are even more urgent to take every opportunity action where we can now to implement known effective fossil free solutions to move us towards a low carbon and green healthy living. Retrofits are already underway and moving slowly. With the amount of forecasted new homes and potential business development for our municipality, it's crucial we deal with anything new now, not later because later is too late. The reports, studies, facts, cost comparisons are all now available and clearly show moving to a zero carbon operating solution for our residents in the town is viable today. Specifically, we recommend and request the town and Poplar Developments for Summit View Phase 3 development provide clean, healthy, affordable, efficient, green energy solutions to all new homes by installing cold climate air source heat pumps for heating and cooling, air source heat pump water heaters, and induction stoves for clean, safe, and healthy cooking. This is the positive action result to the climate lens question. Does this project lead to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the current scenario? Subject to the actual timing of this project, Poplar Developments and the town can take the lead with setting a new paradigm and produce the town's signature green, sustainable, with no emissions neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have your address, uh, please, sure. Brian? It's 19 George Zubik. Thank you very much. George Zubik Drive. Click on this. I think I see someone else has their hand raised. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is Carol. Carol, go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Great. Hi, everybody, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, I would like to echo Brian's comments. Um, I own a home that literally is adjacent to the back of um, the area, 55 Archer Avenue. Um, now, while I am a landlord, I, I live in Markham, um, I have spent most of my life in and out of Collingwood and plan to retire there. I would love to see Collingwood be proactive. Um, I keep very engaged, obviously. I'm joining today. Um, I love a lot of the work that you're doing, uh, whether it being looking at equality for women, uh, a lot of the sites that you've uh, developed, recognizing the Indigenous heritage, so I think that you have such a great opportunity. I also think this aligns directly with the flooding in the Cranberry Village area. So now is the time. So I wanted to echo, and um, I've never met Brian. He didn't ask me to call in and support him, but uh, that's what I'm doing because I would just love if if those homes would have alternate sources of energy and now's the time, so go for it. Okay, thank you. I, I did get your address. Could you just repeat your name again, please? Yes, it's Carol. And you may see on the screen, it's double R, double L, Blair, B-L-A-I-R. Okay, got it. Thank you for uh, taking the time to weigh in this afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else? I think we do have a number of attendees. If you would like to address council regarding this application, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And there's no further interest at this time, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. And in case anyone snuck in the gallery in the last few minutes, does anyone in the public in the council chambers wish to address council? Okay, seeing no, oh, yep, yeah, please come in. Come forward, I mean. Hi there, my name is Zach Cuff. I'm here representing, representing my sister, Jasmine Cuff. She lives right beside that property at 7940 Pop I believe. Her questions were just on the, there's like a right of way right to the west of the rezoning. It shows it separate, so it is going to stay 
or question one is whether or not I was going to stay that way and stay a path of some sort and not be taken over because they have put fencing past that onto her property at this time. That's it. Okay. Well, why don't you wait just for one minute? Let's see if we can get an answer to that. Sure. Uh, is this something uh, staff can speak to today? Yeah, great. Thank you. Senior Planner Chico. Thank you. Uh, so through you, Mayor Hamlin, uh, to the member of the public. So the uh, there is a strip, a narrow strip of um, town-owned land that I believe is a former um, road allowance to the west of subject property. It is separate from the subject property, so it's not subject to the zoning bylaw amendment itself. However, as part of the associated subdivision process, um, technical comments are considering that potentially being a trail. There is a connection to Archer Avenue at the north end in the existing Summit View subdivision that contemplates a connection there for something like a trail. Um, and in terms of the fencing, the as I understand it, the applicant has put um, fencing around the property to deter people from putting yard waste, et cetera, onto the property. Um, and the fencing does continue along Poplar Side Road in front of the town's property. My understanding from speaking with Public Works and Engineering is that they don't have any concerns with that fencing being there at that point in, or at this point in time, but it is there. So. And it'll come down, I guess, in the fullness of time? That would be my understanding, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, good. All right, uh, so I don't see anyone else wishing to address council on this. Uh, so I'll turn this, uh, I'll now close the public session of the meeting and I'll turn this over to council uh, to see if there are any questions uh, from council at this point. Councillor Baines, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Through you to Senior Planner Tickle or perhaps Director Valentine. A uh, question, if it was Council's will that, um, particularly in, in regard to reducing uh, carbon emissions, that some sort of convenience store uh, appear in this development, how would that be affected? Through the mayor to Councillor Baines. Uh, so right now there is no requirement for them to provide commercial in the existing official plan designations on the property. Uh, they aren't requesting commercial through the zoning. However, it is noted that members of the public, including the written comments received to date uh, from residents along Lockerbie Crescent have uh, requested that there be commercial consideration. So those comments have been provided to the applicant for their consideration. Um, but uh, as it stands now, it's not being proposed and it's not required by the official plan. And, and I would also just note too that um, as far as the south end of town, there is the potential or there, there is the designation and zoning for future commercial uses at here Ontario um, and Poplar. So for the southern end of town, that's kind of contemplated as the commercial node that would serve these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'll leave it at that at this point. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Hamlin. So I know in pre a previous development, I believe at the uh, intersection of Peel and Collins, uh, there was a commercial um, lot put in with that development with the same idea in mind, but I think it's been a lot of years and I don't know if there's a business plan uh, for commercial in these small neighborhoods uh, because nobody's kind of taken anyone up on putting business there. So an idea I'm keen with that might fit into neighborhoods more as a live work situation was earlier contemplated in um, the shipyards and, and was eliminated. And uh, I think that we would have more potential where a family could live where they work. Uh, but again, if you say it's not required, but I do think it's something we should uh, be considering as a council going forward, trying to add some of those services within a, a, a neighborhood and make them walkable in that way. Um, and I, you know, I, I really love the the uh, climate lens and um, trying to take a pilot project uh, and make uh, make it with no no emissions. Uh, I saw three significant projects uh, when I was in Prince George recently, and I know there's a lot of municipalities with a lot of great ideas. But at what stage can we ask for that or implement or or work with uh, with a, uh, an applicant on that? And I guess that would be through to staff somehow. I don't think it's this process. I, I think we can have the input, but I'm just not sure where it would come up. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, Director Valentine to speak on that. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to the Councillor. Um, these are certainly comments that are becoming much more 
co uh, common from the public, whether it's through the official plan review or through individual development applications. At this point in time, in terms of requiring certain heat sources like heat pumps or requiring certain fixtures or appliances, those are beyond the tools available to us in the, land, in the Planning Act. So for the zoning bylaw amendment in particular, as well as the draft plan of subdivision, there would be no um, legislative hook, if you will, to achieve those goals. Um, that being said, the province is looking at continuous improvement through the Ontario Building Code, for example, um, which municipalities would have to adhere to, which can address some of those items. And the town is undertaking a uh, community climate change action plan, which may also result in some recommendations and suggestions. Typically, though, municipalities have had to, f had to fund incentive programs uh, for developers to take advantage of, of the these sorts of forward thinking ideas, but you do have the entire developer team here today with you and they've uh, heard the comments and desires of, of the neighbors for some potentially more greener options. It's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potts. Thanks, Mayor Hamlin. Um, through you to uh, Senior Planner uh, Teagle with the stormwater and some pump water. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, I know there was talk that there was only, uh, there was gonna be the existing pond in the in the other development adjacent, but um, I know some developments have the, there's some pumps not piped in directly into a, into a separate uh, storm, which would take it to the storm pond. Is that, are we looking at surface drainage here or is it something that, I don't know what the other, development has currently, but if there is it an opportunity to be able to look at that. Thanks. So through the mayor to Councillor Potts. So uh, in terms of general drainage, I know that the majority of it for this property, as um, Planner Chisholm mentioned, is going to be directed to the existing stormwater management po uh, pond. I don't know whether uh, MHPC has anything to add with regards to sub pumps in the existing development. Thank you, come on up. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Evan Lundquist. I'm with Tatham Engineering, and I've sort of been doing the engineering design on this file. So with respect to sump pumps in the phases one and two of this development, so adjacent to it, there are storm service connections where the sump pumps pump up and into uh, connection to the storm sewer, and that is routed to the stormwater management pond. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Hamlin. Um, I think in addition to Councillor Jeffrey's inquiry, I, I just wanted to say uh, I su definitely support um, hoping that uh, we've had some success in the uh, affordable housing side with developer-led initiatives and, and the developers' representatives being here and hearing um, the concerns about uh, trying to come up with some unique solutions. Um, it'd be greatly appreciated if that's given some consideration and maybe something can be achieved. Um, I hear what the uh, director of, is saying about the fact that uh, really wholesale change probably is going to take provincial um, change. Uh, but uh, if we can cooperatively work with the developer, I, I'm in full support of that in, in the meantime. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, thank you. Any, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Um, I'm not sure who this goes through, but I'll ask the question, and if somebody wants to answer it, they will. Um, back to the uh, the heat pump uh, idea with uh, with the energy. There's pretty good in, in, in uh, financial incentives now to convert from electricity to to these heat pumps. Would that obviously apparently wouldn't apply to a developer? Uh, it had, because they wouldn't be converting, they would just be installing. Would there, is there any financial incentives that anybody knows about that uh, possibly a developer could look into? Okay, I'll open this to the world of staff and developer team. <laughs> uh, uh, Treasure, you have a thought? Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Um, so there are some um, some tax incentives uh, from a, a personal standpoint in terms of uh, federally that uh, changing from natural gas to heat pumps, um, they do provide a non-refundable tax credit towards the purchase of those heat pumps. Um, I believe it's in the range of around $6,000. I'm not a, a tax advisor, so I'm not going to tell you exactly the amount, but it's in that range. So um, by purchasing heat pumps, they receive a refund in paying that, so the net amount is really zero um, or close to zero or as close to zero as the uh, tax credit will allow you to. 
Go ahead. Just to follow up, apology. I think I asked to, to convert from electricity over, but it's it's natural gas. Okay, thank you. So I don't. Uh, yes, go ahead, Councillor Doherty. Uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I really want to echo the comments that have been made by my colleagues here and and also uh, the encouragement that we have heard from members of the public that have spoken today because I think that what they have um, cited as uh, opportunities for this development in terms of um, adding some sort of uh, retail or commercial services uh, and also to uh, execute this development with a climate lens. I think there are very important uh, and pertinent uh, to um, how we're trying to uh, plan this municipality today. Uh, also, I, I note uh, with interest that there are no single family development or dwellings uh, planned for this. Uh, particular site is am I'm correct there so uh, that that's an interesting um, evolution of uh, development applications and uh, hopefully uh, between that and the increased lot coverage and the densities that we're seeing that that is going to have naturally a favorable impact on affordability and if there is anything further that the uh, developer um, may want to consider or bring forward as we proceed through the, the final um, subdivision approvals, uh, we would uh, look very much forward to seeing them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, those have been a robust uh, set of comments from the public and council. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'm not gonna add anything. I think everything's been well said. And uh, thank you, thank you for coming. So I'll just, uh, sorry, I'll just finish off by saying yeah, the public portion of the meeting is closed in terms of submitting comments uh, to us here in chambers. But if there's anyone still who would like to submit their comments, please do by uh, forwarding them to our senior planner, Justin Teagle. And I'll just say his email is J Teagle, and that's spelled T-E-A-K-L-E -E at Collingwood.ca. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item 7.1. Uh, the recommendation before us is that the minutes of Council Committee of the Whole meeting held March 4, 2024, excluding the Committee of the Whole recommendations be approved as presented. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Potts, Councillor Houston, uh, any comments? All those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. The next, uh, is there any business arising from those previous minutes that council wishes to raise? I see none. 7.2, uh, this is a matter that uh, our deputy mayor indicated uh, he has a conflict. So I'm going to uh, pull out separately the approval with respect to 500 Hume and I'll read in the, the balance of it then. The recommendation is that the Committee of the Whole recommendations from its meeting held March 4, 2024 contained within the March 4, 24 council minutes be hereby approved as presented. CAO 2024-02 operational plan for this is for the 2023 year end accomplishments and the 2024 year start. C 2024 02 bylaw services division review, which is deferred to April 8, 2024, Committee of the Whole Meeting. Uh, the next one is T 2024 03 investment report. This is deferred to today's Committee of the Whole Meeting. And uh, lastly, PW 2024-05, semi-annual water and wastewater uncommitted hydraulic reserve capacity update. And I just note that the report is amended. 
I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Councillor Bain, seconded by Councillor uh, Ring. Any comments on these? All those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Uh, I note that uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer is leaving the council chambers. Uh, so the remaining recommendation is that uh, the committee of the whole recommendation from its committee of March, committee meeting of March 4, 2024, contained within the March 4, 2024 council minutes be approved as presented. And this is specifically with respect to E2024-05 proposed zoning bylaw amendment for 500 Hume Street, and this is a proposed restaurant. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Potts, seconded by Councillor Jeffrey. Any comments on this one? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. There's no staff reports, which is item number eight. Uh, this afternoon. Uh, number nine is bylaws and 9.1 uh, is the same matter that Deputy Mayor Fryer has stepped out for. So he'll remain out while we deal with this matter. The recommendation is that bylaw number 2024-019 being a bylaw under provisions of section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990 CP 13 is amended for prohibiting the use of land municipally addressed as 500 Hume Street for or except for such purposes as may be set out in the bylaw be enacted and passed this 18th day of March 2024. Mover and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Houston, seconded by Councillor Doherty. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Then that's unanimous. Thank you. And and uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer's returning. Uh, the next is a recommendation uh, that the following bylaws to appoint members uh, to other committees and boards of council be enacted and passed this 18th day of March 2024. Uh, I'm going to deal with all of these in one motion, and I can advise that our deputy clerk today uh, has let us know that uh, she has reached out to all those who are proposed to be appointed, and they've all accepted their appointment. So this is the list. Bylaw number 2024-020 being a bylaw to appoint members to the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Bylaw number 2024-021 being a bylaw to appoint members to the Collingwood Heritage Committee. Bylaw number 2024-022 being a bylaw to appoint members to the Museum Advisory Committee. Bylaw number 2024-023 being a bylaw to appoint members to the Trails and Active Transportation Advisory Committee. And lastly, bylaw number 2024-024 being a bylaw to appoint members to the Collingwood Police Services Board. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Potts, seconded by Councillor Doherty. Uh, any uh, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. We have three departmental updates this afternoon. Uh, the first one will be a presentation about development charges. Uh, and Hempson Consulting Limited will be doing the presentation, but we'll be having an introduction uh, by our treasurer, Quinlan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, as you mentioned, we do have, um, or we're very pleased to have Jackie Hall from Hempson Consulting here with us today to show us the preliminary findings of our development charge background study. Um, Hempson has been collaborating with staff since September to, um, to gather the necessary data and do the recalculation from our previous background study in 2019 and update it for this year. Uh, it's worth noting that we're doing two studies at once, as, as everyone is aware. We're looking at the water treatment plant one on its singular, singular basis, as well as the overall DC rates. Um, so Ms. Hall will guide us through both studies and the timelines for those. So please welcome Jackie. Thank you. Please come forward, Jackie. Good afternoon. Excellent. 
Excellent. So it's a pleasure to be before council this afternoon to speak to the development charges background study. Um, as the treasurer mentioned, we are doing uh, two separate studies as part of this process. And what I'd like to do over the next 10 minutes or so, if we could go to the next slide, I'll just pull up the agenda, uh, is chat a little bit about all the work that's been done to date and what's, what's occurring over the next several months. So just by way, a bit of background in terms of uh, what the town currently uh, collects development charges for, uh, other services that are being considered. Uh, we'll chat a little bit about the development forecast, so where and how the town is, is anticipated to grow over the planning horizons for the purposes of our study. We'll chat as well about the capital programs that have been developed in order to uh, inform the rate calculations, um, as, as well as the, uh, the summary by service as well, as there's various services that we're looking at through this process. Uh, I'd like to also review the draft development charge rates with yourself. So some of them have been made publicly available, specifically around the water treatment plan. Plant, uh, but we also have the draft calculated rates for other services as well, which we'd like to share with yourself today in advance of that study becoming public. Um, I'll also uh, provide a rate comparison. So where does the town sit in compared to other municipalities in the surrounding area? Um, it's a bit of a tricky thing to do because no municipality is alike um, and it's, it's hard to do a true apples to apples comparison, but we always get asked for it. So certainly um, I've prepared it for today. And then we'll wrap up with next steps and an opportunity to ask questions of clarification. Next slide. So uh, I, I uh, uh, was before council a few months ago when we initially kicked off the process and I, I chatted briefly about the Development Charges Act requirements and I thought it would be helpful just to provide a little bit of a reminder and context as to why we're here and what we're doing. So the current life of the town's bylaw is five years. Um, it came into force uh, back in September 1st, 2019 and so it expires September 1st, 2024. Uh, all new bylaws going forward as a result of legislative changes will now have statutory lives of 10 years. So um, you won't have to see me for another 10 years. <laughs> um, within that bylaw, uh, it's uh, we had a number of different services, which included administration, which is essentially uh, growth-related studies, uh, fire protection, indoor recreation services, library, outdoor recreation, uh, police protection, and what we call uh, services related to a highway. That's the proper terminology in the act. Essentially, that's roads and related services, as well as transit as well. Um, we, we did chat a little bit about two separate studies that are being prepared, recognizing the significance of the costs associated with the water treatment plant. Um, we thought it was advantageous for the town to bring forward that bylaw in advance of the townwide update. So we have parsed that out. That study was released on February 21st, 2024, and the statutory clock in terms of how we consult on it and when, when the count, when council is able to pass a bylaw, that timeline has started. And I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides. With respect to the other services that I'll be chatting about today, uh, that study is proposed to come forward in mid-April. So April 15th is uh, the latest we're proposing to release it. Um, and so uh, within that background study will be all the supporting analysis um, that details how we arrived at the rate calculations, which I'll be going through with yourself today. Next slide. Uh, with respect to the services that are included um, as part of this update, we, we kind of put them into two different buckets, one being general services, which includes things like libraries, outdoor recreation, which is parks, um, indoor recreation facilities, uh, administration, which is general government or, or growth-related studies, uh, transit, fire protection, and bylaw services. Just a couple asterisks, um, the administration or growth-related studies technically is uneligible uh, under the legislation that was part of the changes that were brought forward uh, back in November of 2022. However, there are rumblings at the province right now that they're contemplating bringing that back into, into the fold. So what we've done is calculated a rate. We're going to continue to monitor the legislation. If the town is able to do that, we certainly will be bringing that forward as part of the bylaw uh, for approval. And then um, certainly if that hasn't, if that change hasn't been made by the time we bring forward the bylaw, uh, we will be working with staff to take that back out. Um, but certainly it's an important project, um, an important service rather, so we certainly want to have it in there. 
Uh, bylaw services is a new service we're proposing to bring forward as part of this update. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. And police services, um, we do have that currently under the existing bylaw. However, we are proposing to remove it as part of uh, this work as it's not um, the capital infrastructure. Um, there isn't really essentially anything to fund through development charges. There's other revenue sources that the town uses in order to pay for that contract. Um, development charges can only be used for capital costs as well. So none of the operating costs associated with that contract can be funded through the development charges regime. So we've taken that service out. With respect to engineered services, that includes things uh, such as public works, so services related to a highway, um, as well as roads. Uh, certainly wastewater services, which includes both your linear infrastructure, the pipes, as well as the plant infrastructure. We also have water services, which is primarily linear, but there is some um, other infrastructure in there as well, such as pumping stations. And then we have brought forward a standalone rate category for the water treatment plant. We are reviewing how we've um, classified some of these rate categories. We might pull out the wastewater treatment plant as a standalone service as well. It doesn't impact the totality of the rate, but it makes it a little bit easier if we ever had to go forward and do an amendment to certain services in the bylaw, let's say um, uh, the expansion of the water, the wastewater treatment plant a tender came in, um, we could certainly do an, a scoped amendment for that particular service. So uh, certainly as we're bringing forward this update, we are trying to future-proof things as much as possible, recognizing that there's a lot of changes going on, not only with the legislation, but also with costs as well. Next slide. Uh, I thought it would also be helpful just to provide a little bit um, of a reminder of the key decision points for council. Uh, this is a requirement of the legislation and, and what uh, we will be asking you to do as part of this process. Uh, certainly consider and approve the development related capital programs that get brought forward as part of both of the studies. So that includes uh, the projects itself, um, the shares of projects that are growth related, the timing. Um, certainly you are able to make changes to that. It's a point in time analysis, but we are asking for uh, approval of those programs. Um, the legislation also requires that council consider area rating. That's another way of essentially saying area specific development charges. The town historically has levied town-wide charges. We aren't proposing to move away from that in any way. So we'll be bringing forward a recommendation, a formal recommendation to that effect. Council also uh, must consider whether or not to hold another public meeting. The legislation only requires that you hold one statutory public meeting. Oftentimes that's more than enough uh, in order to um, solicit feedback from the public and the development industry. We are proposing additional stakeholder consultation over and above that statutory public meeting, uh, which we're um, anticipating will be scheduled sometime this spring. And we are looking to hold the statutory public meeting for the overall bylaw in May and I'll talk about the statutory public meeting for the for the water treatment uh, plant bylaw in a couple of slides. Uh, council can also consider implementation options within the context of the legislation, as well as your other objectives um, of the town. So certainly there are exemptions and discounts that are statutorily required through the Development Charges Act. Um, however, council can decide to provide additional exemptions over and above that. Um, it is a revenue loss, however, and has to, meet up, has to be made up from other uh, revenue sources, such as property taxes or your utility rates. Um, so something certainly that will make council aware of through this process. Uh, but I will also review some of the statutory exemptions as well as uh, we are required to phase in the development charges now as well. So I'll get into that in a couple of slides. And then last but certainly not least is the actual formal approval of the bylaws themselves. Next slide. <laughs> So a bit of an update on the water treatment plant DC background study that was released uh, in February. It is essentially only related to the recovery of uh, the uh, new water treatment plant expansion. It is based on the most recent tender estimate of 270 million uh, with an assumption of 63% of the funding coming from the town of New Tecumseh. Uh, the rates have been calculated based on a 2024 to 2021 planning horizon, as well as the servicing needs that are associated with development over that time frame. Uh, and in uh, advance of that, the reason why we advance the water treatment plan DC background study, as I mentioned, uh, is 
one, we can do it as a standalone service. So if there are any changes to the cost in the in the future, if there are any sort of grants uh, that might come to fruition, we can certainly do amendments or look at making changes to that much more easily if it was um, rather than having it coupled with the townwide services. It'll have its own dedicated reserve fund, which is already required under the legislation, but once again, just kind of cleans it up a little bit um, easier. And we're certainly proposing to pass this bylaw in advance of the townwide one to make sure that we're uh, collecting development charges as soon as possible. So that's targeted for late April. Next slide. Uh, just quickly on the development forecast and the assumptions that we're using for the purposes of our calculation, uh, the development forecast has been informed by a, a number of different sources. So certainly uh, 2021 census data, um, very important to our analysis. Uh, Simcoe recently undertook their municipal comprehensive review in which they established uh, targets for the town. The town has since incorporated those targets into the new official plan, which is great. And so uh, we're essentially aligning with those uh, growth targets. Now, the planning horizon of the background study does go to 2041. The official plan goes to 2051. Uh, that just has to deal with, uh, that has to do with the timing of the infrastructure and um, uh, the um, information we have with respect to the capital project. So certainly as uh, we go through subsequent DC background study updates, I would anticipate that the timeline would be extended to 2051. But right now we just have um, a, a good idea of infrastructure essentially up to the 2041 planning horizon. So for general services, we, we typically use a 10-year. Virtually every municipality in Ontario does that. So things like library, fire, uh, parks, and recreation. Uh, so that's based on a planning horizon of uh, 2023 to 2032. And engineered services is based on a 2023 to 2041 planning horizon. Next slide. Uh, with respect to the growth-related capital programs, they have been informed by a few uh, different pieces of information. Certainly the previous background study uh, projects that were identified, uh, timing, scope, cost, we have reviewed uh, all of that in great detail with staff and updated it accordingly. The 2024 capital budget has also been an instrumental input to uh, the development charges rates as well. Um, certainly the latest cost estimates for the water treatment plan expansion, um, Tatham Engineering was retained as well to help update some of the unit costs on the engineering side, which is uh, very helpful considering that we're seeing um, quite significant cost escalations for engineering infrastructure, such as water, wastewater, and roads, um, and also discussions with staff. So recognizing where the growth is going to occur, uh, the projects that are needed in order to support that growth or, or meet the servicing demands from that growth, uh, we certainly brought that into the fold. Uh, the DC costs are adjusted for a number of things, including any sort of anticipated grants, any shares of projects that will effectively benefit the existing growth in the town, that has to come out. We're not allowed to fund that through development charges. If reserves are in a surplus or deficit position, we also account for that as well. Um, and any uh, shares of infrastructure that are oversized will benefit growth beyond the 10 year or 2041 planning horizon. Uh, we certainly have made adjustments for that as well. Next slide. So with respect to the uh, townwide capital program, I wanted to provide a summary of the uh, costs that have been brought forward. I appreciate there's a lot of numbers on here. I'm not going to go through every single one in detail, but it just gives you a bit of a snapshot as to the totality of the program that we're looking to bring forward as part of this update. So I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a moment on library. I'll, I'll pick on that service just because it's at the top of the slide here, and then I'll quickly uh, summarize the other services, but essentially for library, the total capital program cost is about 8.9 million. We're not anticipating any sort of grants or subsidies, so we haven't made any adjustment for that. There is about 800,000 in ineligible shares. So that relates to shares of projects that cannot be funded from development charges. So that portion of the cost has to be funded from other revenue sources like property taxes. Um, uh, I think we have a little bit of money in the DC Reserve Fund um, that's available to fund some shares of those projects, but it's not very significant. Um, or perhaps actually that reserves in a deficit position, which is why we're showing it as zero. Um, there are shares of projects that have hit uh, the maximum threshold that we can fund through the development charge. Uh, so about 4.6 million is deemed a post-period benefit. It's not that it's ineligible for DCs. It's just that it exceeds what the legislation allows us to recover for. So that will be examined as part of subsequent studies. So of the 8.9 million, 
3.4 million actually gets rolled into the rate calculation. Uh, the same applies for other services as well. And so if you look at the general services, I apologize on the development related forecast slide, I believe I said 2023 to uh, 2032. It is a 24, uh, 2024 to 2033 planning horizon. So of uh, the $202 million, only about 57.9 million actually gets brought into the development charges rate calculation. And that's a function of all the tests and deductions that are required as per the Development Charges Act. The red total at the bottom includes both the general services as well as the engineered services. So uh, the number is quite staggering at about 942 million. However, recognizing that a fair amount of that 270 million is related to the water treatment plant and about 170 million of that cost is attributed to the town of New Tecumseh. So that actually comes out um, off of the town's share. So once we make that adjustment, uh, we adjust for any sort of ineligible shares of projects, available reserves, um, any benefit beyond uh, the 10 year or post 2041 planning horizon, about 357 million or 358 million is actually brought into the rate calculation. So that's about 30% of the overall cost that's been identified. Next slide. So um, I, I also appreciate, again, lots of numbers on this slide, but uh, this shows the calculated development charge rates for residential uh, uses in the town. Uh, the difference between the two numbers you see in the table on the right-hand side of the slide is what we would call uh, development in the urban area versus the rural area. The distinction between those two is that you're, if you were to build a house in the rural area, you're not able to connect into water or wastewater services. You shouldn't have to pay for those development charges because you're not contributing to the system. So the difference between those two numbers is essentially just the water uh, and wastewater rates. So we have calculated a rate of $72,951 for a single and semi-detached unit. And uh, the rates vary based on unit type. So other multiples or what we would call row dwellings uh, would be charged a rate of $54,270, apartments 43,000 and uh, small, sorry, large apartments 43,000 and small apartments are 27,000. The pie chart on the right hand, or sorry, the left hand side of the slide uh, provides an overview of how uh, the, the percentage of those services that make up that rate calculation. So. Not dissimilar to what we see in a lot of other municipalities, parks, recreation, roads, water, and wastewater make up the bulk of the rate. Other services like library, fire, administration, bylaw, they tend to make up a lower component of the charge, and that's just a function of the cost of those services and also um, the existing service level standards that you have in the municipality. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I wanted to provide a comparison of the current rates uh, versus what we have calculated uh, for the purposes of the DC background study. So uh, the town's current rate for a single and semi-detached unit, that's what the SDU acronym stands for, is uh, if you were to go to the counter today, you'd pay about $42,855. The calculated rate for the urban area, which includes all of the engineered services, such as water and wastewater, is $72,951. Uh, that's an increase of about $30,000 or 70%. Now, the legislation does require us to phase this in, so it's not like in year one, once the bylaw is passed, it's the full 70% increase. So I'm going to talk about that in a couple of slides. But I did want to provide this comparison because once the phase-in is done, this is essentially the, the calculated rate over your current rate today. Next slide. Uh, this slide provides a summary of the non-residential rates. So in addition to charging uh, residential development on a per unit basis, the town also levies DCs on non-residential development based on per square meter uh, of GFA or gross floor area. So uh, with fully serviced uh, development in the urban area, that is calculated at $299.63 per, uh, per square meter. If you were in the rural area and you weren't um, connected to water or wastewater infrastructure, that would be $84.16. Similarly, we see uh, that the engineered services, roads, water, and wastewater make up the bulk of the rate. Certain services like parks and recreation, uh, they are not included in the non-residential rate category as those services are primarily driven by residential development. Next slide. 
On the non-residential side of things, uh, the town's current uh, urban rate is $196.39. As I've mentioned, we've calculated a rate of $299.63. That's an increase of $103.24 per square meter or 53%. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to provide some context to the um, phase-in that's required right now through the Development Charges Act. So right now, the, the legislation requires that municipalities can only charge 80% of the fully calculated rate in year one. In year two, that goes up to 85%, uh, year three, 90%, so on and so forth, 5% increments until you get to 100 in year five. So uh, in year one, uh, once the bylaw is enacted, uh, the increase would be 36% on a single and semi-detached unit. And then it would be phased in incrementally over the, over the five-year period to 2028, where we would fully levy uh, the calculated rate. Similarly, on the non-residential side, the year one increase would be 22%. Now, the province has uh, recognize that this can be problematic to municipalities. Um, certainly there are revenue loss implications with the phase in. Um, we have heard from the province that it is being reviewed. We don't know exactly what will happen with the phase in. Um, certainly it's something we're monitoring very closely through this process and we'll be reporting back. Um, I anticipate there might be some transition rules around it, maybe a little bit more flexibility, but right now this is what the legislation would require us to do if we were to pass the bylaw today. Some of the reasons for the rate changes, I know it's quite significant, the increase we've calculated, but there's there's a few different things at play. Um, we certainly have updated the capital program costs. We've seen significant cost pressures, especially on engineered services. We're now using a 15-year historic service level rather than a 10-year historic service level. Uh, we've certainly updated the development forecast as well to align with the Simcoe MCR work and the town's new official plan. And we've also removed or added some services. I will also note as well that development charges are frozen at site plan or rezoning and are payable at building permit subject to interest. So there are some transition provisions already baked into the legislation as well. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, I, I did want to provide a rate comparison. There are certainly challenges with this. No uh, two municipalities are completely alike, so it's really difficult to have this apples to apples comparison. But nonetheless, we get asked, so here it is. Um, and I do apologize, there's quite a bit uh, of information on here, and in part it's because the legislation now requires the phase in. So I feel it's important for us to show uh, not only the current rate, but also the year one rate and our fully calculated year five rate. So the current rate is shown uh, with the blue arrow, the year one rate is shown with the green arrow, and the year five rate is shown with the red. So we can see that the town right now, when we compare it to other municipalities in Simcoe, um, as well as the town of Blue Mountain, certainly uh, the town sits at you know um, kind of the mid-lower area of the pact. Uh, in year one, we'll see an incremental jump there uh, to, I would still say, kind of mid-range. And then in year five, we'd certainly see that um, uh, higher, uh, higher, lower, I'm sorry, um, the, the rate would certainly increase above uh, the year one to be more aligned with what we're seeing right now in places like Innisfil North and South, as well as uh, New Tecumseh. I will note New Tecumseh has not updated their rates yet for the water treatment plants, so that certainly is not included uh, in their rate calculation here. Um, the town of Blue Mountains has recently released their DC background study. Their bylaw has not yet been passed, uh, but we have included their draft rates in here as well. Um, so there's quite there's a number of uh, fairly significant cost increases that we're seeing um, in the town of Blue Mountains. Barry and Ennisville also recently updated as well, but certainly there's a number of minis other municipalities in here that we would expect to see updates over the coming years. Wasega Beach, Midland, uh, New Tech, as I mentioned, Bradford, Wisconsin, and Barry. We'll certainly see those uh, uh, municipalities update and certainly their position here in the chart would change as well. Next slide. So just quickly on the non-residential uh, rate comparison, um, comparing the retail rates or commercial rates that are levied uh, across the county and also uh, some of the neighboring municipalities in gray as well. Um, you know, the town's current rate, uh, similar to the residential position, kind of mid-lower of the pack. Uh, year one increase, I apologize, the green arrow should actually be two above that. 
Um, uh, so uh, Collingwood Urban Area Year One is just uh, just above Clearview uh, and the Creamer the Creamore area specific there. Uh, so moving that position a little bit, and then certainly the Year Five, um, the town's still relatively in the midst of a number of the comparisons that we've shown on the chart here. Next slide. So just uh, quickly to conclude, um, on the water treatment plant, as we are advancing that uh, study, um, we're certainly having the information session today to present some of our findings. Um, we are planning to host a statutory public meeting on April 8th um, in order to uh, hear from the public members of the development industry on those draft rate calculations. The idea is that the bylaw could be passed um, on April 22nd um, or potentially after that date, but that is the earliest it can be passed. If we go to the next slide, looking at the townwide study timeline, um, we are planning to release the background study, as I mentioned, on April 15th. Uh, the public meeting would be held in early May. Uh, we would be coming to committee um, in early June to present the findings, um, as well as uh, any sort of changes that had happened to the DC rates as a result of our public consultation. And then the idea would be is that the bylaw would be passed uh, on June 17th. So recognizing again, the bylaw does expire in September, so we have to have a new bylaw in place before that date uh, if the town would like to continue to collect development charges. And so with that, that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. So we can have questions. Yeah. Okay, so I think what we'll do now is just uh, uh, allow council to ask any questions they may have at this time. Of course, there'll be lots of time for questions. I think we're just starting. Councillor Baines, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, Ma'am, I've forgotten your name, sorry. Uh, it's Jackie Hall. Jackie Hall, right. Uh, excellent presentation, lots of facts. Um, fascinating, though. A question about the 10-year um, shelf life of the new bylaw that we would pass. So I understand uh, ratcheting up to 72,951 in year five. Do I assume that years six through 10 are set at 72,951 and we can't up that? Uh, yes, through the mayor, that's correct. Now, I will note as well that development charges are subject to indexing. So every year, mm -hmm. the town is able to index the development charge rates. Um, it's prescribed through the legislation. It's set out um, through Statistics Canada data. Um, and I believe it's done on an annual annual basis, yeah. So certainly the cost of indexing would be incorporated. Uh, and it, the tenure life of the bylaw does not preclude the town from opening up the bylaw sooner. So if there are master plans that become available, we see growth pressures occurring, costs that we weren't we didn't know about at the time of doing this study become apparent. Uh, certainly the bylaw can be opened or even certain services could be opened and amended to, to, to take account of that. Great, thank you. <laughs> If I may, Your Worship, sorry. I just wanted to add what uh, Ms. Hall was talking about. The one thing is that in that 10-year span, we used to have to do it every five years. They've allowed us the 10, but that doesn't mean we as the town won't say, you know, in three years' time, we see these really ridiculous cost pressures again. We could open it up. I mean, we don't want to necessarily in three years, but if we had to, we could. So just as a clarity. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and I echo Councillor Bain's uh, comments about uh, excellent presentation and a lot of details <laughs> to look at. Um, so I know I can look at the detail over time, and as you say, we're still to come to the public stage meeting. So I think what I wanted to do was talk more in generality and and uh, maybe get a lay of the land, um, in your opinion, as one of the preeminent uh, uh, ones in Ontario doing this service. Um, I watched Town of Blue Mountains last week, and um, there was multiple requests at the time about discussion with further with the industry. And that you mentioned that we intend on doing that. I think that's a good thing to put out to the to the uh, to the public and to the industry is that we're still in the discussion stages. Um, we have to bring numbers forward to council so that we get an idea of what we're looking at, and it's not uh, ingrained, and and we and we work at it from there. Um, so I wondered, in your opinion, um, based on maybe the last five that you've done in, in Ontario, and, and maybe more the, the smaller centres than, than the cities, I think it is a little different for cities, 
Um, are you are you finding they're going through okay? I, I know they're going to be looking at similar kinds of changes, significant 50, 60 percent types thing. Um, are you finding that they're going through without appeal, or are you generally finding that you have to deal with appeals too? Uh, yes, for your worship, that was a, that's a great question. Um, certainly, I would say in places where we are able to have those that dialogue with the development industry early on in the process, like what we're proposing to do now in advance of the statutory public meeting, I do find that that really does help to mitigate the chance of appeal because we can have that discussion and dialogue uh, prior to the bylaw being passed. Um, I, I, I'm actually quite surprised. I, I would say right now, most are going through without appeals, um, but Certainly there are areas, especially if there's new secondary plan areas being brought online, perhaps the infrastructure needs haven't been totally hammered out. There's some questions as to what's actually needed in there. That's where I'm seeing some of the appeals happen. Um, I, I don't think we have that necessarily in the town right now, um, but it's, it's hard to tell because any anyone can appeal the bylaw, unfortunately. So even if everything seems good through some of our dialogue, we could always get um, a surprise one at the end. Uh, follow up, if I may. Uh, yeah, and I, and I, what I was thinking about was uh, those first few that started to go through this particular phase where the infrastructure costs have ballooned so much. Um, you're probably finding that you kind of learn as you go a little bit too, and you're able to tweak your modeling that you're using. And and in our case, we're lucky enough to be a little bit down the down the curve. Um, so uh, I, I'm taking it that you're learning as you go as well on on kind of what is being allowed through the uh, through the appeal process. It's, it can be a good process because it's meant to refine the so that when we are coming to the others, it, it's getting through already. Are you finding that as well. Uh, yeah, through your worship. Um, th another great question. Uh, certainly as we move through appeal processes and things are adjudicated before the tribunal, uh, that certainly does uh, set precedents or, or changes the way in which we undertake methodologies. Um, so certainly we do account for that every time we come forward for a bylaw review, we do consider any sort of recent decisions that have been made by the tribunal, um, what we're hearing on the ground from other municipalities. Uh, one exercise that we've done as part of this update that I think is um, extremely helpful is retaining Tatham to do uh, the third party review of the unit costs on the engineered infrastructure. That is the bulk of the rate and typically the area that becomes a sticking point. Um, and so having updated unit costs, uh, especially because we're seeing them increase at a rate higher than what the DC index has allowed in the past. That's really helpful in terms of um, communicating with the industry. We've done our homework. We're bringing forward the best information. Um, and it certainly gives them uh, faith in the numbers as well. Uh, another one, if I may, Mayor Hamlin. Um, the other thing that's, and, and I've, I've been talking about this a fair bit over the last uh, Year and year and a half, I guess, or year and a bit, that we found out that the water plant was going to be so much more higher than than we anticipated. Um, we knew then that our DC was not recovering what it should have for the last five years and substantially. And and I think we've had a very good rapport with our development community talking about the impacts of that and and uh, and the impact going forward um, to 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 get things right. And so it's, I, I agree with you fully. The the communication part up front, um, I'm really hopeful that that helps uh, alleviate some of the some of the uh, possibility of appeal. Um, it's always there because the right is there. But the other thing I was just going to say is um, when you mentioned about the significant infrastructure costs, um, you, you noted the big three, water, wastewater, and roads. Um, you didn't mention stormwater, but I know you know stormwater is. And, and I, I've talked quite a bit about stormwater uh, in particular, one of those ones that uh, municipalities are going to have to start to look at a little differently than just incorporating it within. So um, I, we, we talked, I think the last time you presented, I said how uh, I, I see us having to have a look at uh, stormwater management a little different and, and possibly looking at a separate user rate for it. Um, I, I also noticed and just saw your comments on this, um, you did mention about Bill 23 impacts and and then you did say that you're monitoring very closely the uh, the um, uh, province's uh, indication if if they're going to allow the uh, some flexibility with the phase in. Um, and again, you haven't heard anything specific, but 
Um, is there anything kind of on the horizon that you're aware of that uh, that might be an indication at a particular time, budget time or something like that or, or whatever? Uh, yes, through your worship. Um, so uh, certainly uh, there's quite a bit of announcements that have been happening with the province along with uh, municipalities meeting their housing pledge. I think just last week um, there was another announcement from the minister indicating that he recognizes the pressure to keep municipalities whole with the phase in. Uh, so that signals to me that changes are probably imminent, and I would likely expect we'll see something before the passage of the bylaw in June, whether uh, for the townwide bylaw. Um, the water treatment plant bylaw might be a little bit tricky with the passage at the end of April, uh, but that background study does have a life of a year. So if we had to do a quick amendment to that bylaw, I think we could certainly adapt to that um, with not a lot of uh, challenge. So we can, um, I, I know, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a great answer, uh, but I, I think changes are likely coming very soon. I just, I, I think it was a great answer because okay. <laughs> it does show that the government's continuing to talk about it and, and the keeping us whole is, is very, very important. And the other part of it is, and I think it's being mentioned and it's important to mention again, we've undertaken the water plant expansion without any, uh, any particular funding um, because we have to, because we haven't been told about funding. But uh, hopeful that that, uh, that will come to fruition with all the efforts of everybody in that regard, including the development community, because obviously it benefits uh, them in their endeavors. So thank you very much for your presentation, and we'll be seeing more of you, obviously, in the near future. Yes, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, through you to our presenter today, thank you very much. It was a thorough presentation and uh, yeah, a lot of numbers. Um, just I had a question. Uh, is there an annual inflation rate built into these numbers or is it cost today? Yeah, go ahead. Uh Thank you, Your Worship, and, and through you. Uh, another great question. So all the numbers that are in the background study are in current day 2024 dollars. Because we are able to index the development charges on an annual basis, we use current day dollars, recognizing that we're allowed to apply that index in the future. So we are essentially accounting for those changes um, through the indexing of the rates. Good. Uh, and... Um... Okay, the the index the indices are adjusted annually or are they set at the beginning of the ten year cycle? Go ahead, Dr. if I may, Your Worship. Um, so with respect to the the index, we use the non-residential construction building price index, which is a big mouthful. And I don't know if you recall, but in November each year, we bring forward what the latest, so it would be quarter three of that year, and index the, um, the development charges based on that rate. So it does happen um, on an annual basis, and it's based on that point in time, what the index is saying. Now, one of the things that has become a little bit difficult is that um, when we look at the costs that we actually have seen, they haven't necessarily followed that index um, appropriately. So that's why we did move forward a little quicker with the water treatment plan. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Follow up. Um, so um, now with regard to the discussion about the phase in, um, the, uh, Ontario municipalities, uh, or at least AMO, are cautiously opti optimistic that that uh, will be eliminated or at least uh, greatly improved uh, from the point of view of municipalities um, because there's a, a very strong outcry, and legitimately so. Um, but with, that, with regard to that, so does that mean if the um, phase-in uh, is no longer required, that from year A to year B, we can immediately jump to the, the five-year max? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, through your worship. Um, it's a great question and actually something that we've thought a lot about because we do feel that there's going to be changes made to the phase in. So in any bylaw we've actually done since it's come into force, rather than putting the phase in directly in the schedules of the bylaw, we have included the fully calculated rates and have included language, a rule in the bylaw to say it will be phased in in accordance with the requirements of the legislation. So if there's any amendment to it, that would allow the town to then 
fully implement the rates without having to touch the bylaw, do an amendment and open it up to an appeal. So we've certainly thought a lot about how we can, um, as I said, future proof. We're, we're really trying to be cognizant of what we can do to set up municipalities to avoid um, uh, certainly having to open up the bylaw unnecessarily if there are legislative changes. Thank you. And then just one more, if I may. So, and then kind of along that vein, so as an example, um, and you noted administrative studies mm -hmm. are not uh, allowed to be incorporated right now, but if uh, after we pass the bylaw, they suddenly are, um, can we then adjust the rate on the on the fly, as it were, not having to reopen the bylaw just to add that in? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so uh, yes, the way in which the Development Charges Act works is that the DC background study has a life of one calendar year. So certainly we've included that service in the background study. If that change is not made prior to us bringing forward the bylaw, we won't include it. However, if something changes after June, when we do pass the town-wide DC bylaw, the town's able to include that service. We could rely on the background study that we're releasing in April, so long as that change happens before April 15th, 2025. I know it's a bit of a confusing timeline, but you're able to pass another bylaw based on the background study uh, that was made um, because it does have a life of a year. After that point in time, though, you would have to do what we would call a scoped amendment to then include that new service. So we're setting up the town to um, bring that forward should that be the case in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. So my colleagues have asked some very astute questions, and mine is one that will not be able to be answered, but it's a heavy heart thing. How do we possibly have a discussion about affordable housing facing this kind of a decision? I, I, I don't even know where to start because um, this will get passed on to the buyers for sure. And then there'll be some looking to us in terms of um, the waiving of the DCs to create affordable housing. And does it, this become unaffordable for us to start uh, entertaining those kinds of uh, considerations? And I don't know where we float it through to have that conversation, but I'm sitting here just very depressed about this information. I'll uh, let Treasurer Quinlan have a go at that one. Thank you, Mayor, Ham Mayor Hamlin. Um, so I, I think the one thing that um, from an affordable housing standpoint that we need to recognize is that Bill 23 is exempting affordable and attainable housing. It has not yet been given royal assent because there's still some, um, they're trying to figure out how they actually define affordable and attainable housing. So um, although I, I completely understand um, the angst when, when we want to try and continue to uh, bring forward an affordable housing master plan. But I suppose at the end of the day, uh, there it is imminent. This is going to happen. There will be an exemption of some sort. We're just waiting for them to define what they mean by that. And I think once they, it is defined, um, that means that uh, affordable housing would be exempt completely from a development charge. So that doesn't really come into play, again, once it is um, fully defined and has been given royal assent. Um, then the next question will be, how do we recover as a municipality um, and pay for that on top of that? So I think that's, that's a really great question. We're, we're getting down that road for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, CEO Skinner. Thank you, through the chair. I did also want to add a piece to that um, from a more philosophical point of view as well. One of the things that we do with the, the development charges is to expand things like indoor and outdoor recreation, uh, which ultimately when they're implemented within town are often supplemented as well by, by some of our tax dollars. And I do think that for folks that are looking for a more affordable lifestyle, moving to a community that has these things in place for their, you know, themselves and their children is a really positive thing as well. Um, and uh, we further here in Collingwood have a lovely policy uh, made uh, 
possible by uh, work in the past for an affordable recreation policy. So if someone still has a barrier to participation, uh, there's ways for children and adults alike to have some of their fees offset or fully paid if they can't take it, still can't take advantage of those things. So I like to think that while it's a little painful at times, even in this context that the, um, the treasurer has mentioned, it does overall benefit those looking for a, a full life in a more affordable context. Thank, Thank you. you. One more. <laughs> if it's okay, I'd love to contribute to this conversation. Um, one thing that I, again, is, is uh, looking uh, a little bit more positive than it might have done about a year ago, and that is that um, the the province is is uh, considering the recommendation of AMO to use income as opposed to some percentage of the total cost to define affordability. So therefore, what that will mean is that the least expensive homes to start with, where that are likely to be apartments or, you know, multifamily dwellings uh, will be the ones that will be affordable and do have lower DCs attached to them so that the impact on the municipality might not be as bad as it would otherwise be, while at the same time, hopefully, benefiting those in our community who are desperately seeking affordable accommodations. Yes, Treasurer Quinlan. My apologies, Mayor Hamlin. I just wanted to add, because Director Valentine just reminded me as well, um, within the DC Act, uh, and now it's not necessarily tied to affordable, but when it comes to rental housing, there are already um, percentage reductions that are applied to the development charges as well. So I believe it's three or two plus bedrooms is 25%, um, single bedroom is 10% or, and I'm forgetting the exact, the exact amounts, but at any rate, um, now, it doesn't tie it necessarily back to affordability, um, but does, you know, um, encourage developers, I would say, to move towards that, you know, by saving them on the development charges as well. Again, doesn't put any um, parameters around what they can rent for, but does say, you know, you're opening up a lot more rental housing if that or rental uh, units if that's uh, applicable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I have a few questions and I'll just comment. I think it's... Um... You know, the issue of our time, how do we pay for infrastructure for housing, right? Like it is unbelievable, but you can't have housing without pipes. Let's just say that. And who's going to pay for it? You know, like that. Anyway, it's uh, big brains need to solve this and uh, solve it, I hope, sooner than later. Um, there were two questions I had about things I didn't see in there in the charge. One was the police uh, services. And uh, Jackie, you mentioned that, you know, we couldn't cover operating costs, which I appreciate. Um, but we have what I'll say is an older uh, police station in our town. And uh, I, you know, there's not been any plans that I'm aware of to renew it or move it or maybe combine it with other uh, first responder ser services. But it's one of those things that's on my mind. <laughs> so I'm just wondering um, how you suggest we approach the future of that building. Or Treasurer Quinlan. Yeah, if I may, uh, Your Worship. Yeah. Um, great question. So um, the police building itself, which is actually the municipality owns that building. Um, if the OPP, for example, um, was expecting that that uh, building be expanded, um, the way we've looked at this development charge background study is that it would be on the uh, province to, in fact, fund that um, fund that expansion. Um, I look at it as if. Um, you know, uh, if we were renting uh, something from somebody else and our expectation was that we needed expansion to happen, um, that we would push it, you know, towards the either the landlord or we would, or myself, pardon me, we would push it towards ourselves to request that of the landlord or we would, you know, have to look for other places to, to, to um, reside. Um, the building itself, again, recognizing it's a municipal building and we own it, 
um, is the responsibility of the, the province if they required additional space. We don't, um, there's nothing in our contract at this point that says we need to provide them with additional space. And to be perfectly frank, I'm not sure that we could even expand that building. So we have, um, although previously we had policing included, it wasn't with respect to the building itself. It was with respect to additional uniformed officers and vehicles. And again, didn't really make sense because the municipality is not, um, not responsible for that. So just to follow up on that, is the province then uh, paying for rental on that building for the OPP? Uh, if I may, Your Worship, no, they are not paying for rental. Um, that being said, under our OPP contract, we are not charged for the general cost of buildings across the province. So um, the billing model is total cost for the province. Um, and for those municipalities like ourselves that actually provide the building to uh, the OPP, we aren't charged for any other building costs across the province. So I'll just, I'll just leave it that I, I just think this is something we need to think about uh, in the context of this review, and I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Uh, the other thing is the stormwater management, uh, because of course uh, last term of council we had a comprehensive study done on where the choke points were in the community, and now there's a study going on uh, to say what we should do, and I'm expecting we'll see in what order and what the magnitude of the cost will be but I'm expecting that it'll be significant. <laughs> so um, will this, do you see this as a matter of a, perhaps a separate DC bylaw at a future point when we have those numbers or how, how will we uh, address this? Uh, uh, yes, Your Worship, it's a great question. And I'll start and then uh, the treasurer might jump in. Um, so with respect to stormwater, most municipalities are moving away from having it included in the development charges background study. There's a few reasons for that. One being is that most developers um, are responsible for on-site on -site stormwater management. And because the DCs can only be used to fund growth-related infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. that essentially funds 95% of it. Uh, there are municipalities that are looking at um, stormwater rates, which we, we've we spoken about at previous meetings. The second part of our retainer is to undertake an update to the to the town's water and wastewater rates. And I think we've already had preliminary discussions about examining a stormwater rate as well. Um, so that's certainly something we could look at. Through that process, if it's deemed we we do feel there's infrastructure that could be funded from DCs. It's an appropriate mechanism for the town to look at. There's no reason why we couldn't do an amendment study and bring that forward at that time. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, also, the wastewater treatment plan, of course, this year uh, we're starting the environmental assessment for that. And we're all hoping yeah, the cost won't go the way of the water treatment plan. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> So um, I'm just, this is just a comment to encourage you if you're not already thinking that to put it in a separate bylaw so we can deal with the costs in the future. Okay. Um, and anything else? So I'll just say that the last thing on my mind is with a 10 year term of the bylaw that we'll, we'll, we'll now have, um, I'm concerned that future councils won't turn their mind to updating the development charge until nine years. <laughs> and that's a dangerous position to be in, uh, in, in a um, era of ever increasing costs. Now things can change tomorrow, I know. And, but assuming we, you know, this is going to last for a while, our inflationary issues. Um, do you have any recommendation on how often council should be asking staff to come back and say, okay, we should just review this to make 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 sure that, you know, gee, we're planning for this pumping station now and the costs were estimated at 50,000, now they're gonna be 500 million or, gee, have you given that any thought or could you? Uh, yes, Your Worship, and another great question. So um, certainly one, one trigger that stands out for me is 
as soon as you do a master plan update. Uh, those costs should be compared to what you have in the background study currently. Um, we should also be looking at the population employment that's being used in that master plan as well. So right now, our planning horizon in the background study for engineered services is to 2041. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, at some point in time, the town's going to do an analysis to say, well, what of our infrastructure needs to 2051? And I would say at that time, it's, it's very appropriate to have a, a hard look at the background own study and have an understanding of how much have the costs increased? What is the new population employment estimates that we're looking at for that planning horizon? Um, so, so that certainly is an area to look at. I have a suspicion that most municipalities will start considering an update around year six and seven. Um, I think the five year for smaller places was a little too aggressive, to be honest. And the background mm -hmm. studies are not um, totally inconsequential in cost. And I think it was, you know, arguably inappropriate to have those municipalities municipalities updating when they didn't necessarily need it. Um, larger municipalities in the GTA, they update every three years because they're constantly looking at their infrastructure plans. Uh, their growth projections are changing at a very rapid pace. Um, and so, you know, with a number of our clients, sometimes we finish a study and we start the new one pretty much right away. Um, so I hope that that provides some clarification, certainly as well, if there's any questions that come up. Following the passage of the bylaw, we're always happy to respond to questions that staff have. So, um, yes. Well, that's a great answer because what I worry about for our, our community is not that we're big, <laughs> but that we're changing so quickly and adding population so quickly and um, that we not get left behind. This year, we're going to be embarking on a master mobility and transportation plan. And that's good advice when we're finished that to say, okay, what about our roads and, you know, related, I'll say bike lanes or whatever comes out of that study. Okay, that that's uh, that's a good point. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really something for you, Deputy Farr. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Hamlin. And, and just a, a specific question through you to the treasurer because of your questions in regards to the wastewater. Um, I, I was looking at the chart and, and currently the charge uh, regarding wastewater services is about $9,600, and it's uh, not ballooning the way, <laughs> unfortunately, the water has to. Um, it's looking at uh, just over $14,000 as the calculated right now. What have you built in for a number for wastewater and when in your in your background data for for the costing? I think it's a it's a number that we should be talking about at least so that we know what we're using. Thank you. If I may, Your Worship. Yes. Um, so right now, the amount of the wastewater treatment plant we've included is at $230 million. Um, that is based on the information that our engineers have at this time. So we did use um, Tatum Engineering to help us uh, solidify the cost that we've included in the program. And based on the information that they were able to collect, that that was the, the price. Although staff were really, really wanting to push that higher because we felt just in our guts that it might be higher. But unfortunately, our guts don't stand up to the, the <laughs> OLT. So um, we are monitoring it. We're waiting for a few uh, very key tenders to close and be announced. Uh, so hopefully, you know, prior to us passing, we'll hear what those tender amounts resulted in, which would help us um, to determine if we have the right number there. I believe, and uh, I'd have to look, but I believe we have it uh, penciled in for 2028 is the beginning time frame. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation and take answering all our questions. That was great. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is, yeah, Sorry, we're just trying to decide what to do next. Hold on.
Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we were just uh, conferring about uh, Dave Wood, who's part of the 10.3 presentation. We thought he had to leave by five, but it's now not till six. Uh, so um, I think we'll just proceed with the order of the agenda as it is. Um, so the next item up is we're going to hear from Manager Griggs on the Economic Development Action Plan. Uh, and then after that, we'll take our uh, break. Thank you very much, Hi. Mayor Hamlin and members of council. Uh, thank you for having me today to provide an update on the implementation of the Economic Development Action Plan. Next slide, please. So the Economic Development Action Plan, also known as the EDAP, was adopted in 2020, and it's really intended to guide Collingwood's economic development activities and priorities over a five-year period. The focus of the plan is to directly provide strategic direction over items that we can control. The plan has three main pillars, and we believe those are the ones that will help us best position ourselves to drive economic success in our municipality. And I did want to note that it also supports the town's strategic plan as well. Next slide, please. The first pillar of the EDAP focuses on creating opportunities for growth. We do this by championing, championing in collaboration between government, businesses, and academic institutions to make it easier for new and existing building businesses to find the support that they need to grow here in Collingwood. The Economic Development Department oversees the Business Development Center by managing and growing the offerings that support our business community. The BDC brings together the town's Economic Development Department, our Small Business Enterprise Center, our Community Futures Organization, the Collingwood Downtown Business Improvement Area Association, and we've recently welcomed the Georgian Bay Accelerator and are looking forward to welcoming the Chamber of Commerce in April. <laughs> together through this partnership in 20. 23, we supported over 1,300 consultations, hosted 45 events, and reached 340,000 people. We also issued 100 loans and grants, totaling almost $1.6 million through the partners in the BDC. The Small Business Enterprise Center is an essential component of our economic development department, leveraging provincial funding to provide small business and entrepreneurs with one-on-one -on -one consultations and assistance with business planning. The ESPEC also runs startup programs, oversees the Digital Main Street program, provides grants, connects businesses with resources, hosts events, and workshops. Through the ESPEC, over 30 workshops were hosted in 2023, including events and networking opportunities uh, to the local business community. And a great example of that was one hosted on March 7th, um, making connections to celebrate International Women's Day. It was a sold out event and we've received a lot of really great positive feedback. We also support the Georgian Bay Accelerator by providing funding to them, as well as working with them to make sure that their programs and services are helping our local businesses scale and grow. We continue to showcase innovation through blog articles, video development, and digital marketing campaigns. And through these efforts, we promote local talent, job opportunities, and the innovation cluster we have here in Collingwood to attract more investment. Our team has also successfully uh, secured some grant funding for our tourism master plan from Regional Tourism Organization 7. We have applied for some grant funding from the Rural Economic Development Program to invest in uh, our city view technology to expedite our development approvals, as well as uh, funding from Tourism Simcoe County for our Discover Collingwood app, craft beverage tour, and uh, the taste and toast of Collingwood. Next slide, please. The second pillar of the Economic Development Action Plan really focuses on attracting talent and supporting our growing businesses. This also ensures that there's a the necessary talent here to attract investment. It's one of the key things investors ask is, do you have the workforce to support our operations? We promote Collingwood as a great place to live and work by undertaking digital marketing campaigns to promote the quality of life and the opportunities here. We also profile local businesses through articles that we promote on livemorenow.ca and our social media channels. 
Our department is exploring the introduction of a municipal accommodation tax to generate revenue to invest in our tourism industry. We have been undertaking consultations with industry, researching best practices and evaluating options for implementation. Most recently, there was a round table held on February 15th that engaged 20 industry businesses and organizations to solicit feedback on a proposed framework. And a subsequent meeting will be held uh, in the coming weeks with members of the round table and economic development to continue that discussion. We're also in the process of developing a tourism master plan to provide us with the strategic direction needed in regards to how the town can best support the tourism industry, as well as how potential revenue from a municipal accommodation tax can be invested in a sustainable way. We continue to promote and grow the Collingwood Craft Beverage Capital product to drive more awareness to our local craft beverage industry. We do this through close collaboration with the producers and ourselves, sharing local and regional opportunities, hosting regular meetings, and fostering collaboration across the industry. In consultation with part participating businesses and stakeholders, we are transitioning our award-winning Patio Licious program into a year-round product to showcase the culinary and beverage industry here in Collingwood. We're aiming to leverage grant funding in 2024 to undertake digital marketing campaigns to promote the amazing culinary and craft beverage offerings we have here in town. We continue to work with our partners across the region, including the County of Simcoe and Simcoe Muskoka Skills Force, which is our workforce development board, to implement a regional labor market research study. Some initiatives under that study include engaging local businesses to offer tours for the high skills major program, which provides high school students uh, tours through our local businesses to raise awareness of our local job opportunities here. We also promote the Grow Together Mentorship Program, which connects local employees, regardless of their employment status or organization, with access to professional mentorship program to encourage professional development and help address workforce gaps. The Economic Development Department also really ensures that the employer perspective is brought forward and integrated into policies and program development, including attainable housing initiatives, transportation planning, and land use planning policy development. We also work with our post-secondary institutions like Georgian College and Lakehead University, as the mayor mentioned earlier today, to bring more post-secondary programming to the region. Uh, for example, as a result of the mayor's roundtable on economic development, focusing on how our local engineering firms can leverage post-secondary institutions, we're happy to announce that a Management Essentials micro-credential program will be offered our South Georgian Bay campus starting April 2nd. Uh, we're also working with Lakehead to arrange tours of our local businesses to better familiarize them with our local employers, their workforce needs, and explore potential partnership opportunities. Next slide, please. Ensuring that Collingwood is investment ready really requires a multifaceted approach. Our focus is really making it easier to do business here in Collingwood. We've recently developed an investment attraction package that includes two ebooks, an updated community profile, as well as six sector profiles. We've developed an inventory of industrial and commercial lands and properties, and we're working with landowners to better understand what their intentions are and how we can help attract businesses to these locations. We assist potential investors with site selection and have recently established a process of sharing leads with local real estate agents to identify off-market opportunities. And we provide prospective investors as well as ex ex existing businesses with data to support their investment decisions, such as the Enveronix profiles that were presented to council a few months ago, um, highlighting both the local and visitor demographic and what those consumers are really looking for. We're also working to establish ourselves as a one window for businesses and investors to connect with the town, to help them navigate our various departments, services, and the approvals processes. And uh, we support our businesses through retention and expansion with programs like Celebrate Your Business, which continues to be very successful in supporting um, our, our local businesses celebrating milestones. It offers a branded celebration kit, a photographer and media promotion. Um, we also have been strengthening our relationships with the business community through our monthly on-site business information tours. And I'd like to personally thank all the members of council and staff that have participated in those events. I've been having a lot of meetings with local businesses as well as part of my onboarding to better understand their challenges and how we can really help to address them. And we also produce our 60 second news e-news e update, uh, which is now has uh, over 3,700 subscribers. And we use that to make sure that our local businesses are aware of opportunities, programs, and services available to them. 
We also promote the BizLink program, which is a succession matching program to help our local businesses looking to transition or sell their business and matching them with potential investors looking to buy businesses in our community. And finally, we support the Mayor's Roundtable on Economic Development by bringing our industry leaders together on key items for discussion and input. Um, we've held two focused on municipal accommodation tax and then one as previously mentioned on how to leverage post-secondary institutions. As we continue to implement the EDAP through to 2025, we adapt our tactics and our approach to reflect the ever-changing climate and business community to ensure that we are positioning the town of Collingwood for continued economic growth and success. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Wow, thank you for that summary. It's so exciting. <laughs> um, okay, questions from Council. Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. So through to Manager Griggs and perhaps the CAO, um, the Economic uh, uh, Development Action Plan used to have uh, performance measurement indicators attached to it. Do we still have those and monitor those? And um, do they direct what we're doing next? Or is that something Council can see in terms of... Uh, the success, because clear, clearly, I think it's a great department and it is having great success. But I, I, I am a big believer of those uh, indicators. Yeah, go ahead. To the chair, thank you very much for that question. Yes, we do monitor our key performance indicators that are outlined in the Economic Development Action Plan. Some of them have shifted since the um, establishment of the plan and COVID and, and what the reality of the business climate looks like coming out of COVID, but it's certainly something that we monitor and try to ensure that we're meeting our, our key, performer key performance metrics. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, I have one. <laughs> okay, uh, so the South Georgian Bay Media Association released a report um, about, I guess, encouraging more film production in South Georgian Bay. And I'm just wondering whether you'll be turning your mind to working with that group or whether there's any input our council should have or if you've turned your mind to this at all yet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. I have had an opportunity to read the report uh, and have corresponded with the author. Um, I do have a meeting with all of my counterparts throughout South Georgian Bay tomorrow, actually, and it's one of our agenda items to talk about how we can take the findings of that report and what actions, if any, we can take. My understanding is really they'd like to see a regional film office be established, but I think a lot more research needs to be done in regard as to what that might look like and the costs and the resources associated with it. Okay, well, keep us up to date. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll just uh, adjourn for 30 minutes. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we'll do 10.3, which will be the last departmental update. Recess, not adjourn. Do not adjourn. Just <laughs> recess. Thank you. <laughs> I know you're hungry. Too bad. <laughs> okay.
Welcome back, Council. Uh, the next item on our agenda is going to be a presentation from Director Culver and Dave Wood of Envision Tatum on one of our on on our new parks, which I can't wait to hear. Um, but before we go there, I just wanted to take a moment, and on behalf of Council, thank. Uh, Dean Culver for his 10 years of extraordinary service to our town. We've been so lucky to have you. <laughs> Yay. And we are so sad to see you go. However, you know, so appreciate, you know, in one's career, sometimes it's time to take the next step. And sad for us, we, you know, we already had you. <laughs> so uh, we're not even going to share the name of that municipality you're going to. <laughs> but thank you. You've had great vision and really brought a whole, I'm going to use the word kindness to, you know, your department and, it's been very much appreciated, so thank you. <laughs> um, so on that note, we'll move into a presentation, so it's not me. Uh, I wanna say thanks for having us. Dave and I are uh, here today, provide an update on two park projects that have been in development uh, for some time now. Um, one of these projects is in the implementation stage and work has already begun with a contractor secured through our comp uh, competitive bid process. The other one is nearing the completion of a design process that has engaged the broader Collingwood community and stakeholders. And the second project actually received, uh, achieves elements of the PRC master plan and respond to the direction of council over past several years. Uh, next slide, please. So the first, uh, the first park we're going to be speaking of is the Denbach Park, which is now named following a formal procedure and decision by council. Uh, Denbach is a neighborhood level park located in the Summit View subdivision and bordered by Pluis Drive on the north and Archer Avenue on the south. Um, I'm gonna ask Dave to take over and he's gonna walk you briefly through the design. Um, and also just to let council know there's more details available on the town's engage page as well, uh, over and above what we'll share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin and Council. Um, I am going to try to be brief. I could talk about these parks in quite depth. Um, so I, I will err on the side of brevity and I'll let you ask me some questions at the end if I've missed anything. But uh, so Dun Dunbach Park is, um, as Dean was saying, is a neighborhood park in the Summit View subdivision. Um, it's, a, it's a rather large park for a neighborhood. And, and uh, we met with the, uh, the residents uh, in, um, in uh, August of 2022, had a, a great in-park in design charrette with kids and local residents, and it was a really uh, incredible day. I am always feel I can predict where these things are going to go, and the public always tells you something unexpected. <laughs> so what was interesting about this community is that uh, a, very a very healthy and diverse group of people showed up. We had young kids, uh, new residents, senior citizens, everybody having a very strong opinion as to what this should be as part of the, a part of their community hub. And there was a strong messaging to us that a, they were looking to see uh, the environment and nature prioritized, and they were also looking to have uh, amenities that were um, geared towards people of all ages and abilities. So that was kind of the two major uh, objectives that we approached this park with. So we've developed a, a design concept that really um, tries to provide a integrated tra set of walking trails and, and, uh, and, and loops. There's a figure eights all through this that you can pick the length of walk you want to go on. So, I mean, it, it is something that certainly appeals to some uh, of the older residents of the neighborhood. Um, and using those same circles and arcs and figure eights, we're able to also divide up the park into individual uh, mini spaces, almost like rooms. Um, so the in the uh, in the center of all this is a is a playground and a in a in a pavilion, and the pavilion is a very kind of strong architectural feature that will tie uh, all the spaces together. Um, the, um, the I think the part that really excites me about this is the ability to sort of bring back the Black Ash Creek into the development. This is all farmland. Uh, that has been stripped over over the years. Um, we're now developing a space for the community, and I think as a, as a nod to the, the Black Ash Creek quarter that's nearby, um, we're looking at a lot of uh, naturalization of this park, a lot of reforestation to sort of help the park mature over time, and then sort of really kind of isolating the maintained areas to be the ones that would be just provide the amenities for the communities. Um, 
So in looking at the plan, uh, there's a central axis with a, a, a pavilion in the center, a, a, a playground that flanks it on either side. So the pavilion sort of serves as that hub space, but it's also a great place for caregivers and parents to watch kids uh, play. Um, open, just general open space and lawns uh, are, are encapsulated in, in many of the arcs um, for Frisbee and just general open play. Uh, we're also have incorporated a play court that has um, uh, a full three-on-three -three basketball um, uh, programming, but it also has uh, a U9 futsal um, um, use as well. There's two small little cages at the each end that you can play um, mini soccer for younger kids. So it's kind of a, a multi-court uh, concept with a with a seating area. Uh, and then we've also used on the on the other side of that on the on the on the kind of lower side of the of the site, you see something called a meadow retreat. So that is a multi-purpose space that could be used. There was a, there was some request for yoga, um, you know, events possible like things that could could kind of be used for. Um, um, various age groups and, and, and uses. So we, we've, we've allowed for that space. And I think it's, it's just a nice contemplated space within the, the development. So all of this was kind of built around the idea that, you know, on some of our past par park projects, we really looked at this kind of the types of play, making sure that we have active spaces, uh, passive spaces, contemplated spaces, sensory spaces. And we applied that more on a park level in this time, as opposed to just on a playground as we did at Sunset Point Park. And it was really interesting to work with the community in that regard. So I think we've achieved uh, 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 many of those, or if not all of them throughout the park for the different age groups. So we're quite excited by that. So if we maybe just go to the next slide, we can get a better perspective of this. So again, I mentioned that the, the entire composition is held together. Uh, by this very, very um, architectural uh, pavilion. It's, it's got four gables on it, which gives it a four-sided appeal. So, you know, you can kind of, it addresses the playground quite nicely, but it also addresses the, the green spaces on either side and the promenade. Next slide, please. And this just maybe gives you a little bit of a better understanding of it from a more of a helicopter's view, um, how that access works and that that centralized space that creates the hub that the community was really seeking in this in this design. I think that what, I, what I like about this illustration as well is it really shows off the uh, the difference between the Moan natural uh, the, the Moan turf areas that are intended for um, the amenity play um, as well as the use of the uh, stormwater areas on the side and the in the in the periphery to to reestablish that sort of NOMO um, naturalization. And then we're able to plant um, uh, fairly ag aggressively uh, new trees of different sizes and age groups to allow them to sort of mature over time um, in, in sort of the periphery uh, while still making sure that we're ad adhering to kind of crime prevention and septed rules, making sure that we create safe spaces within this, um, within this park. Uh, next slide, please. And thematically, as far as the playground go, what I was really excited about this too, because we've kind of locked down on this um, naturalization and this meadow um, aesthetic, uh, it really allowed us to play with the playground to uh, bring in a lot of really vibrant, fun colors that are, uh, so we've, we found the, this, this play line that has a uh, almost like a seed pod look to it. And they're really, really quite interesting because a lot of them, you have to climb up the middle of the structures and they offer... Uh, a variety of um, of, uh, of play amenities for 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 different age groups, um, and as well, we've, we've kind of got a for the, some of the younger kids in the foreground. You'll see sort of a a, a wooden kind of sit-in stru structure again, a, more of a contemplative type of piece and a little bit sculptural. As, a, as it's a, it's meant to kind of uh, look like a gold finch, which is kind of a um, really key kind of centering piece to the playground. There's also a, a set of swings um, with a with a saucer swing and some um, belt swings and uh, infant seats as well. Next slide, please. Is just a couple other views of that same play equipment. Next slide. And then, of course, you know the one you know we we do live in a winter environment. Um, uh, despite not being so powerful this year, but uh, we're, we're hoping it it it, it returns. Um, but we have allowed for the provision with the servicing to bring in a, a winterized yard hydrant like we have in other parks, which allows uh, residents uh, on their own programming to um, put up boards and maintain uh, ice rinks. So we've allowed for that green space in the pavilion to have a close relationship. And you can sort of see that you can use the pavilion as a place to put your skates on and 
you know, um, gather groups of people in the winter time and have access to that uh, lawn space, which has been graded out in a way that would uh, facilitate that use. Next slide, please. Yep. Uh, so I'll just catch my notes up here. Um, so, uh, so do we, is there any comments on Denbuck Park? If there was anybody like to make any, just uh, might be a good opportunity before we move on. Council, any questions or comments? Yeah, Councillor Doherty. Thanks. I'll just echo my comments from the my colleague beside me. Really good. <laughs> Um, through you um, to uh, Mr. Wood, um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, is is it lighted? Would this park be lighted? Uh, through you, Mayor, um, the the park itself is not lit. Uh, we have provided some uh, aesthetic lighting under the canopy of the pavilion, so it does have at night when you're driving past, you can sort of see into that space to see if there's anybody kind of hanging out. I mean, it, has, it does, does have a surveillance aspect to it because that would be a, 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 a evening time congregation space. Um, but it also lights up the, the pavilion itself to be a bit of an architectural feature within the park at night. Uh, we do have uh, uh, one light standard by the uh, court area as well, because that we could sort of see that being a secondary place that might kind of uh, invite congregation in the evening time. So it's, it would be kind of motion censored and uh, with house side shield so that it's not a disturbance to the neighbors. But it's very, for the most part, the, the park remains dark um, as, as with other neighborhood parks in Collingwood. Right. And just, uh, just two more. Um, so the next one is um, with regard to the the court, the hard surface. Could that be adapted to racket sports? Well, actually, <laughs> a ball or if, tennis. If I could, um, to you, Mayor. Um, so actually, this was a concern of the neighbors that we were um, enabling pickleball really close to the backyards of, of some residents along that side. So we're not intending for the court to be used for that purpose. Um, we obviously, you know, can't stop and, and wouldn't stop anybody seeking out healthy activity. But uh, the na neighbors were really concerned about the proximity of that court um, with pickleball in mind. So uh, what it's actually programmed for is is things like uh, futsal, soccer, mini soccer, uh, basketball, and, um, and hockey uh, would be able to be played there like ball hockey, um, but not we're not, in, we're not deliberately enabling racket sports on that, that facility. Okay, thank you. And then just uh, one final. So um, I, yeah, I love the idea of sort of naturalizing um, the perimeter. So, and you did comment that you would be planting different sizes of trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. It's hard to envision a uh, naturalized area among twigs. <laughs> So you you will be putting some fairly mature or wider caliper trees in as well as through you, Mayor Hamlin. Um, yes, the the uh, I mean I think there's a, certainly an immediate need to provide the buffering along the sides and to create that sort of vegetative um, um, framing and, con and context for the the park. So we would be looking at providing some larger species, but in some of the areas that we're just hoping over time will kind of grow more. Uh, as a reforestation almost and, and to support the naturalization, we might try to plant more smaller species in there. So it, it, there'd, be a, there'd be a wide range. Um, part of that's cost management, but it's also just even creating some diversity in, uh, in age, age groups. But the, the core of the planting would still provide that, you know, initial um, uh, tree presence um, that would, you would see in, in a typical park. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just add one other comment too, and and this is actually comes up a lot in in my my industry. Um, there is a, a bit of a risk reward when it comes to planting trees of an enhanced caliber, and and that's because this, younger trees tend to establish better uh, over the longer term, and larger trees tend to struggle a bit more. So I think the the approach of planting multiple sizes is a way to sort of move through what is a long lifespan of of that forest and, and make sure that we're doing all the things we can to both establish it quickly, but also give it a best, the best chance of surviving in the long run too. Um, so if there- oh, Wait, there's just uh, Councillor Reen. Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And I almost hate to ask this because uh, it's such a good park, and I agree with everything that you've you've shown us so far. And I and I would love to see it as is. But uh, I still got to ask, and it was be before uh, Councillor Doherty asked about the the play the the court there, the hard court there. Um, when I see the way that it's laid out, you've got the backs of all the houses on uh, running along the uh, outside perimeter of the of the park. And normally that's bedrooms. Um, yep. My concern is not during the day. Is do you think that the trees that will be planted will be a good enough buffer for even basketball? Because a basketball late at night when it's dead quiet, bouncing and hitting the, the back of a net is uh, is quite loud. If somebody's trying to sleep, it has to work. But I, I hope we can answer that question with a. I did it too negative no, it's... because I think it's a great idea, and I'd hate to see it not be there. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about. The late night, uh, you can't control what time somebody grabs a basketball and heads out to a park. Yeah, so through, through you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great question. It actually was brought up by the most uh, adjacent neighbors. Um, we had a meeting with them at their homes um, or at one of the homes, and um, they shared similar concerns, especially the one regarding potential for pickleball, but also just in general, was it too close? Um, we do have a prescription for approximately where, how, how far a court should be from a, a backyard, like how far set back. Um, but as a result of that conversation, we've actually set it back even farther. We've moved it deeper in. And actually the, the diagram that was shown doesn't have the most current version. It's actually set back a little bit more. There's now a boulevard of trees uh, between the trail and the court. And then uh, we're also going to be enhancing tree plantings at their backyard fence. The neighbors indicated that they don't use the gates at the back. So we're going to plant more um, coniferous trees to help buffer the sound. Thank you very much. No, I guess nobody's going to throw tomatoes at me for asking that question. <laughs> no, that was a good one and it was a great answer. Um, I'll just say uh, what a beautiful amenity for this neighborhood and congratulations to you and your teams and the neighborhood from coming out to support the vision. Yeah, it was a really it was a really good charrette with a lot of active and passionate participation. And the biggest question we got was how fast. So <laughs> same question we get all the time. But so the, um, the one question I had was um, where the, the open space where it's shown uh, that it could be a rink in the winter. Um, is that big enough for young kids to play soccer in the summer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's actually quite a large size uh, rink space, but I would say a little bit larger than what we've, I would say, average uh, where we've installed it elsewhere. Oh, um, good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was it. Uh, so now we're going to flip over to another exciting project that's approaching the end of the design and engineering phase, and that's the Wilson Sheffield Community Park. Council will recall the naming of this park in reaction to fully understanding the tragic loss of town employee Herbert Wilson 69 years ago this month, actually, mm -hmm. and the impact that the circumstances surrounding his loss um, had on the community um, and his family and what they endured following uh, that loss. Um, so with this is an opportunity to, to represent that, um, and we're working with Mr. Wilson's surviving family members. Uh, to feature reflections of the history and accomplishments of calling with Black residents in order to ensure these valuable contributions are celebrated and never lost from memory. The park itself is designated a community level facility and that might deserve just a quick explanation. Stemming from our PRC master plan, parks are categorized with a, categorized with a, few, a few labels. Uh, two of these are the community and neighborhood labels. The primary difference between the two labels is the difference in the level of attraction that's created by the park features and subsequently the audience that's anticipated to attend uh, what is created in each category. Wilson Sheffield will fish, feature tennis and pickleball facilities in response to the PRC master plan and a high community demand uh, for these features. And this means that the park will attract from across Collingwood and possibly from uh, beyond Collingwood boundaries. That fact requires us to include parking and washrooms, a heightened degree of physical accessibility and awareness of the needs outside the neighborhood where a neighborhood park would be more constrained to the needs of the neighborhood itself. Um, while saying that, the park also still needs to provide a neighborhood service, and Envision Tatum and staff held further public engagement to ensure that the neighborhood needs were also met, as well as capitalizing on an opportunity to not only further meet the neighborhood needs of Indigo Estates, but also help fill a gap related to the adjacent Pretty River Estates subdivision. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit uh, with some good news. Uh, so for right now, I'm just going to ask Dave to walk you through the current design and project details. So this park is um, 
is a little bit more self-explanatory. Uh, it is it is uh, uh, primarily based around uh, the provision of the court facilities that, that Dean had mentioned. Uh, we worked very early on in the process um, to kind of get a really under, a, a strong understanding of what the needs are in the community with respect to pickleball and tennis, and we've met with both both organizations and. Uh, through discussions, uh, had a very collaborative and positive experience with those discussions and, and came to a consensus between the two groups, between what both felt were necessary in order for them to, you know, grow the sport here in Collingwood, but also give them opportunities to provide occasional um, uh, tournament style events at, in the park. So that that it settled on with uh, six, six dedicated pickleball courts and three dedicated tennis courts, which was uh, it was nice to, to arrive at that consensus, and, uh, and the plan obviously reflects that. Um, we originally had a, a, a double pair of half courts uh, for basketball that were included in the in the um, um, the design that was presented uh, to the community in uh, March of 2003. Um, and the feedback from the community after those consultations were that there might be a need to, instead of doing half courts, there isn't really a great place in Collingwood for to play full court basketball outside. So uh, the design was amended after that feedback to make sure that was included. And we, looking at the overall space of the park, um, we, you know, in, in selecting where these facilities would go, we looked at um, how to understanding that there's maybe a little bit more sound and noise uh, associated with court sports. Uh, so the, 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 the corner of the park that was closest to the school and the stormwater pond was selected as the, the right location for these to help mitigate the sound and keep the, these facilities as far away from the neighboring residences as possible. Um, parking was included. Um, uh, a long day drive uh, to a limited capacity. Again, we in the, in that early public consultation we had, we had a, a larger parking lot, and the feedback came uh, through that discussion that it should be reduced somewhat. So we have scaled it back. Um, we've got a 37 space uh, parking lot right now with two accessible stalls uh, that would be um, located close to the uh, the central spine and access point to the park. Um, Center of the park, you'll see a, a, a kind of a wing-shaped structure there. That's a, a, a washroom and storage building. It's a very fairly simple structure. It would have uh, four um, accessible washrooms, one of them being uh, designed to be fully universal. Uh, and it would also include uh, four storage uh, rooms as well, uh, one for, for, a town, for town use, uh, one for pickleball, one for tennis, and one for basketball. Um, and the canopy itself would then, so that, that's the, the kind of the rectangular shape within that gray kind of wing area. Um, the canopy itself is an extension of that. So it's kind of, we're using the building roof as a way of creating kind of a shade pavilion in the center of the park. So there's some uh, seating that would be um, under the canopy to the, to the north of the building facing the, the court area and to the east of the uh, of the building there's a larger kind of overhang area that would be um, intended for uh, shade for uh, parents and caregivers associated with the playground the very bright uh, orangey yellow um, tone on this plan is a, a playground and again in the original concept that was presented in, in in march of 2003 we had the playground a little bit closer to the day drive side of the um uh um of the park and uh, some of the feedback from that discussion with the community was that it seemed small and they were hoping for a little bit more of an impressive playground at the year. And, and given that this is, has been designated as a community park, I think that's appropriate. So we kind of re reconfigured this at uh, that space a little bit to make sure that we could get a larger footprint for that playground, which is what's shown here. Um, and then so, uh, associated with the playground is uh, some lawn space for just that kind of passive play that would be uh, appropriate with play um, play areas. The, um, the the other great opportunity about this park is the ability to connect it to the larger trail system. Um, the train trails nearby. We have a stormwater management pond that's naturalized in the foreground of this. Uh, so in working with engineering, we've had some discussions about being able to amend the current fencing around the stormwater management pond, which right now closes that block in entirely and really provides only access to the park from day drive. So by moving the chain link fence in, some, in half of the pond to the inside 
of the uh, of the maintenance trail, we're able to kind of transform that maintenance part of that maintenance trail into a continuation of the trail system that would then connect over to the train trail. So we can now use the park as a as a trailhead uh, for the greater trail system, which is great. And and bringing that 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 uh, trail within into the park into this nice arc, um, it really helps us to kind of. Uh, it, you know, deal deal with that aspect of the park, but also use that trail as a dividing line between the northern side of the site, which is a little bit more geared towards the community level amenities, and the uh, the southern side of the site is a little bit more geared towards the neighborhood amenities, the, the playground. So it's a, it it does have a spatial kind of um, separation that I think will be really beneficial in the park to to help separate those uses. Uh, along the uh, Kirby Avenue rear yards, we've we've allowed for a, 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 a 10 meter heavily planted uh, tree buffer along the fence lines there to help with uh, noise mitigation. And uh, we also have uh, identified um, uh, some additional opportunities to bring in some uh, no mow and naturalization areas into the park as well. You can sort of see the the uh, the rougher texture kind of. Um, um, goldenrod green, I guess, was a, is the best color I can uh, describe it as. But um, along the north boundary between the school and the park, there's currently a bit of an embankment in a stormwater um, a swale there that would be, uh, we're proposing to have that naturalize and connect to the naturalization of the pond. And then also the, the finger of the uh, um, peripheral areas to the trail coming into the site on the east side of the property would also um, be naturalized as well. So instead of having the pond naturalized with a chain link fence and then uh, uh, turf on the one on the other side, we're trying to we, we accept that the chain link fence has to be there physically to protect children and make sure that we can keep everybody out of the pond. But I think visually we can connect the two sites by kind of uh, blending blending that naturalization component across that fence line. Um, and so, I mean, overall, those are the, the major components of this design. I think the hardest part about designing a uh, court park is, is placemaking. Like it's easy to put a building and a bunch of courts and call it a day. Uh, so, we feel, you know, it was really a strong objective for us. Um, so, we've staggered the fence line. Uh, so, so, the whole thing is kind of centered on this central spine, uh, which leads to um, some dedicated kind of staging areas for pickleball within the enclosure. Um, tennis in the center and then basketball off to the side. So there's instead of having this straight chain link enclosure on in the center, it kind of steps and creates these smaller rooms along that uh, area to, to provide that functional purpose. On the corner of the fence um, closest to day drive, we've identified uh, a, a label called art panels. So that there's a, I think this is a really key area of the fence that we can soften from the chain link and do something a little bit more public art ba based to make sure that it is, uh, you know, uh, identifiable, um, interesting, uh, lit at night and um, um, helps, helps soften that, uh, that enclosure that is inherent in courts. Um, and then creating a strong relationship to the spaces around the building uh, and the seating areas is, is critical. And uh, again, I, th I think the, the, the biggest success of this design is the ability to kind of create that spatial rooming between the neighborhood and the community park. So that's how we've addressed that, that kind of placemaking component of the, of the design. Um, sure if I've forgotten anything. I don't think so. No, it's, uh, so we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And this just gives a just a better view um, from from a helicopter's perspective as to what that might look like. You can kind of see how that overhang in the on the washroom structure would provide um, a nice little kind of community hub area there to support the playground and the tennis tennis components. And again, you can see on the on the kind of central corner of that enclosure that we're kind of showing a kind of bluish, even, you know, I think we're suggesting glass at the moment. Um, I think there's some opportunities to, to use glass in this to um, illuminate it at night and make sure that it's uh, visible from day, day drive. But, but uh, next slide, please. Oh. So, yeah. yeah, there we go. Um, just before we move on to the last, uh, the very last thing, the um, so the counselors who were involved in the, the initial design charrettes will, recall a green roof concept as well as a fit trail concept. Um, and unfortunately, just as happened, we go out with, you know, good ideas, but the cost benefit of a green roof is uh, was pretty challenged as we went through trying to figure out how it could be made. Um, we haven't given up on greening, so things like gray water recovery and other ideas are still in, in play, but uh, the green roof just doesn't seem to be a, a good idea in this location. 
um, and, and, and I mean that in the sense of the benefits it might it might generate. Um, the um, the AFIT trail, actually, after some further research um, and talking to several of my own colleagues across the province, uh, the trail concept around FIT trails going back to the participation days, there's a reason why we don't see the lot of them anymore because they weren't being used. So again, just a, a return on investment um, kind of consideration led us to say, let's just park that idea for now. It doesn't mean that it's dead. And we definitely did, did want to make sure that this was a trailhead within the trail system. Um, but uh, but it was something we just didn't think was worth pursuing at this point as we work towards you know park completion. So um, it's not an, the end of that idea, or we may revisit it another day. But for right now, it's, uh, it's not part of our plans. So um, uh, next slide. And I'll just I'll finish this off, and then if there's any questions about uh, these, because um, this actually relates to to uh, the Wilson Sheffield. If you go to the next slide, please. So um, you can it, it's not an easy to read map, but you can see Wilson Sheffield in the right hand circle in the center of it, and then the, something called Triangle Park in the left hand circle. Um, these are both the town properties, and uh, we just introduced you to Wilson Sheffield Park. Triangle Park is another opportunity for us to serve the neighborhood needs of not only Indigo Estate, but also Pretty River Estates. And so going back um, a number of years, um, it was identified by people moving into Pretty River Estates that there wasn't any um, playground amenity, wasn't any space. So uh, we did identify this Triangle Park, we call it, and we did um, kind of put the idea aside um, and made room for it. We had the opportunity to affect the Indigo Estates site plan uh, to sort of create an access uh, from Kirby Avenue. And uh, so we kind of had that idea and parked it. But as we went through the Wilson Sheffield um, charrettes, we also understood that there was a, a bigger need for community park or for neighborhood parks story in this uh, area. And it became an opportunity to finally solve this pretty river stage problem. So Triangle Park is our working title. It's not the official title. <laughs> it's just the shape of the property. Um, I kind of like it myself, but uh, everybody will have a chance to weigh on what it should be named at the end of the day. Um, and I'll just let Dave walk through really quickly. It's a, it's a one slide left. <laughs> yeah. So next slide, please. So uh, what Dean didn't mention is that uh, <laughs> Triangle Park is uh, is landlocked. It's uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the history of how the town came to own it, but it's been it's it's not it's not fronting on any any roadway. Um, it, it it is on the opposite side of the Hamilton Drain. Uh, from uh, from the uh, western pedestrian axis uh, of the Pretty River Estates, uh, just off the corner of Hughes Street, um, uh, but it's 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 forested and it is really unique and quite visible at the at the kind of the bend in the, the bend in the trail and in the, in the Hamilton Drain. Uh, with the development of the Indigo subdivision, um, there was some foresight provided in the in the draft plan stage to ensure that there was a, a trail easement that was provided. Um, and you can sort of see that on the top right hand corner of the drawing, there's a, an easement that would be allow, uh, allow access from Indigo and also for, for park maintenance. So it was sort of it enabled us to activate this, this, this triangle. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a fairly straightforward effort. I think the, the, the thing uh, it, in, in many ways, similar to Riverside Park, it would be cut into the existing forest as sen sensitively as possible. Uh, try to maintain as much of the of the atmosphere and the feeling of that park as being part of that natural corridor, and uh, it has it'll have this um, kind of like uh, you know secret you know forested tree fort type vibe to it, which is uh, really quite exciting. Um, it does need connection to Pretty River Estates, uh, so the, it, it will require a pedestrian bridge over top of the drain. And we are currently uh, um, working with the NVCA to ensure that we can do that properly. Um, and overall, just conceptually, it's it's uh, being inspired by um, you know leaves falling uh, falling on the forest. You can sort of see a little graphic in the top left hand corner of the of the of the graphic that shows leaves on the forest floor kind of overlapping each other. So the shapes of the playground itself are are inspired by that and there would be shade sales provided um, for um, the supervision space uh, that would help kind of reinforce that leafy type feeling in the canopy and they'd be quite vibrant colors like fall colors on leaves uh, which would help ensure that the visibility of this space is kind of obvious from the trail across the, the Hamilton drain and uh, we've got a separated swing area and a tot and a youth space um, to the to the upper upper side of that composition 
and then the trail would cr cross the bridge, uh, hug the playground to provide access, and then ultimately weave its way through the forest uh, where uh, where the grade allows us to and gets us to uh, Indigo Estates to connect it all. So fairly fairly straightforward um, park, but a really really incredible opportunity to to service both communities uh, in a very unique way. I'm not, I'm not sure I can even point to another playground that I'm aware of that has this kind of secret feel to it, which is kind of nice. So uh, so with that all being said and taking way longer than we projected it would, um, <laughs> sorry, clerk, um, we're happy to take any questions uh, about the second half of the presentation. Councillor Baines. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, accolades to both of uh, you and your teams. It's exhilarating as a member of council to be presented with such concepts and it's very exciting. I'm, my only comment is it's evident I don't get out to parks enough because do I presume that a uh, equestrian fence is to keep do or horses out? <laughs> uh, I think I'll just answer it's a style of fence. It's not, we won't have horses in the park. <laughs> yeah. Darn. But a good question. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Grin, many Deputy times. Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and just a couple of brief questions or, or comments, uh, because I'm really pleased with the linkage to the trail system. You talked about uh, um, some other concepts that might be able to work in later, and, and that's great. But the main thing is that the trailheads are are linked up, and 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 that was one of the things we heard quite a bit. The other one is I'm very pleased with the adaptation you made with the basketball. Mm -hmm. um, the the fact that now it's closer to the school as well, because there was concern about the noise of the basketball as well. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to see the full court because that was the other thing that we were hearing quite a bit about. And it looks to me, and you may have mentioned this, but I think you've adapted uh, the parking lot a little bit more too, because there was some comments about the interaction of the parking lot and kids running through the lot and, and, and that concerns by citizens, but it looks to me like it's set up a little bit different as well. And as I said, you might've mentioned that, but I didn't catch it. So, yeah, so it's, it's a little smaller than originally planned. Um, and as well, I, what we didn't mention, um, because I cut it off in the picture when I made the slide is there's actually a pedestrian crossing across day street, like a proper PXO is being planned for Correct. there. Um, just recognizing the volume of people that are going to come from that connecting uh, center line connecting link over at uh, at the houses. Um, so yeah, there's going to be there was a lot of comment about how do we make this safe given the traffic on day the, the traffic at the school. Um, so a traffic study is part of the the discussion and design, um, and that PXO is being built in as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, congrats, uh, Director Culver, on the new posting. We're gonna, we are gonna miss you, but onwards and upwards, I guess. So, um, congrats on, also on the presentation. I'm pretty excited about these parks. They, they look like they cover all the bases. I do want to comment on the parking lot. Um, it looks like there's not any through traffic going in there now. So that I think that's a great move because I. I have a feeling that will end up being a parking lot to drop off kids at Admiral, and it'd be nice not to have uh, through traffic there. The other one with the Triangle Park, and I, I happen to like the name as well, but with uh, the Triangle Park, is it true the the bridge is being repurposed from the trail at Hens and Chickens Island, or is that not accurate? Go uh, ahead. The old bridge. bridge. <laughs> no, I, unfortunately, that that there's nothing to repurpose at Hen and Chicken. Um, there was talk of another uh, bridge that's being replaced and possibly repurposing that for pedestrian, but it's not uh, it's not the right size, and it wouldn't be a, a, a proper way to to do this for um, for liability public public safety reasons. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a couple of short comments. Um, so the one that's the community park also so awesome. <laughs> and I'm so glad you've opened up uh, the uh, train trail uh, and the, the train and the trail beside the pond that will be so used. And uh, as you know, those that train trail is so full of families on bikes on the weekends. And uh, I can see them just veering off to take advantage of that playground. So just make sure you leave a little extra space for more bike parking. Because <laughs> I'm just like 
looking ahead. <laughs> um, and I have one question. You're showing uh, plantings in a drainage well where the property abuts the school. Uh, will that is that still being used as a drainage well? And obviously, my question is going: Will it be maintained so the water can flow? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yes. The uh, the the uh, it, it is part, it was part of the subdivision uh, engineering and stormwater strategy. So it, it does serve a purpose. There's also um, running through that embankment a, a stormwater draw that le kind of runs through the subdivision that empties into the stormwater pond. So we've had to kind of ensure that we've stayed out of that zone altogether. So that that, that whole portion of the property will remain unchanged and will function as it was intended during the development approvals. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I'll just say the the Triangle Park, and I'll just again add my voice to I love that name, is so it's brilliant. It really is. And uh, there's a resident on Kirby who lives beside where the uh, well, I call it a path to nowhere goes, and he keeps asking me, where's this going? I'm like, I don't know. So anyway, I'll send him, I'll just send him uh, a screenshot of this because uh, and it's a, it's already, like, as you know, it's so perfect. It's all concreted and goes right to the the uh, Hamilton drain trail. So, okay, so when are we going to see that park built? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think as council's heard me say a number of times, um, we really try hard not to predict, especially right. when we're in the design phase. Right. Um, it is moving forward well. Um, we're obviously following a very uh, stringent uh, pre-consultation process, which has us working with all the different agencies to make sure that um, we're doing what needs to be done to protect everything um, and to make it a good, a good outcome. Come. Um, I think we're looking for design to be finished, completed by the end of this year, for sure. Um, and I'll let you go. Yeah, I can, I can. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead. Uh, the um, so the, we have the, we have two two parks um, that essentially uh, kind of wrapped into the same scope in some ways. So, in in recognition that you know everybody's quite eager to have amenities to use in these in, de uh, in developments, I think there's the ability to advance the Triangle Park fairly quickly. It, it's not tied to mm -hmm. um, the uh, site plan approval process. It's a, a fairly standard park development amenity. So we are we are pushing to move that through and get that to tender as quickly as possible in the spring, so that we can hopefully get that built this year, um, uh, at least substantially, anyway, so that it's available in 2024 for for use. But if we can get it online this year, we'll definitely need to work hard to get that done. Uh, with Wilson Sheffield, because of the building and the complexity of the project, um, we have we have pre consulted uh, with the planning department. Um, receive feedback, initial feedbacks that have been reflected in the current design, and we're in the, the technical design and construction drawing phase right now. We still have to go through a site plan approval process, and then get that out to tender. So, um, you know, if if all if all the process is favorable, we could we could get that out for tender this year. And uh, I would love to see ground broken this year um, to complete in twenty twenty five. That would that's the that's the goal. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Doherty. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I do share the accolades of uh, my colleagues around the table, um, but at the risk of sounding like a Kelly complainer, um, and I and I do sound like a broken record or the digital equivalent of that um, about the fencing around the stormwater pond, and what does it take? to get to a naturalized pond like we have on Collins and also as we now have in Summit View, which is so beautiful and so much more usable. Yeah, so so through through you, Mayor, um, I think first of all, it's fair to comment that the pond is naturalized, like so it doesn't, it's not maintained, um, you know, against nature kind of thing. So it's actually quite beautiful and it's something that we've noticed lots as we've attended the site. Um, the, the fence can't change at this point. That would have been something that needed to happen during uh, the development process for Indigo Estates. Um, it has to do with the profile of the pond and the slopes. Um, we did talk about it at the time when the site plan was being developed for um, Indigo, and uh, it truthfully, it came down to the proximity of the school and just this nervousness that, you know, children leaving the playground might have access to it. And there was an incident in Calgary about the last, my last pitch at the uh, former director of planning was uh, trumped by uh, an incident in Calgary or in, out west in Alberta uh, that said this there was a hazard there. And so that's where we landed. 
But kind of reinforcing what Dave said, the fence is moving closer to the pond and, and along the trail. So we'll be able to sort of get a little bit closer to it. And as well, just keeping uh, the NOMO and the naturalized spaces between the fence or like through the fence is going to make it feel a lot more like it, it's the same kind of access as, as pretty river or it as um, I'd call it the green pond, but yes, the, the pond behind my house. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll just add my recollections is there was no appetite to make the developer change the conditions of the draft plan of subdivision, which would have required a more current approach to stormwater. It's just my recollection. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, and I'll just say, if I could, Mayor, I'm I'm very grateful for the last ten years. <laughs> I do really appreciate all of your support. Um, it's been a huge reward to be working here in Collingwood, and um, and I'm going to be a resident. So please keep up the good work. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, Mina, would you like to come forward now? We'll do the deputation uh, that was listed as item 5.2. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm just here uh, for those, again, Mina Faye is back at the General Manager of Social Community Services at the County of Simcoe. Um, and I had been here uh, last year in the late fall uh, presenting our 10-point strategy around homelessness. And uh, I had promised to come back and give a few updates of what we've been up to since the last time I was here. So what I'll do, knowing the time is limited, I'll jump right in to uh, three major areas of focus that we're working on and then the specifics to the, the town of Collingwood. Um, so the 10-point strategy had a series of different approaches to try to um, help impact the services for those experiencing homelessness and help us prevent some homelessness, but primarily address homelessness. Of those 10, um, many of them apply countywide through a system of services. Uh, an example would be like a deep rent subsidy. So we implemented, since last I was here, 168 deep rent subsidies, uh, which are subsidies that average around $800 per person. Uh, so 168 households came off of our by name list or, off, or, or those experiencing homelessness. And we're issued these subsidies to help uh, address trying to end homelessness across the county. Um, another example is centralized intake, and this is something where we want a one-stop number to accessing our, our homelessness services. So if someone's seeking a shelter bed or an outreach agency, they call one number and they're triaged and then helped placed into a bed or help dispatch an outreach agency to engage them. So that, that hasn't happened yet. Um, we're still working on it. Um, we, we decided to do a comprehensive review of the system uh, with uh, an outside consultant who focuses on uh, homelessness systems across North America, uh, org code. And uh, they finished that review with our agencies. Uh, we put together a request uh, for a public tender. And now we're waiting on the results of that public tender so we can stand up. Our goal is to have a centralized phone number and intake system um, before this coming winter. Uh, and our hopes are to have it, it start to come into play in the late summer so that we have a few months of working out the kinks before we enter the winter. Um, another example, again, of, a, of a, a broad kind of service out of the 10 points was, um, you know, introducing housing retention programming that helps prevent evictions. So if there's two ways to address homelessness, one is to help people get housed and get out of homelessness, but another way is to keep people housed so that they don't enter into homelessness. And we're finding that those who are um, maybe don't qualify for all the supports and social services, but are on the cusp of uh, just barely getting by and if one life-changing event occurs they can find themselves um you know fighting to keep their housing so we're looking at what we introduced is is different types of programs to help address people's arrears um you know damages uh you know any type of first and last month so someone who's maybe being losing their housing or being evicted due to a renovation or is the owner taking back the home to live in it which is often happening a term of art being used is renovate evictions 
Um, so here what we're doing is we're helping, and this person could be someone who's working, who can afford rent, but just needs help with the first and last month to get into a new unit and avoid our shelter system or, or our homelessness support systems. So these are all things that have been applied across the system that will benefit the town of, of uh, Collingwood. Specific to Collingwood, though, there were specifics on the 10-point plan that we're bringing here. Um, the first is the motel voucher program. So aside from shelter beds for larger families or or could be, or, or people who don't qualify or aren't um, suitable for a shelter bed, uh, we tend to uh, use motel programming. So we invested an additional about $25,000 for the town of uh, Collingwood to help them uh, help the town in the local area of needs with more of a motel vouchers. Um, and especially in the winter months when there's limited uh, space in our shelter systems to make sure that families aren't left outside. Um, a, th a second thing we're doing is we increased the shelter funding for the town of Collingwood by 400%. Uh, this was a seasonal program that was run is being run through a motel and we wanted to make sure that it's um, offered year-round services to support people experiencing homelessness so that's an increase of five hundred thousand four hundred thousand dollars for a total of five hundred thousand um, dollars additionally our street outreach team and program engaging those who are who are um, experiencing homelessness and maybe street involved or or um or you know in and out or precariously housed kind of couch surfing um we're we're, we're trying to focus on investing in a more consistent outreach program that's more comprehensive so we increased funding there by a hundred percent um which is an equivalent of about another hundred thousand um, dollars additionally we also put in a storage solution model so um we're, we're looking at creating um a, fi a facility that's a campus of care that focuses on rapid rehousing. And one thing we've been told across the system is a lot of people decline or, or can't enter shelters because of the belongings that they carry with them. Uh, so we are, uh, we've are we strategically placed storage solution programs that are staffed um, across the county. And one of them is going to be coming to a um, to to the to here in Collingwood, and again, this is to allow people to place their items and come in for services, so they can focus on housing outcomes. Um, and that's another like uh, I think it's thirteen thousand dollars for that program to operate year round. Uh, additionally. The big one and the big investment is the modular um, housing program. So in Barrie, we we um, piloted a facility that can house people in the winter as a shelter and then in the summer as a rapid rehousing program where uh, participants come off our by name list. Uh, they're very low acuity, uh, meaning uh, they they need very little support to succeed, and uh, they are given 120 days in this program. They pay a rent or a user fee to have a private room in the facility, and they focus on housing, and they try to get placed into permanent housing coming out of those 120 days. Uh, in Barrie, we had 20 participants that participated in a 120-day program over the summer. 18 out of the 20 were permanently housed, so 90% success rate. So we um, we wanted to invest in a couple of more of these facilities and place them across the county. So we're looking to place one in South Simcoe and one here in Collingwood, serving Collingwood in the kind of Wasega Beach uh, area, as well as one in Aurelia. Um, and each one will operate differently. So we've at, did a, we've put forward a call for proposals, and we're reviewing we're, we're reviewing the the submissions now to see the different programs. We want it to be specialized uh, populations like youth or um, single mothers or different kind of populations to serve across. Um, and here, our strategy is to find a a space that works well in Collingwood um, that doesn't kind of disrupt kind of or have a neighborhood impact, but often uh, will serve someone um, more specifically to focus on housing outcomes. The, the strategy here is to to be able to take those who are chronically using our shelter systems that are just stuck and need some focus in order to, to get permanently housed and to empty those beds so that people who are staying outside can have access to the shelter system. So it's a dual approach in terms of our inflow and our outflow strategies. So we've invested about a million dollars, uh, almost 1.1 million and bringing one to Collingwood. Our goal is to have it operational by um, May 30th. Uh, so it is a bit of a, 
um, a bit of a race here. And, and the reason for the tight timelines is procurement takes a while and we were able to procure those uh, starting in late 2023. However, the funding we decided to use was a one-time opportunity from the federal government that came to us on December 23rd and gave us 20 days to spend it. Uh, <laughs> so we decided to take a whack at it uh, using these two facilities, which were already in the process of purchasing. So it felt like the timeline would be right. And then the federal government told us that in order to carry forward the money, it had to be fully operational between April 30th and May 30th. So uh, that's why we're doing concurrent strategies of recruiting the agency while, you know, um, installing the facilities. So we hope to have them all in place and ready to go. Um, and it'd be a great opportunity to maximize some federal surplus funding. Um, and additionally, uh, we're going to put in a safety ambassador program. So one thing we've heard loud and clear uh, in our downtown cores and areas where sometimes we engage people who are street involved in our downtown kind of businesses and communities often struggle to know how to engage and support those individuals. And street outreach, while sporadic, can't always um, engage the person at the time of need. Uh, we wanted to put in some dedicated community safety ambassadors, and this is more of a a, a street-based kind of walking patrol that helps engage people and support the the local community in keeping everyone safe. So they offer different services like making direct referrals to services and programming, which now with like a modular facility, there's somewhere to 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 re redivert the person into services and hope that they engage those services. Um, secondarily, they'll do things like. Um, set dead training with the local businesses and help them kind of address some of their, you know, blind spots that might help, uh, you know, address some of the concerns as well as do some safety pickups of like hazardous materials and ways. So we, we, we introduced it in, um, in Barrie again and, uh, you know, piloted it for almost six months and uh, we put out an RFP and now we've secured an agency that will be serving again. They'll, they'll, ser they'll serve the Wasega Beach Collingwood area with a, an actual immobilized patrol, meaning call for support. You know, they come and address the issue and try to engage the person um, and then kind of serve up and down all day uh, working with both towns. Uh, and then um, the last thing we did is we invested part of the 10 point plan was um, was in investing in some of our shelter systems infrastructure and make and some of our standing housing programs. So one of the um, the legacy housing programs that was offered was called the domiciliary hostel program, which was a supportive housing Bed mod, bedded model that a lot of hospitals and shelters were relying on to place people into housing. It's a form of housing, but isn't subject to Residential Tenancy Act, meaning there isn't a lease involved. Uh, in different iterations of the provincial funding, that, that program was cut or defunded. Um, Luckily, though, in this last iteration, they brought it back or gave the service manager discretion to reinvest in it. So a lot of these programs just needed a little bit of capital dollars to create more beds. Uh, so here in Collingwood, we invested in one of the Dom Care programs and uh, funded them a $50,000 capital grant that allows them to create some more bedded space for us. So there's another avenue for placing uh, some more additional housing outcomes uh, within the, the town itself. So... That's uh, kind of an update of what we've done. And then there's what we're about to do um, on the housing side. Uh, so as you are, you may be aware that we're working on our next 10-year affordable housing and homeless prevention strategy. This is a long-term strategy that's required by the provincial and federal governments in different iterations in order to be able to receive the funding we get from both orders of government. We finished the last 10-year plan. Uh, well, technically, it finishes in a few weeks and on the on the end of March. Um, and we've been given the opportunity to submit a new plan. Our goal was to put it forward before council through our affordable uh, county council through our affordable housing um, advisory committee. And we've been doing that work. So in 2023, we undertook um, a significant outreach campaign. And to put it in perspective, in, in uh, 2014, the first iteration of this plan, we had about 800 respondents to our survey. Uh, this year, we've had 8,000 mm -hmm. uh, respondents to the survey. So obviously affordable housing is top of mind for everyone and the whole continuum of affordable housing, you know, from emergency shelters and subsidized housing all the way to attainable housing or housing for those who are still struggling um, to be able to enter a home ownership market or a rental market. 
So that being said, uh, we have a lot, we've heard a lot, and we put forward a report, the what we heard report from the 8,000 respondents. And now we're going to do a deeper dive into some of the recommendations and do some specialized focus groups um, to make sure that the, the 10 year strategy is comprehensive in its targets and goal setting. Uh, the goal here is to try to try to understand what the next 10 years of needs will be in terms of creating more affordable housing and then put together a corresponding capital strategy to that plan. One of those strategies was asking all of our municipal uh, members and, and two separated cities to put a bid forward uh, for what they would be able to con contribute uh, from their own assets or resources in order to create more affordable housing. And I believe my colleagues, um, Brad Spiewak, the director of housing, and I think John Connell, uh, the manager for uh, development in housing, we're both here um, and we're working with a subcommittee or, or, or council uh, to come up with some suggestions. So we did receive an RFP response and the RFP is being reviewed right now for all the town and townships. I believe we had 11 submissions, uh, which is really good because then it allows us to create, again, a longer term 10 year strategy of how we can create more affordable. So that's kind of a, a quick update of all the different things we're, we're doing in some of the timelines. Um, I can share specifics if you have questions on each of those programs. Uh, the one community solutions is the agency doing this, uh, the community safety work. Uh, they'll be, uh, th their contract begins April 1st. The rollout will probably be between the months of April and May as they become to operationalize other towns and townships that are, are now being served post pilot. Um, and other than that, the rest is, is pretty much all May other than the central intake number. Wow. <laughs> I remember last time I ran out of time, so. <laughs> no, you, you could stay all you want. <laughs> okay, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Hamlin. And uh, just a quick comment. I think uh, you had mentioned that you didn't have a chance to put a presentation together, but your intention is to provide some, uh, some further information directly to council. So we'll just ask that briefly. Yeah, uh, through, through you, uh, through the mayor. Uh, yes, um, Deputy Mayor Fryer. Um, we were planning to have our, our my director of homelessness programming and community services with me, but she had a family emergency today. So the presentation that we were going to bring forward uh, wasn't able to be like brought uh, here. So what, what I'll do is I'll share like a brief a briefing note summarizing all the breakdowns of what I've shared today and all the numbers uh, towards each of the programs. Thank you. And just a quick follow up, if I may. I, first thing I should say is thank you for your uh, presentation. I appreciate the, the information. And I was going to, through you to the CAO, um, maybe ask if she wanted to update from the staff side uh, before my colleagues uh, wanted to ask questions and such. Sorry, you're asking if the CAO has questions? I, I'm thinking specifically about the modular uh, suggestion, just to, to, so we know where staff's at with that type of thing. Sure. Through the chair? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, we've been uh, looking at um, options with uh, Mina's team. Thank you very much around uh, the modular housing. So pending some feedback from them around exactly what they're they're interested in, we would bring that forward further for uh, council's consideration. Um, I think they're looking at a broad swath of different options. Um, some could be on um, town land and some could be on land that is um, you know, available in the community from others. Uh, so we have been um, impressed with the uh, uh, vigor with which Mina and his team have gone through the um, both uh, the homelessness prevention and assistance type work, as well as the affordable housing work. Uh, so um, uh, our group that meets regularly to talk about how to coordinate some of the many um, items uh, from the county and others related to, uh, to homelessness uh, uh, is uh, always benefiting from the county's advice in that regard and some of these new things that are just rolling out now. Thank you. Councillor Potts. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Um, through you, uh, great presentation. Um, I'm sure you're aware I've been uh, an advocate to try to bring some of this to fruition, and I think it's important that we get the 
boots on the ground to get the safety on the streets. And I, uh, I will be watching closely as things come up in the near future, but I just uh, great news today on what, what you presented. Thanks. Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Fayez Begat is uh, in regard to the job description for the community um, off safety officer, I suppose, would that be, 100% of their time would be Collingwood shared with Wasega Beach? Uh, through, through you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, yeah, yes. So uh, they're dedicated to the two towns. Um, and what they did is um, late, late in the fall, they did a community safety kind of assessment uh, of the town. However, it was late in the fall. So, you know, weather doesn't necessarily um, shed light on some of the needs. So they'll be coming back in the spring. And that's why I said they're, they're, um, Ramp up will probably take a probably the months of April through May, um, only because they want to get a bit better sense. But from their kind of observations of the two towns and their two reports, they they see what would be as a mobilized response, like rather than um, standing patrols, what they would do is they would have um, an access to, to an, a direct line where you'd make a call, and then a, a vehicle dedicated to the two towns would just be kind of Great. on the road and, and engaging people as they come by them, but also coming out to a direct um, direct request or referral. Thank you. That's very encouraging news. Mm -hmm. Councillor Doherty? <laughs> No? Okay. So I'll just say uh, to just thank you. It's just, I love to hear all your practical action that's going to be happening in a very short time frame. And uh, I think this is exactly what our community is hoping to hear. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I did forget one last one. So we have been working with town staff on a library strategy as well. Okay. Um, and there was a call for proposals for a, a micro grant, kind of a one year uh, grant where we were engaging the towns to see how we could place some some homelessness resources in in the libraries. Um, and we did receive a proposal from the town of Collingwood and um, and we're working out an agreement to see how we can fund a position. So this was uh, position based. Uh, so this is placing someone that could work and engage and focus on, again, working on someone's housing needs and then redirecting them to services if required and has a, a different skill set than, than what's often found in our library systems currently. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another one that we've been working closely on. So a few, a few things on the go that, you know, will probably require another update once we kind of land the location of the modular and, and a lot of community engagement that comes with that. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be working closely with the town, um, the, the team here at the, at the town Collingwood as well on that. So, Okay. Well, thank you uh, for coming all the way here and sharing this wonderful news. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just as Mr. Fayez Bagat is uh, packing up, I also wanted to say with the one community solution, so the mobile unit, uh, part of their pre-work had been a conversation with the BIA. And I think the BIA did come back to me afterwards and seemed to be quite impressed with the approach that was going to be taken and types of things that could be in place to help people and alternately to help the, the businesses understand what they can do to help people. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to be uh, positively received in its um, proposal stage yeah, here. Correct. Yeah, because those some of those businesses, they're the people who are dealing the most <laughs> with our homeless population that uh, is on our main street. So that's great. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so I think next up on the agenda is our consent uh, items. So the recommendation before us is that uh, council hear and receive the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the general consent items are that of the author or those of the authors and are not verified or approved as being correct. There's three items here, 11.1 .1, National Poison Prevention Week and the clock tower will be illuminated green March 18 to 24. 11.2, National Dental Hygienist Week. The clock tower will be illuminated purple, April 4 to 10. And 11.3, Letter Read Desired Support for Continued Impossible Metals Success. 
and this was sent to Council from Jason Gillum, the CTO at Impossible Metals. Uh, would anyone like to pull any of these items? Councillor Jeffrey. Okay. Oh, sorry, forgot 11.3. 11.3, okay. Well, right, right to you. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask where this would be referred to. Um, I think it's a really important question with, with regard to transportation connectivity, mm -hmm. uh, links into our transportation, into our economic development. And it looks like this might be a great volunteer if we need one. <laughs> respect to it. But I know, Mayor Hamlin, that you work on some of that connectivity with our neighbors as well. So I'm just wondering where this request could land so that we, we have it. Yeah, uh, Jason's letter addresses two points. Uh, one is uh, our community being more welcoming to newcomers. And I was actually surprised to see that there because I thought that was one of the strengths of our community. Uh, but I have uh, had um, uh, one of our staff reach out to him today, and I'm going to have a coffee with him and just get more details on that. On the transportation, uh, what he's asking for is transit from Collingwood uh, to Waterloo in Toronto. And uh, of course, his business, he's dealing uh, with the high tech community, and I think would like to see uh, his staff and uh, co-op students and uh, others have more access to Collingwood uh, by transit. This is an interesting one. Uh, so when the Premier was here last week, I did raise that specifically with him. <laughs> this issue of uh, the businesses wishing they had more transit to Toronto and to Waterloo. Um, but in terms of action from our community, I'm going to turn to our CAO and see if she has any ideas. Put her on the spot. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, we do have a couple of things um, in flight. Uh, one had been with the county. If you'll recall that uh, uh, council some time ago um, asked that the county look further into transportation connectivity more broadly within the um, within the area. And I know that the uh, uh, county has a transit report going to uh, to council uh, uh, their year end um, activity report. Uh, I. I it may even be, uh, it has just been published, so it's either just happened or it's just about to happen. And um, so I followed up with the uh, general manager, and he's told me that the team has initiated the five-year review, which will look at new, new routes and analyze various requests for service, both conventional and specialized, uh, with our municipal partners. And uh, so it does look like they're looking into things there. Um, that said, uh, we do have within the uh, MZO that council endorsed and the province, uh, uh, the, the minister subsequently endorsed the idea of a larger transit station, potentially even Metrolink size in the east side of Collingwood, which um, uh, the mayor did mention to the premier as well. And I think we should uh, continue to pursue uh, so those those are the things at play right now. Uh, from the Collingwood perspective, we're still uh, seeking to fill our transit coordinator position. It hasn't been an easy one to fill. So if anyone has good transit coordinators that want to move to Collingwood, we are uh, accepting applications. But it is one more thing that that person would have on their strategy radar to to push forward under uh, Director Slama's leadership. Thank you. And also just add to that, uh, I have talked to the uh, senior uh, transportation person at the region about this, the five-year study that the regions, or the county, pardon me, is embarking on. And uh, they will be coming to our town to get our ideas because I've always asking, what about direct links from Collingwood to Barrie? We don't need to go through Wasaga because <laughs> we have one of the busiest routes. Uh, in the county. So I think let's keep this front of mind because they will come and ask. And I think, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead. Uh, specifically to that point, as one who has to travel to Barry frequently to pick up his daughter and then deposit her back, uh, that point about the lowest hanging fruit, this mm -hmm. quickest priority of some sort of transportation link between uh, Collingwood and Barry. Uh, and if you would ask Mr. Gillum, uh, I, it may be a real stretch for us to do something to Waterloo or even Toronto, but if we were at least be able to do something, the collective we, um, to Barry, I would hope that would go somewhere, ways to assuage his um, desire for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. 
Okay, so I have to get uh, a mover and a seconder, I guess, to uh, receive this consent agenda. So, Councillor Houston moving, second by Councillor uh, Jeffrey, uh, and uh, all those in favor. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, for the county report, uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. And just one brief thing that I wanted to update Council about, because I do believe it's complementary to the presentation we just had um, on on the homelessness and uh, and that. Um, there was an update made uh, by a county to the municipal housing project facility bylaw, and that was established in 2003 as a requirement because uh, if you're going to be able to do contributions, you had to have a bylaw in, in place, so it was part of the process. Um, Simcoe County refined that definition or, or did that, there, it, with the stuff that they just did. They've refined the definition of affordable rental housing, um, which I'm not going to elaborate on, but I'm going to mention that in particular, they increased the threshold from 100% average market rent to 120%. And, and they felt that better reflected true market conditions and it would help them with improving the accuracy of their mixed income housing projects. So I wanted to highlight that. We've actually heard um, a little bit about that with the previous presentation and uh, when we decided to put, at least put the two properties to the county for consideration um, because they were talking about the mixed use aspect of those properties and the 120 was... Uh, wasn't a high percentage of what was going to be going in there, but by increasing the threshold, then what the general manager just spoke about, that they uh, provide about $168, $800 a month uh, uh, um, assistance for 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 rent, uh, that will mean more people will qualify and, and uh, hopefully more people will get that assistance that they need. So that was the one uh, item that I wanted to update that uh, has come out of the late uh, council or uh, county council meetings, and uh, and that was all I had because the other was was through the general manager. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, a motion here before us uh, in thirteen point one. It's Councillor Jeffrey's motion. So I'll turn this over to Councillor Jeffrey to read in her motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hamlin. Whereas current provincial municipal fiscal arrangements are undermining Ontario's economic prosperity and quality of life. And whereas nearly one third of municipal spending in Ontario is for services and areas of provincial responsibility and expenditures are outpacing provincial contributions by nearly four billion a year. And whereas the municipal revenues such as property taxes do not grow with the economy or inflation. And whereas unprecedented population and housing growth will require significant investments in municipal infrastructure. Whereas municipalities are being asked to take on complex health and social challenges like homelessness, supporting asylum seekers and addressing the mental health and addiction crises. Whereas inflation, rising interest rates and provincial policy decisions are sharply constraining municipal fiscal capacity. Whereas property taxpayers, including people on fixed incomes and small businesses, can't afford to subsidize income redistribution programs for those most in need. And whereas the province can and should invest more in uh, the prosperity of communities, and whereas municipalities and the provincial government have a strong history of collaboration, therefore be it resolved that the province of Ontario commit to undertaking with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario a comprehensive social and economic prosperity review to promote the stability and sustainability of municipal finances across Ontario. And further that a copy of this motion be sent to the Premier of Ontario, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Minister of Finance, and to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And I'm pretty sure Councillor Doherty would love to second this um, as this came through President Best to me at, a, at FCM. Okay, and do you want to speak uh, first or last? Uh, I'll just speak first because I, I think it, it uh, is pretty self-explanatory of the challenges we've all been going through, and this is part of the advocacy work under notice of motion, I'll be bringing the federal uh, portion of this uh, uh, request. And uh, I, I think uh, we need the help and it's clear why that the tax collection process that we're under has been in place since the reign of Queen Victoria and it probably needs an update. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on this or have a question? Yes, Councillor Baines. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin. I fully support this motion and all that it hopes to achieve and just point out that there is a 
typographical uh, error in the Minister of Finance email address. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just mention uh, this, you know, I've been watching uh, this discussion go on and changes being made, uh, well, since the 90s, I guess. And uh, I remember David Crombie being appointed by the province to do the, you know, who 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 does what panel? If you remember that, it was about sixteen municipal and provincial uh, leaders and uh, some other thought thinkers or whatever, um, and came up with some two hundred recommendations about how to change responsibilities and who should pay for what and so on. Some of those were implemented. The government went ahead and did other things and downloaded and uploaded and. Anyway, I, I agree we're at a spot where we, you know, it's time to really tune this up. There's so many responsibilities uh, on local municipalities that we really don't have the financing to do. And uh, it's quite hidden from our taxpayer who pays who pays for this. <laughs> and uh, I think those kind of things need to be a little clearer. So uh, Godspeed to AMO and FCM and, uh, and all those involved in this. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you. So now I'm. Uh, there's a recommendation here that this council move into the committee of the whole session. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Potts and Deputy Mayor Fryer. All those in favor? Thank you. And we'll just recess for five minutes here so uh, our staff can change over uh, the necessary behind the curtain.
Thank you, everyone. So I will uh, call the Committee of the Whole to order. And uh, you will have to bear with me this evening as I have forgotten my glasses, but I do know where everybody sits. So, um, so uh, item 14.1, uh, for, sorry, 14.2. Point one uh, on the Committee of the Whole agenda is a staff report, uh, C-2024-01, uh, Delegation of Authority Review and Update, uh, which was deferred from the February 21st meeting. And I will turn this over to Clerk Almas. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Uh, as we did the presentation at the previous meeting on February 21st, we're not going to do the full presentation again. There was a few comments received at the meeting and additional comments received following the meeting that we have provided an amendment section within the staff report. And we have uh, addressed a few of the items. And within the recommendation, you'll note um, the recommendation would be, if council is uh, puts the motion on the floor, uh, is to approve it as the amended. So the amended components are what is highlighted in red under the three various sections. And I will note that the one section, uh, let me just find it here. It is under the recommendation number two. There was an additional uh, comment in red that was optional. So if council wanted to consider or the committee wished to consider that item, that would be an amendment to the motion to include that item as optional. And if there's any questions, um, I am happy to address them. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, before we proceed, uh, I had also uh, suggested an amendment um, that I can uh, speak to now or I can speak to after we've collected everyone else's comments. Okay. Are online. Very good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so um, we will uh, turn... Um, are this item over to the public? Are there any um, questions or comments from any member in the gallery this evening? Seeing none, uh, any online? Thank you, Chair We still have uh, a number of uh, attendees participating remotely. If you wish to address the committee regarding the staff report, please press the raise your hand feature. And not at this time. Okay, very good. Uh, then I will uh, read in the motion then. Uh, the recommendation that council here in, uh, sorry, wrong one. See, no glasses. Recommendation uh, uh, that staff report C-2024-01, delegation of authority review be received and that council amend the delegation of power bylaw 2020-57 to include the recommendations contained herein as amended. Mover and seconder. Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Brandon, Councillor Houston. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> Uh, questions, comments, Deputy Mayor? Uh, just a brief uh, uh, comment that I want to make and because uh, I've been through and I don't have any specific concerns with anything at this point in time. Um, it had been explained uh, by uh, Clerk Amos through an email and it's not really conveyed in necessarily in the, in the document, I don't think. Uh, I had raised a little bit of uh, question about the outline that delegated authority went to financial policies and the clerk explained that uh, that still the re the remains the over oversight and responsibility of council and um, the staff don't set those policies but it's within those policies that the specific delegations are provided as best possible uh, we know that there may be some policies that we still have to 
uh, imp get that written into because they are coming around. One that comes to mind might be investment policy as we go through the the uh, the rehash of it. So I wanted to mention that because again, it's not. I don't think it's referred to within the report, but it is something that uh, the clerk had explained uh, through to council, and I was very satisfied with that explanation. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other, Councillor Jeffrey, and then Councillor Baines. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so my first comment um, with respect to the uh, check signing proposed, um, I do still feel the mayor needs to be signing. I don't know if the mayor has changed her mind on that or not. I know that um, I asked quite a few communities at my FCM board meetings, and um, they seemed mixed. But the one interesting response I got was, why are you still cutting checks? <laughs> Nobody else asked. They, they pay all by electronic transfer. So, But anyway, to me, um, checking a list after the fact is kind of like closing the barn door after the cows are out. If you have any questions, it's kind of too late. It's kind of interesting to be able to ask them before you sign them. So um, I think if the mayor still wishes it, I don't think a timely manner should be a problem given that we have a full-time mayor. Uh, she should be available to sign them in a timely manner, I would expect. So um, at, when it's the time is correct that um, I would bring in a, I, I don't know whether I bring an amendment to say that we revert back to uh, including the mayor and the deputy mayor in the absence or not. So that one I'm still thinking about. Um, with respect to uh, during uh, lame duck. Yeah. Make a suggestion we deal with each one because now would be a good time for me, for, oh, for sure. example. To, yeah, absolutely. Is that, if that's okay, uh, yeah. Chair. Certainly. Um, Okay, so that was, uh, so I'll just, um, that was signing authority for checks and electronic fund transfers. Uh, and um, the recommendation it was that the treasurer and CAO or documented designate um, uh, uh, undertake or have the signing authority. Uh, so your comments yeah. then? So I, I just want to agree with Councillor Jeffrey on this. Um, and I'll just also just say uh, the the it's not just signing the checks um, when electronic transfers are going to be made. Uh, the list is sent to me first, so it's just to look at the amount and who it's going to. Right. Um, I sort of feel this is one of those things that fits into a almost like a you know what I've learned in law school. You should have checks and balances, <laughs> and uh, although. It just so you wouldn't want just the mayor and deputy mayor signing all the checks. In the same fashion, I don't feel it should be two staff people signing all the checks. It just sort of, you know, having someone on each side of, of it looking, I think, is helpful. Um, I do think, though, that the CAO should be, you know, and uh, whether we have to put this in here or not, but I do think the CAO should get a copy when it goes to the mayor or in my absence, the deputy mayor, the CAO should also get a copy to make sure that uh, from her standpoint, uh, it looks appropriate. But uh, if she wants, I guess I should ask her whether that's something that's of interest to her. Uh, but anyway, that I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Uh, CAO Skinner, did you care to comment on that? Thank you. Um, yes, I agree that the CAO should uh, should get a copy. Um, and I think that is part of a robust oversight regime. And uh, I do believe that it can be delegated as part of that um, written delegation of authority. Um, however, as new people come and old people old people leave, um, there you do get a level of familiarity with the approaches that certain people take, and that you're comfortable with their um, rigor. Um, and so, so thus, in certain situations, it may be worthwhile delegating. But in general, I do believe that that is, as the mayor suggests, um, an appropriate step. Thank you. 
Uh, Councilor Ring. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Doherty. Um, I don't know whether the, is this is a question that I get asked now or is it an amendment to wait till it we discuss, but um, I've been in different organizations where the signing authority is two of three and you list, you would list the treasurer, the CAO and or the president and you need two of three. So if somebody's not available, you've got always two other people that are authorized to sign the checks. I don't know whether that's some way, way we want to go or not. Okay. Any other comments? Councillor Baines. Thank you, uh, Chair Doherty. Just um, a rationalization for uh, point number two, which is under the lame duck uh, restricted acts after nomination day, where awarding contracts to acquire goods and services valued in excess of $2 million. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. If, because we, it looks as though we may be looking at an amendment oh, uh, from the table, we'll just, we'll stick with that item and then, but keep that thought. Okay, uh, any other comments with regard to this particular item? Uh, Councillor Houston, no? Okay. So, Councillor Jeffrey, did you want to make an amendment? Yes, I, I'd like to make an amendment that we revert the check signing uh, authority back to, um, I don't know how to word this, I guess, uh, was it be the treasurer or the CAO and the mayor or deputy mayor? Okay. And I'm we'll just looking at the clerk to confirm that wording. Just to clarify, it is an existing bylaw, oh. the, the the normal one, so we would basically re be removing the proposed changes that were recommended. All right, so then I move that we remove the recommended um, changes. Okay, and would you have a seconder for that amendment, Councillor Potts? Okay, uh, any further discussion? Oh. CAO Skinner? Just a little clarification that the treasurer was um, um, making, which it is electronic fund transfers as well as checks. I think that we were talking about here and we do do not so many checks anymore and a lot more electronic fund transfers, but that's to, for the folks who are making this. Uh, the mayor of King Township will be happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Councillor Ring. If that's the case, what does that do to the the uh, motion or amendment? We'll be revert. I guess we'll be actually reverting back. So we'll be as is. As yeah, is. As that is, is yeah, okay. yeah. Or disapproving the. I just heard about amendment. the electronic uh, transfers. Um, so so who are you I'm making just... them? Okay, uh, so I'm just going to turn to the clerk. So are we then um, going to vote to decline this or we're we just going to take it out? Correct. So council is saying that they don't agree with this one recommendation. Yeah. So that one recommendation proposing this change we're removing. And so, and it is applicable to... Uh, um, uh, checks and electronic right. fund transfers. So before they are, they're issued, the mayor reviews them. Is that correct? It's probably easier if, you, if it's okay, uh, Madam Chair, if I just explain a little bit. So there are very few checks that we issue. They're only for individuals that maybe are one-time sort of uh, situations. So uh, generally what happens if we have checks they're provided to the uh, to the mayor. EFTs, a listing of the EFTs that are being issued for that particular run, um, which happens every other week. A listing is provided to the mayor with all the detailed invoices as well, so that she is able to review um, what she needs to in order to feel comfortable and approve those. That's all done through an email, um, but essentially, so there isn't really a signing, but it's uh, her worship providing us with her approval um, via email. Thank you. Okay, um, then, uh, then we now have a proposal from the floor to um, remove, yeah, yeah, that's it, remove that recommendation. So still movers, still seconder, okay. Any other 
comments? Okay, so just uh, voting on the motion to remove that. Okay, all in favor? And that carries unanimously. Okay, any other oh, questions I, with regard to any I other? keep going with mine? Yes, <laughs> for sure. Now that we've got that one out of the way. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so number two, uh, with respect to lame duck, I really appreciate the, um, the clerk's work on um, adding some wording here that uh, did make it a little more palatable for me, uh, in including an alignment with the strategic plan and other corporate master plans. Um, because I think otherwise the wording just provided for um, the CAO position to make decision, unilateral decisions without regard for those things. Um, the adding of the words, and I do agree with um, the optional wording and where these liabilities do not have significant ongoing future annual impacts. My only question I have through to the clerk is how do we define significant? To me, um, to add eighty thousand dollars as an unavoidable increase for the following budget is significant, but I don't know if your definition of significant in this wording on a hundred and fifty million dollar budget uh, would qualify, and that's my that's my concern, which means I would very specifically have to word um, another amendment to say that very specifically that a new position not contemplated by council or in the budget could be added during lame duck, because I think lame duck is so short. Any um, employment or uh, staffing decisions should be well in hand before that short period and shouldn't have to be implemented during lame duck. Okay. Um, who would like to comment on that? Clerk? Certainly, sorry, yeah, just to address the, the the question regarding it. So this pertains to the section where it identifies um, the delegation to incur liabilities in excess of $50,000, where these liabilities have not been included in the approved annual budget. And the optional portion of that wording would be, and where these liabilities do not have significant ongoing future annual, annual impacts. The reason why significant um, was added, basically uh, uh, there could be some lingering costs that would go into the following year, but uh, $50,000 would be anything that's $50,000 in annual budgets moving forward. Um, I'm not sure, um, and obviously this would be a delegation that's provided to the CAO if our CAO has any comments related to what, uh, as a CAO, she believes would be significant. CAO. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Jeffrey. This is the uh, a little bit of the ultimate what if question. So um, some members of this council were non-council at the last time when we went through the election. So when the uh, in the lame duck period, and I'll say some of this just for the listening public, um, uh, council can't make all the decisions it can make today, uh, specifically if not a lot of people are coming back because they're somewhere in Ontario or maybe in history somewhere, someone spent you know a lot of money that was unintended by people who weren't going up for re-election. So during the lame duck period, council can do certain things uh, but uh, spending a lot of money or making decisions that weren't contemplated, you know, prior to those last few months before the election are not some things that council can do. So the question here at hand then becomes, what do you want your CAO to be able to do on your behalf during this lame duck period at the end of, of your term? So I would say it's... It, it, typically would be extraordinary for a CAO to, you know, put a new position into the org chart during that period. Um, during the last election I did, uh, for some reasons that I th felt were very important at the time, um, we had a lot of things going on here, and I don't think we're meant to get into that decision today, but the question really just becomes, what do you feel may be appropriate in this big what if, what if question at the end of your term uh, for me to do on your behalf if you can't? Um, I, I feel that significant is something that... Uh, you know, would cause you potentially to uh, have to raise taxes without a mitigating factor. So if you had to raise taxes in ongoing years without a mitigating factor, um, 
you know, a fees review, a way to, to recoup through user fees, that type of thing. Uh, but it's hard to really put a specific um, a specific number on it, because if it's something that you could delay, you wouldn't need me to act on your behalf during the lame duck period. Um, so I don't think that's a, a perfect answer. I mean, you could say it it was a certain dollar figure, but if if you know something came up where it was advantageous for the town to act, then none of us could. So it does does make it a difficult question on your behalf, but certainly you know significant to me is something that you're going to going to cause you. Um, and the next council some pain if, for example, I was to make that decision and, um, um, uh, you know, we had to live the, through it going forward. I think it's very important that you have a, a, a good CAO that you're willing to rely on before you get into that, uh, that lame duck uh, period, um, someone to um, do the best they can for council to push forward your intentions uh, during that limited period. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Baines. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Uh, similarly to this, there's the next point about this uh, award contracts to acquire goods and services valued in excess of $2 million during this lame duck period. Is there a cap on that? Um, it does concern me that uh, it's one thing about 50000 and, and plus, but uh, to enter into a contract without council one way or the other having um endorsed it uh in a vote it, it, to me is concerning and especially if there's no cap on this so i just need to know the rationale behind that i think that um because it's one of the items that would be uh limited by they must be within the strategic plan or other corporate master plan uh, or and correct me if I'm wrong I'm also understanding it would have to be within the previously approved budget so that's that becomes the control yeah, yeah. and uh, the clerk reminds me it's also consistent with our procurement policies Any other comments, questions? <laughs> I'm still working on number two okay. <laughs> in my head. So I, I guess uh, the thing is, because I've been, I've been in that position is once a CEO takes a delegated authority to do something, which you don't deem was within the delegated authority, you have no way to deal with it because it's lame duck. So you're kind of stuck with the um, unavoidable increase for the next year at 80,000 plus. So my problem here is, is this wording, while it fixes, I think, a lot of things in it, we wouldn't have our CEO if we didn't trust them. However, you don't know what decisions they're going to make during that time period, and this would support them to know what decisions you do not want made during that time period. And for me, it's, I, for me, and what council may or may not support it, but my amendment would be that um, a new position not be hired for, if it wasn't contemplated in the budget and hasn't pre presented to council previously, that, that a, new, uh, a new position would not be created and filled during lame duck. See, I, I, and I look at this item here and uh, because it, it already gives a dollar figure of $50,000, that that therefore anything more than $50,000 would be significant, correct? Because it, 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 it already has that limitation. I know, but that limitation was there last time and it didn't prevent it is what I'm saying. Okay, uh, who would like to respond to that? Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll just I'll turn it to the CAO and then I'll I'll bring it back to the the mayor and the deputy mayor. Um, thank you. Through the to you that the fifty thousand dollars is a part of the municipal act where it talks about what councils cannot do 
during the period of uh, lame duck, so after the closing of nominations. So um, it is not necessarily applying to the uh, ability of the uh, cap on the ability of the CAO's delegated authority. So I would consider those two to be, to be separate considerations. So the CAO must make decisions over 50,000 that were not contemplated in the budget should council delegate that authority to him or her. Um, but it doesn't cap that amount at 50,000 unless that's something that council does as part of your delegation of authority. Okay, so back to your point then. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just allow for others. So I have the deputy mayor, then the mayor, then councilor Ring. Uh, thank you, Chair Doherty. And, and I'm, I'm gonna say that I felt when I read it, that the reference to approved annual budget protected an instance where something could be done to the next budget. And and maybe I'm wrong because I know what happened happened and, and we didn't feel we had anything to, that we could do with it. But um, in lame duck, uh, the budget for the next year doesn't get approved until the next council. So um, the approved budget is the in that particular case was the 2022 budget. So in my view, uh, when I read it, I was thinking that that actually was a little piece of new <laughs> wording because uh, it's referring to the annual approved budget and and, and the next year the, the new council is gonna be in place hasn't been approved yet. So am I missing something on that? Uh, do, I, do you know where I'm coming from? Uh, no, are, are you, sorry, through you, Go ahead. Uh, are you contraminded to what I'm saying or so I just need to know where you're standing on it to understand your, your input. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When I read approved budget, I was thinking, okay, well, nothing can be done for the next year because it doesn't get approved until the new council's in. Am, am I wrong on that? I would just ask the clerk through the chair to clarify that wording because I, all I, all I want not to happen is to have something that results in an unavoidable increase of 80,000 into the next period and something that council didn't authorize or even talk about in terms of its existing budget because there was the part amounts for during the year we were operating in as well, we were lame ducks, we weren't operating. And then what followed the following year in a budget that wasn't done yet. So I'm just trying to cover off everybody for those two time periods. If so I may I'm, just follow up, uh, Sorry. totally understand. And and that's the difficulty I spoke about two meetings ago where I said, when you try to put this down in succinct uh, words, it's very difficult to cover everything. So I'm I'm supportive. If you think you need some other wording in there, I just was thinking of that and I'd be interested to, to hear from Kirk Thomas in that regard then, I guess. Clerk Thomas? Certainly. So for clarity, this is during the lame duck period. So it would happen uh, generally in August to November when the election happens and before the inauguration of the new council. So it's during this period that these uh, liabilities in excess of $50,000 where the liabilities have not been included in the approved budget. So in this instance, it was this liability happened during that period who was ca causing subsequent year liabilities. So, so that's that's why the potential wording um, would help address this specific issue is where these liabilities, you know, don't have significant ongoing future annual budgets. So the question is significant. Um, another uh, comment too, with respect to if it's, you know, staffing is the primary concern, um, you know, there's a difference between a full-time permanent staff and a contract staff that could a contract staff be hired knowing that you'd be able to approve in the following year budget or disapprove a contract position. That's another option for your consideration too. Okay. So um, I don't know if there's anybody else who wants to speak first before yes. I do my amendment. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ring. Uh, thank you, Chair Doherty. Um, 
and maybe I'm the only one that thinks this, but I think the wording the way it is in, in the option covers what uh, Councillor Jeffries is, is trying to achieve, I think. I think because of their use in the word future annual impacts, that means uh, you're not gonna hire somebody and then let them go once a new council comes in. They're gonna, you're gonna hire them long term or at least a year anyway so that the end word annual i think refers back to the word annual budget um so it's something that's got to be done annually and if you're hiring somebody or you i'm thinking that the wording here covers that you can't hire somebody um during lame duck okay okay just <laughs> No, you're going to recommend some alternate. Well, I well, I, I think because significant is some is not a definition that we can reasonably try to uh, put into words here. And the fact that we're already starting in excess of fifty thousand dollars, it's not we're not starting under fifty. We're start, starting about those over and above fifty. Um, I I really do feel that I would like to add an, um, a new D that said. Um, this uh, authority would not include the hiring of non-contract staff in a position not previously contemplated by council or in the budget. Uh, would there be a seconder for that? Okay, Deputy Mayor seconded. Any other comments? Uh, Mayor Just Cameron? If that could be clarified, where would that be? Sorry, where does that go? That is on page three, mm -hmm. um, item C. So it would be incur liabilities or hire non-contract staff in excess of, yeah. or a new D. So could you just read out what that would say again, please? Or get, yeah. if the clerk has it. Did, did, were you able to capture that, Clerk Almas? Thank you. and just putting in the additional D for the option. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have it up on the screen now. So, uh, C uh, stays. And D, delegated authority does not include the hiring of non-contract staff that was not previously contemplated in the annual budget. So, 
Mover, Councillor Jeffrey, still seconded by Deputy Mayor. Uh, any other comments with regard to this amendment? Councillor Baines, you had your card up. Well, I, I will comment that I agree with uh, Councillor Ring that I, I, do, I don't see how um, this um, limitation here needs further definition. And I, th I think that the statement as amended covers it by virtue of the fact that it talks about ongoing future annual impacts. So that's okay. So that's, that's just me talking. But uh, anyway, um, if there are no further comments, then I'll call the vote all in favor. Oh, Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Could you divide that into two parts? Because the first part of the amendment was to accept the optional wording, and the second part was about the staff. Okay. So we can vote separately. Right. Fair enough. Oh. Lost my screen now. Uh, Okay, so the calling the vote then on the First Amendment as previously stated, all in favor. And that carries unanimously. And calling the addition to this um, section, um, if you would kindly put it back on the screen. The, the delegated authority does not include the hiring of non-contract staff that was not previously contemplated in the annual approved budget. All in favor of that amendment. And okay, need the need the screen picture. Okay. And opposed if any. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, are there any other uh, comments or concerns uh, regarding the pro proposed amendments to the staff report? Uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor Hamlin. Thank you. Uh, with respect to item number five about the authority to execute minister settlement, I like... Mm -hmm. Uh, the alternative as opposed to the proposed change. The proposed change was just to update the name of the tribunal, uh, but I thought it was good to have clarity about what role council had. And so the alternative, which is at the top of page 82 of 237, says authority to review and execute minister settlement and related documents in accordance with council's direction and with circulation of draft documents to council upon request including the authority to participate in the hearing process where appropriate so uh, the difference is it just allows council to actually see the minutes of settlement uh, before authorizing their approval if council wishes. So I like that. So I would propose that that alternative uh, be included. Okay, so that that actually is uh, not the alternative that that's the amendment. Mm. The this here. So at the bottom of yeah. I'll let the clerk yeah. explain it. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry. It is an alternative. Okay. Uh, and um, is there a seconder? Councillor Baines. Uh, any comments on a motion for the alternative? Uh, Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you. Could staff just confirm again uh, if there's any problem with the alternative? Or 
I, I, I think it negates expedience, if that is what was being called for here. Uh, Director Valentine. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, it is It is certainly a balance. A uh, number of OLT matters come together quite quickly, um, but there may be a variety of different circumstances and some may allow for more time for council review. So um, that was why staff suggested upon request so that each circumstance can be evaluated. Um, and then if council did wish to see the minutes of settlement before authorizing um, the delegated authority, then at least the bylaws set up to provide for that if time allows. Thank you. Uh, follow up then, Jeffrey. And two, we would have directed staff before a settlement was entered into in any event, correct? Uh, and uh, Director Valentine? Uh, thank you, Chair. And through you, yes, um, the original wording of that delegated authority did include council's direction. So that isn't changing. There was just additional wording provided to address the concern that there may be times where council wishes to review the minutes of settlement in their entirety before authorizing staff delegated execution. Thank you. Mayor Hamlin. The reason I like this is uh, I found, particularly last term, um, and I have, must say things have improved considerably over the last uh, couple of years, but I found, and we had different staff then, and I appreciate everything's changed, but we had uh, staff uh, advising us on minutes of settlement, uh, sometimes without the solicitor's input and very, not very thorough review of what the settlement was about. And I would find out later it was quite different from what I had thought. <laughs> so I just thought when I saw this, I thought that would really eliminate uh, any confusion about what exactly the minutes are. And I know it's some municipal lawyers practice to, to when they come to report to councils in camera about settlement, they actually bring draft minutes of settlement. <laughs> so you can look at them. So, you know, this I, I appreciate this is evolving uh, in every municipality, but I think we should have the ability to see exactly uh, what the words are and what exactly is being settled if we want to. <laughs> it seems self-evident to me, but I uh, will a council. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Any other comments uh, with regard to this alternative? Okay, uh, seeing none, then I will call the vote in favor of the alternative amendment. Councillor Baines, two, three, and opposed. And that, okay, uh, Councillor Ring, are you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that was. Uh, three, oh, and I did not see Councillor Perry. Yeah, we better do this again. So all in favor of the proposed amendment. Okay, one, two, three, four, including Councillor Perry. Opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and so uh, that um, fails. Okay, are there any other um, proposed amendments to the staff report or proposed changes to the amendments suggested by staff? Okay, I uh, will add one myself then, if I may, um, and that uh, uh, actually, I'll just ask um, Vice Chair Ring uh, if I can ask you just to take the chair for a sec. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, and this is uh, with regard to um, delegated authority again, and and my the proposed change is in, in line with the some of the other amendments that we have seen. Um, this evening. So uh, with regular CAO delegated authority, 
to establish the structure of the municipality, including the creation, merger, elimination, or, and reorganization of divisions and departments, and establishing managerial hierarchy. And I am suggesting that we add that align with the strategic plan or other corporate plans. And that is uh, <coughs> sorry, I just got to find where I'm at. Uh, that would be uh, a um, recommended um, amendment to an existing delegated authority of the CAO. So, uh, and uh, this is, as I said, um, other uh, amendments proposed here uh, did um, reference alignment with strategic plans or other corporate plans, and this is just to be consistent with that. So, uh, thank you very much. And I'm I'm continuing to share, aren't I? <laughs> so, yeah. okay, go ahead. I'll, sh I'll shut up. It's already been seconded. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Bain seconded. Any other questions? CEO uh, Skinner. Uh, Thank you, Acting Chair. Um, through you, I, I just had one comment, uh, which is I'm uh, no concerns with the uh, the intention and philosophy of this proposed amendment. Um, how sometimes we do move areas around in the organization uh, for operational purposes. In the last few years, for example, we did move the bylaw division to report to different people because of retirements and things that were happening. Um, so I'm 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 okay with this as long long as it's interpreted to mean as changes that do not um, detract from the strategic plan or other corporate master plans, because sometimes there will be operational reasons to change the structure of the municipality to make it you know, more efficient or just to operationally occur. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that intention um, before you had your vote, if possible, please. Um, Chair Doherty, is that, was that the intent? of uh, of your your amendment uh yes it was so I, alleviate it's just, her concerns on or the cao's concerns no. on no that uh that is precisely what the intention was it was just to elaborate on and um um be consistent with the other suggestions that have been or recommendations that have been made uh, for changes to this bylaw. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any call for the question? All in favor? It's unanimous. Chair, back to you. Thank you, Councillor Root. Vice Chair Ring. Um, any other comments? or questions or proposed changes. Okay, seeing none, then um, we can roll back to the original recommendation. And um, that would be uh, that uh, staff report C-2024-01, delegation of authority, review be received and that council amend the delegation of power bylaw 2020-057 to include the recommendations contained herein as amended. So we have a mover and a seconder all in favor and that carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to the next item on the agenda uh, is uh, T2024-03, 
the 2023 investment report. And this was deferred from March 4th uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. And I will turn it over to Director Quinlan. Uh, or, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Chair Doherty. Um, as you mentioned, this is a deferral from the previous Committee of the Whole on March 4th, so we won't be representing um, what we shared on March 4th. However, there are some amendments. Um, they are noted in the amendment section of the report. In addition, uh, we've added some additional information that was requested, um, but I'm happy to hear any questions. Okay, uh, I guess first before I turn it over to the committee, I will just inquire whether there are any questions or comments from the gallery. Seeing none, uh, would there be any questions or comments from the online? Thank you, um, Chair Doherty. We do have um, one participant online that has their hand raised. Uh, and the name is John Doe. Uh, so uh, we can allow them to speak, but they would have to uh, provide their name immediately before speaking, or they will be muted. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, to the individual that is uh, online now identified as John Doe, happy to entertain your comments. Um, but as the clerk has noted, uh, we would uh, require your your name. Thank you, Chair Doherty. The hand is still raised. Uh, they are able to unmute themselves if they wish to speak. And again, if there's in, any technical difficulties and they wish to provide comments regarding the staff reports, they still have time as the staff report will be coming back to Council on April the 8th. Thank you, Clerk. Okay, so seeing no comments uh, online or from the gallery, I will read the motion and um, ask for mover and seconder. So the recommendation is that staff report T2024-03, the 2023 investment report, be received for information. Mover and seconder. Deputy Mayor Fryer, Councillor Baines. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Doherty. Uh, to begin with, uh, regarding the motion uh, to receive this report for information, I appreciate uh, Treasury's uh, efforts in providing amendments and the other supporting details for the recommendations to hold all long-term investments at this point in time. Um, specific items such as the additions to the PPN table, including a current index data column, which is indicating an upward trend, as well as detail about performance gains and forecasts of the applicable sector is uh, all in support of that uh, hold uh, recommendation. Um, as noted in the report, Treasury will continually analyze and proactively manage the portfolios to determine if any adjustments need to be brought forward to Council. Um, so in that regard, I wanted to ask um, that that if analysis requirements led to uh, a need for additional resources, then Treasury has the ability within the investment policy to formally deploy those um, without having to come directly to Council. So I wanted to ask the Treasurer if uh, she felt that there was the ability to um, bring in a, another party because the the needs is is more. I'm I'm time concerns uh, for the for the is the wording in the investment policy allow for a resource to be used, which may have some cost behind it, um, and uh, and so I'm asking through you to the treasurer that question. Okay, Treasurer Quinn, Treasurer you. Quinlan. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Um, I I feel like the investment policy does uh, speak to that. Um, however. Uh, if it wasn't budgeted uh, within um, with the, within the department, I would have to go to the CAO to request um, the additional uh, funds if that was uh, required. Um, 
And then if it was above that uh, delegated authority, we would have to come to council to request um, the hiring as well, I suppose. Thank just, you. Just as a follow-up, uh, my concern there is that there may be a need for some pretty centric uh, analysis and an ongoing for, for a short period of time. So I wanted to make sure, I know we're going to talk about the uh, investment policy in another segment when we're reviewing the policy itself. Um, I just wanted to make sure that if the treasurer needed those resources, they could be implemented. If if the wording wasn't in the investment policy, then I was prepared to try to do something about it tonight. But it sounds like it's okay. Um, and I just, the, the CEO has nodded and, and unless she wanted to say anything further, that's all covered then. Okay. CAO, any comment? No. Um, no, through you uh, to the Deputy Mayor Fryer, yes, if the uh, Treasurer felt or we felt that there was a need for external expert investment advice, we certainly would pursue that uh, actively and uh, come to Council if necessary for the resources, but I do think we would be able to get that on board quickly if it was uh, deemed appropriate. Thank you. Follow, follow up yeah. if I may? Yes. Uh, because I do support the report as presented, um, but I did want to just briefly review a couple of the other points that have come up through our, uh, our conversations. Um, so in regards to the $3.5 million of interest that was earned for 2023, um, the report indicates that that is about 2.7%, which on the surface would appear to be low um, based on the current climate. But um, it has been identified in the report that it's because basically half of the Roughly 127 was the average for the for the year. Um, about half the money is not earning anything directly on an annual basis. So I just wanted to confirm again through the treasurer that, uh, as I say, the 2.7 appears to be low, but that's the reason why. So I just wanted to confirm through the through the treasurer on that. Treasurer Quinlan, thank you, Chair Doherty. Through you to uh, Deputy Mayor Fryer. Um, yes, that is true that um, some of the uh, investments are not um, earning within the year or on an annual basis. They uh, generally earn because they're the PPN specifically um, as part of the um, market value when it's um, not a maturity year. So the expectation is that right now, while the um, portfolio has dipped below um, the market value that we would like to see, of course, um, it does not earn an annual interest amount, but once um, those markets turn around, then the expectation would be we would accrue the, the interest as we go forward. Um, additionally, of course, from a cash flow standpoint, uh, those um, investments don't receive interest until they mature. Okay. Thank you. Follow up. Um, and and in relation to the three point five million, um, the report shows that the um, the estimate is uh, seven hundred eleven thousand dollars of operating interest revenue, um, which I'm going to confirm again through the treasurer. That's based on a twenty percent factor that uh, that was used when when the when the estimate was made for the report. Uh, again, just clarifying. Okay. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Yes, that is uh, correct. We have used it based on an estimated 20% going towards the um, the operational uh, budget uh, for this year, which is very similar to previous years. Well, a reason I was asking about that, and and uh, and I have through some of the questions beforehand uh, covered this with the treasurer. Um, I was looking at the fact that three hundred thousand uh, dollars was the budget estimate that was used. And since 711 is obviously very favorable for the impact, um, I was trying to look at it from a 2020 operating surplus estimate standpoint um, to try to find out if there was a ability to get an update on where that number looks like it's coming in. Um, so I will ask the question through the treasurer and, and let her respond on what she has told me already. So. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Um, the, uh, the audit for 2023 is underway as we speak. It started this morning. Uh, so we will have draft uh, statements by the end of the week, with an updated surplus. I think what we've put forward is um, very reasonable and not overly conservative. So I think the 7-Eleven would stand for now. Thank you. 
Deputy Mayor? I, I am going to close off. Uh, um, and one of the primary matters for me is that uh, um, it is about the annual interest earnings. And um, when I was a council supporter of the 2017 um, new investment policy that we put in place, I hadn't co contemplated the, the fact that some of the investments wouldn't garner annual interest. Um, so to me, that has a significant impact on the current taxpayer. And um, it's been identified, though, that we're going to be dealing with the investment policy um, in a later time. And uh, and that's the time to be, to, to be dealing with that. Um, but the one thing I was going to ask again of the Treasurer, because um, one of the offline uh, details that she provided to us, um, because there is a little bit of lack of, of wording about allocation of interest, within our policy um, that I think is going to be addressed in the future. But um, she did make reference to the fact that the, the Municipal Act under Section 181 does uh, speak to annualized interest allocation. Um, but I think there was a, uh, uh, it applied to certain portfolio investments. So I was hoping you'd still remember that. Um, that reference that you had sent to uh, council and just be able to elaborate about that, um, if you if you may. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Um, so I think the the uh, portion you were referencing, where I had referenced back to you, was Section 418, um, uh, and that is the investments that a municipal a municipal treasurer can make, and it also speaks to how interest is allocated. And it basically says that earnings, and I'm, I'm directly quoting from the Municipal Act, earnings from combined investments shall be credited to each separate fund in proportion to the amount invested from it. So I think, um, you know, in fairness, there is some, um, what's the word, subjectivity that I think council could apply to that. So if, uh, for example, the deputy mayor was looking to um, direct interest from particular investments um, and and into particular uh, reserve funds, that, that would be a possibility and within council's control. Essentially what the... Um, what I believe the Municipal Act is trying to uh, address is when you're taking an entire investment portfolio and then allocating it out across all the reserve funds, that each reserve fund gets the um, appropriate allocation of interest. But I don't think it precludes uh, members of council from choosing to um, assign certain investments to certain reserve funds. Thank you. And my final comment is uh, that's that's where I was going in, and, and that's the conversation for when we're dealing with the investment policy review itself, um, because I do feel there may need be a, a need for, if we're doing long-term investment, then we link it to the long-term reserve that's involved, and, and that's great. I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other questions? Councillor Jeffrey. No questions, just big picture uh, comments. Um, obviously, uh, in favor of receiving the, the treasurer's report. Um, but I, I think that, you know, even when you go into the bank to invest, they give you a form to fill out to kind of test your, um, uh, what's the word, <laughs> to risk <laughs> your, uh, yeah, <laughs> however scaverse you are. And I think uh, going forward and may come under other discussions is maybe checking in with a council as to where you feel your risk adverse is in terms of the types of um, investments we are using um, because we are answerable to the public and it is difficult to answer these questions on such complex um, investments. So I think that would be a good discussion going forward. And I would also be very supportive if there were some of these items that came up and would give us a good return before we get to maturity and that we could get them out and get them into a more traditional um, form of investing within our portfolio, I'd be very supportive of that too going forward. So happy to receive the report, but um, and looking forward to the future discussions on the policy. Thank you. And no other comments? Okay, uh, then I will call the vote to receive the report. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Next item 
is um, the uh, staff report uh, P2024-06, a proposed zoning bylaw amendment for 58 George Street. Uh, and um, the presentation, we have a short presentation, I believe, for, and I'll turn it over to Director Valentine. Uh, thank you, Chair. In the interest of time, we can go directly to uh, Community Planner Frisch's presentation, including uh, revisions to the bylaw since last you saw it at the public meeting to address uh, concerns that were raised around this table regarding compatibility. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Planner Frisch. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Doherty, committee, and members of the public. My name is Beckett Frisch, and I have been assigned to the file for proposed zoning bylaw amendment for the lands municipally addressed as 58 George Street. Next slide, please. The subject property is located on the southeast corner of George Street and St. Marie Street and has a lot area of approximately 0 0.1 hectares. The property currently contains a former place of worship building to be converted to a daycare center, a parking area, single detached dwelling, detached accessory building, and a driveway. The lands are surrounded by residential uses in all directions. Next slide, please. The subject property is zoned Community Services, CS. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment seeks to rezone the western portion of the subject property to Community Services Exception 11, CS 11 zone, and the eastern portion of the subject property to Residential Second Density Exception 32, R232 zone to facilitate a future consent application. The proposed exception zones would recognize the existing lot conditions and the existing building and parking configurations of the future retained and severed lots. Next slide, please. The proposed R232 zone would recognize a reduced rear yard and for the existing single detached dwelling and detached accessory building. The maximum height permitted for a detached accessory building in a residential zone is seven meters and 12 meters for a residential dwelling in the R2 zone. However, staff have also proposed a reduced maximum height for a detached accessory building and portions of residential dwellings which do not conform to the minimum setbacks in the parent zone. The proposed maximum height of five meters for detached accessory buildings is a reduction of two meters, and a proposed maximum height of six meters for residential dwellings is a reduction of six meters and is reflective of the scale of the existing structures. The applicant has been amenable to this approach. Next slide, please. The proposed CS11 zone would recognize an existing set of stairs projecting into the front yard, the existing parking configuration, and reduce setbacks for the existing building to recognize its position on the future retained lot. Next slide, please. This slide shows the preliminary concept plan for the future consent application, which triggered the requirement for a zoning bylaw amendment. The applicant is proposing to convert the former place of worship on the western portion of the lands into a daycare center with five parking spaces, including one accessible space and bicycle parking. Council previously granted an interim control bylaw exemption for a daycare center on the subject property on December 19th, 2022. The applicant is also proposing to maintain the residential uses on the eastern portion of the lands in the existing single detached dwelling. A fence is proposed to separate the two uses along the lot line to be established through the, through the future consent application. A daycare center is a permitted use in the CS zone and a single detached dwelling is a permitted use in the R2 zone. Next slide, please. The proposal was circulated to internal departments as well as external agencies for review and comment. One public comment was received with respect to this application, noting no objections. At the February 21st public meeting, staff received comments from members of council regarding the redevelopment potential of the proposed R232 portion of the subject lens, particularly the impact of an increase in height with the proposed reduced rear yard setback. As previously noted, in response to this feedback, staff has re have revised the proposed zoning bylaw amendment to include a reduced maximum height for structures which do not conform with the minimum setbacks on the parent of the parent R2 zone and detached accessory building provisions. Planning services is satisfied that all concerns related to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment have been satisfactorily addressed. Next slide, please. Planning services recommend approval for the application as the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with or conforms to applicable planning policy and regulatory instruments, supports intensification of a built up area on a municipally serviced lot, 
contributes to compact built form and complete communities, supports growth of complementary uses within residential areas and facilitates additional employment opportunities, and is supported by internal and external review partners. Next slide, please. This slide shows the planning process for the zoning bylaw amendment. The items starting at the top left have been completed. A public meeting was held at the February 21st, 2024 council meeting where no members of the public provided feedback. Feedback received from members of council at the public meeting was considered in the preparation of this staff report. We are now at the staff recommendation to committee stage. Next slide, please. Pending committee's decision today, the staff report would proceed to the next council meeting on April 8th, 2024 for decision. If approved, a notice of decision will be issued and the 20 day appeal period would commence. Upon the expiration of the appeal period, the zoning bylaw amendment would come into effect if no appeals are received. In the future, a consent application will be required to sever the proposed R232 portion of the lands to create a new lot. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for a very thorough presentation. You're welcome. Are there any comments uh, from anyone in the gallery with regard to this report? Seeing none, is there anyone online that wishes to comment? Thank you. We do have um, a John Doe, again, with a raised hand, wishing to address the committee regarding this uh, specific report. So again, this report is on 58 George Street. And again, uh, we will unmute you. You have to mute from your and oh, hands down now. Huh. So maybe they're not interested. If there is anyone else interested, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen and we will unmute you. The hand is raised. It's not raised, so we'll proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, I will read the motion and look for a mover and a seconder. Uh, the recommendation is that staff report P2024-06, proposed zoning bylaw amendment, 58 George Street, dated March 18th, 2024, be received, uh, and that the amending zoning bylaw attached as Appendix A to this report be enacted and passed. Mover and seconder. Councillor Houston, Councillor Ring, Vice Chair Ring. Any comments or questions from committee? Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I want to thank staff for uh, solving my request with respect to the height of the buildings in a reduced setback situation. I appreciated that. And I apologize for not seeing it in the, um, I kind of read in the report where it said amendments none. And then I read through the other dialogue and went, oh, nothing's changed. So then I sent an email to the director. And so the, the lead was buried. So I'm wondering, is there an opportunity for us at the beginning under the recommendation, if it's not an amendment, but uh, changes made in response to public input or something like that, so that you know there is something to read for? Um, that would help help me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilor much, Jeffrey. I see some nodding from Director Valentine. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This this is the first staff report on this matter, so there wasn't any amendments per se, but certainly within the executive summary, we can draw Council's uh, attention to any major changes that uh, had occurred since the public meeting resulting in revisions to the bylaw. Thank you. Yeah, any other comments? Thank you. Well, I will just uh, echo um, uh, Councillor Jeffrey's comments um, that it is um, good to see that um, the issue of a uh, very uh, small setback that could have impact on on uh, the Im or could have impact on existing properties in a redevelopment scenario under our usual standards has been addressed and uh, we look forward to seeing more of those as we go forward um i will then if there are no other questions i will call the vote all in favor and that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are 
almost at the first witching hour. Uh, can I please have a motion to extend for one hour? Councillor Potts and Councillor Baines second. Okay, um, then, oh, yes, call the vote. All in favor. And that's unanimous. Okay, so uh, next item is uh, PRC 2024-03, the Collingwood Sailing Academy. And the recommendation here is that staff report PRC 2024-03, Collingwood Sailing Academy be received and that council approve proceeding in the development of a lease agreement for use of town property and assets by the Collingwood Sailing Academy. And I will turn it over to Director Culver. Thank you, Chair. Um, just when you thought you were done with me. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, you are because uh, Manager Michelle Finley is going to be taking the lead on this. Um, a great idea. Thank you. Thank uh, Chair you. Doherty, before I begin, I would actually like to um, introduce two important people in the gallery. Uh, first, uh, Brian Bailey is here. He is the gentleman behind the beginning of the Collingwood Sailing School. So he is here uh, in support of a former student instructor of his, um, Laura Blahovic, who's here from the Collingwood uh, Sailing Academy. That's, that's my wonderful people yeah. back there. Um, so I am, uh, as you're aware, the Collingwood Sailing School um, has not operated um, since the summer of 2019. Uh, COVID took a real hit on us. Um, and also, um, much like my lifeguard training, we had the same issues with um, certification of instructors. Uh, so every year that we've gone out looking for instructors, when we've been ready to operate, we have not been able to recruit enough members to operate the school. Uh, staff were approached by uh, Laura and uh, Madison Boyce, another former employee of the um, sailing school, uh, as well as uh, John Green. They're the three board members of the Collingwood Sailing Academy, and they came to us with a with a request to utilize um, our assets to begin their own program. And they've done quite a bit of uh, of work behind that. Uh, they've actually been working in conjunction with the Collingwood Yacht Club and have an agreement with them to operate uh, from their grounds in their facility uh, when weather per is uh, not permitting. So they do have shelter, um, but they are requesting use of our uh, docks, um, our boats. So it'd be nice to see our little white uh, 420s back on the water. Um, and uh, they've also... Um, mentioned um, and offered to help us with the minor repairs of those boats to get them back on the water. And um, so it would be, the town would be providing um, the materials and they are uh, very experienced in making those repairs. Very good. Thank you. What an excellent public private partnership that is. And uh, um, Mr. Bailey, I'm sure you must be pleased to see a sustained legacy here. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so, uh, is there anyone from the gallery that uh, wishes to comment further? Perhaps our proponents might like to. I'd like to take a really good comment. It's been an absolute pleasure to work alongside Dean and Michelle, um, and we're thrilled to have just gotten it this far. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, any comments from anyone online? Thank you, Chair Doherty. We do have a couple hands raised. Uh, we will allow them to unmute. And again, you'll have to state your name uh, first and uh, we will allow you to proceed. So the first one with the raised hand uh, right now is identified as iPhone 14. So we will uh, allow you to unmute. Go ahead. And they should be able to uh, address the committee now. Mm 
And again, this is um, Committee of the Whole. So if anybody wishes to provide further comments before reports are being heard on April the 8th, they may provide them to council or staff directly. And there's no further hands being raised. Okay, thank you, Clerk Olmos. All right, then turning to the committee, mover and, well, let me read the full recommendation in. Um, the That staff report PRC 2024-03 Collingwood Sailing Academy be received and that council approve proceeding in the development of a lease agreement for use of town property and assets by the Collingwood Sailing Academy. Mover and seconder, Councillor Potts, Councillor Houston. Any comments or questions? Councillor Baines. Then Thank you, Chair Dor. Yeah, I think um, Director Culver may remember in back in 2019, I think I was just the incoming president of the Optimist Club, and we had, as a club, uh, committed, I think, $1,400 or so to the Collingwood Sailing Club, and that just sort of was in abeyance for year after year after year because of COVID. So I would request the club come back to the Optimist Club and claim your uh, grant, if you will, and perhaps more. We shall see. At any rate, glad to see you guys back. Uh, and indeed, I don't know if you know Larry Hogarth, who's a, a former sailor as well, and myself used to build wooden boats. If we can be helpful in uh, repairing your boats, I'd be pleased to do so. And Godspeed forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baines. There's an offer you can't refuse. Uh, Mayor Hamlin. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to our staff and to the Collingwood Sailing uh, Academy for bringing this forward to us. It's such a win-win for our community. And thank you. Uh, you know, I love this that we're bringing the can sail program back to the harbor with the use of the town's boats. And uh, thank you for your offer of labor to get these boats going. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, seeing uh, no other comments, I'll call the vote. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And we will uh, then move on to the next item, which is uh, PW 2024-02, Pretty River Estates Subdivision Assumption. And uh, I will turn this part of the meeting over to Director Salama. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we do have um, Manager West uh, on joining us uh, virtually online uh, this evening, and he will just give a, a brief outline of this report in front of Council this evening. Thank you. Manager West, welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, thank you, Director Slama. Thank you, Committee and Council, for having me here tonight. Um, staff are here to recommend assumption of the Pretty River Estates subdivision. Uh, there should be a staff report um, submitted for, for your review. Assumption of a new subdivision means that the town has assumed responsibility for all of the maintenance and all of the municipal services for the subdivision from the developer. Uh, a development is brought forward for assumption once it has been inspected and certified by the professional engineers uh, to ensure that the contractual obligations with the town have been met in accordance with the subdivision agreement. Um, this subdivision, the Pretty River States, uh, is draft approved in December 2002. In 2007, the town entered into a pre-servicing agreement, starting construction of the development, and then formally executing a subdivision agreement in November 2009. Uh, the development consists of 144 single dwelling homes, 42 semi-detached homes, and 34 townhouse lots. Uh, staff and the developer's consultants have inspected all the municipal infrastructure uh, constructed in accordance with the development, uh, and, and we're satisfied that all works have been completed in accordance with the applicable standards and the executed subdivision agreements as well. Um, and staff recommend that council will pass the bylaw uh, and assume the municipal works. Um, so hopefully that's a, a short summary, and um, I'm available for any further questions or clarifications that are uh, that are needed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Manager West. Short and sweet. Is there anyone in the gallery that wishes to comment on this staff report? 
Uh, is there any anyone online? Thank you, Chair Doherty. We do have one individual by the name of Daniel Larson uh, that has his hand raised. Oh, no longer wishing to speak. Thank you, Clerk Almas. Okay, I will uh, read the full motion in. Uh, recommendation that staff report PW 2024-02 Pretty River Estates subdivision assumption be received and that council approve the assumption of all non-assumed municipal works within Pretty River State subdivision and that council enact and pass a bylaw to assume the roads with the Pretty River State subdivision. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Potts, uh, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Oh, is that, sorry, is that you don't have my glasses, Chris? If you if you if you move your hand, I think it might be you wanting to speak. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um the only I uh did um ask uh, the question uh previously to Director Slama and uh, it was um with regard to uh not not so much uh, these homes, but uh, homes specifically along Hughes that back on to the Hamilton Drain uh, Trail, and there had been drainage issues um, on a couple of those properties in the past, and I just wanted to uh, follow up with you to uh, inquire um, what is the status of of those homes at the moment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to, to you, in response to you, um, some there we have reported some, uh, or it's been reported some damp uh, backyards uh, on the proper for the properties or some of the properties along Hughes, and some drainage improvements were completed along the Hamilton uh, Drain Trail. Uh, those were undertaken last year and uh, by the Parks Department, and we have heard um, that those have improved some of the situations. Um, outside of that, uh, staff, you know, have engineering staff have been on site and uh, looking at the grading, it does conform to um, the sloping away from the building. So um, there's, they're unclear, like, you know, what else could be contributing to some of these damp, damp areas, which seem to be present, uh, not all year long necessarily, but at some times of the year. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, if there are no questions or comments uh, from the committee, then I will call the vote on this uh, recommendation. All in favor? And that carries unanimously. Uh, next item is 14.2.6. T2024-04, uh, Employee Future Benefits Liability and Reserve. And uh, this uh, report is uh, also from uh, the Treasury Department and Treasurer Quinlan will lead us through. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. So uh, we don't have a presentation, but a, a quick summary of uh, this report. Um, for those that aren't aware, as part of our government uh, statements that we complete each year, our financial statements we complete each year, we prepare them in accordance with uh, PSAB, which is the Public Sector Accounting uh, Board Standards. Um, Section 3255 of PSAB um, is really in relation to employee future benefits, and it establishes what the standards are on how we account for and report the obligations for post-employment benefits. Um, Post-employment benefits are made up of um, uh, dental health uh, and that type of uh, health insurance that we provide our employees. Um, for those that retire prior to the age of 65, they're entitled to benefits up until the age of 65 when um, the province um, steps in. So as we prepared our, uh, began preparing 2023's financial statement working papers, um, we discovered that the town had um, incorrectly 
been recording both a liability and contributing to the reserve fund for these benefits since 2009. So essentially double funding them uh, in error. The balance in both the liability and the reserve accounts are uh, about 1.8 million. Uh, although PSAP does mandate that the liability um, be listed or included on your financial statement preparation, it does not um, force or mandate the funding of the actual uh, amounts. And to be uh, frank, a majority of municipalities do not fund it because it is seen as a very uh, small risk that this payout uh, would uh, occur. So within the report, staff have presented council with three separate options. All three of the options um, include transferring the $1.8 million um, from the uh, reserve uh, balance to the life cycle, life cycle replacement uh, reserve. Um, but they do uh, differ a little bit uh, when it comes to the liability. So option one is uh, the staff recommendation and staff is recommending that we stop funding the, uh, the employee future benefits amount on a go forward basis. So beginning with the 2023 statements, we would no longer fund these amounts, um, but we would leave the current balance or the uh, correct balance um, as at 1.8 million in, the, in that liability. Option two is um, continuing to fund the liability. However, again, um, we would uh, have the 1.8 million being transferred just as we would in option one. And then option three is, in fact, going back to um, 2009, where we have um, funded this amount in total of $3.6 million and defunding that retroactively. Um, this would allow, uh, or, pardon me, so uh, the $3.6 million obviously is double what the, uh, the um, recommended option is. It's a little less conservative, however, as I mentioned, um, as we review many of our other municipal uh, financial statements, uh, I would say most, probably 80% of them, do not fund the employee future benefits. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Treasurer Quinlan. I see no one in the gallery, so I will uh, ask if there is anyone online that has comments. We have a Daniel Larson again. It, it appears that they're just playing games at this point, so <laughs> we won't. We'll we'll just wait. Okay. Thank you, Clerk Almas. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Certainly. Okay, I uh, will uh, read it out in its entirety and then ask you uh, to uh, sever. So um, the recommendation then is that staff report T2024-04, employee future benefits liability and reserve be received and that council direct staff to reallocate uh, 1,774,100 uh, um, uh, from the employee future benefit reserve to the life cycle reserve fund, and that council direct staff to discontinue funding the employee future benefit liability on a go forward basis, effective December 31st, 2023. Uh, mover and seconder, Councillor Baines and uh, Count Vice Chair Ring and Deputy Mayor. You would like to uh, sever? Thank you, uh, Chair Doherty. I, I just thought if we voted on each one separately, please. Okay. Um, all right. So then. Uh, I would move the first one. The first one, okay, so. Okay, so, yeah, so we already have a mover and seconder. So we don't need that, okay. Yeah. So then um, request to sever, Councillor Jeffrey. Okay, so the first then is to receive the report. Call the vote on that. All in favor. Okay, next is um, 
and that council directs staff to relocate uh, 1.774 million from the employee future benefit reserve to the life cycle reserve fund. Okay. Um, and uh, comments, questions on that? At, at this point, just, just comments. Okay. I guess uh, for me, I'll all be, always be consistent in this because this is always my comment when we have surpluses is that it came from the taxpayer, um, albeit over um, a long period of time, but a taxpayer who had to pay to catch up from the past has to pay to carry for the current and now is going to invest significantly in the future. So um, I come from a place where... I, I, I would really like us to do something with it for um, the taxpayer. Um, I do know that the life cycle reserve is desirable in terms of our future and having it available, but um, I, I'm just really stuck between this. And I do believe that if we don't need to fund the whole thing, then we should just apply the, the, the double, the 3.6 um, to the areas that we need that will will benefit the most. So those are my comments for now. Um, not having a recommendation yet as to where they should go, except to benefit um, taxpayers. And I, I really do feel like we get hit three ways and I do wanna come back at some point in the future because it's gonna be pretty good because we're doing a good job. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair Doherty, and uh, somewhat similar to uh, uh, Councillor Jeffrey's comments, um, I feel that under the circumstances, um, and I noted that an earlier uh, statement that I, a priority for me is always how current taxpayers being impacted by the situation, and and uh, one concern for me is that I likely wouldn't have, I would have been more hesitant to do the one point seven percent for the special capital levy um, that we did for the budget. Uh, if I'd known there was approximately $2 million more in life cycle reserve. Um, but the 1.7 is in place and I'm not asking for any consideration in that regard. Um, I just wanted to ask some questions about the full 3.5 million. Um, surplus because um, this is option one that's being presented to us and I am leaning towards option three. But I wanted to ask a couple of specific questions, if I may, to uh, Treasurer Quinlan, um, because one of the impacts if option three is chosen is it does require a restatement that's explained in the report. But I wondered if we could get a little more specific explanation uh, about the restatement um, and whether it just affects accumulated surplus or whether there's a uh, an impact on financial position. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Um, so the restatement itself would not change the financial position of the municipality as far as I uh, can see. Um, essentially, it would just mean a change in the overall accumulated surplus. Of course, this, the statement itself, the financial uh, statement may change just in the way we distribute the amounts, but I don't see that the financial position would change for the organization. Follow up? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so another question would be in regards to the annual amount that's been identified in the report, which is 101,400 for 21 or 2024. I think it's 100,400 for 2023. But again, I just want to clarify through the treasurer when we're talking about the 3.5 million full amount, um, does it include the 2023 portions? as well um, in that total, or have they been removed by entry already? Okay, and again, uh, Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Um, so the amount that is um, included in the actuarial report for 2023 is 101,400, and it has not been included in the 3.6 million. Um, we were waiting for Council's direction to understand um, the, the move forward. There are no amounts yet for 2024 as we get a new actuarial report. Mm -hmm. Any One of the reasons I was asking about that was because I was considering option three, which doesn't speak to the direction of um, of uh, of 2023 portion. So um, I'll I'll consider that when I'm 
put something forward because at the appropriate time, I'd like to bring forward that uh, um, consideration for option three, but I want to allow everybody else to speak before I put that uh, amendment forward on in regards to this particular one on the on the recommendations. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Baines, yes. uh, Mayor Hamlin, and... Thank you, Chair Doherty. I will not be in support of option three and will uh, support the staff recommendation of option one to transfer the 1.7 to life cycle replacement reserve. I hear uh, my colleague, Councillor Jeffries, uh, well pointed out statement in regard to uh, previous taxpayers' donation to this. And uh, that's a tough sort of moral question. But I would say my response is that uh, may sound corny, it's going to a, a greater good, I think, in uh, in its support by assisting the life cycle reserve, which I'm very concerned about. Um, uh, it's a tough call. I, I hear your point, but uh, at the end of the day, I will support option one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baines. Mayor Hamlin. Uh, thank you. I have a few questions uh, of the treasurer. Um, Am I right in thinking that we've been collecting for this for 35 years? It's my first question. Through you, Madam Chair. I think it's uh, 13 years, but... Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Derry. You're correct. Um, this PSAB uh, 3255 came into place in 2009. So since uh, 2009, this has been in place. And have we ever paid out uh, from this? If I may, uh, Councillor Doherty. Um, so the the eventuality of paying out would essentially mean that the municipality dissolves. So what what PSAP standard says is is that um, in case a municipality dissolves, you will have to have these liabilities um, avail listed on your financial statements. Um, that's why we say it's pretty minimal risk and many don't fund it because, it, you know, if we did dissolve, there'd be a whole lot of other problems as well. Yeah. And um, quite honestly, the assets of the organization would likely pay it. For those that, um, so that it's, and I know it's, it, it's, it's hard to write a report like this because there are so many intricacies that are involved, but there are people that have retired and would receive this benefit today, but that's included in our normal uh, budgeted municipal levy. So this isn't to pay for those people, it's to pay for the people that may, because remember it's an actuarial review that we receive this amount for, um, be entitled to this should the municipality dissolve at some point. So um, we would we have never paid this, but we we do have those few or um, employees that have retired and and are entitled to it and do receive their budgeted amount each year. Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you so much for that answer because uh, it clarifies uh, for me certainly that we don't need to collect it anymore. Um, and in terms of option three, where we take the two amounts. And I can, as I as I understand it, the two separate columns with one point seven million dollars each in them. If we're not, why would we even keep any of it? <laughs> like, if it's for such a remote possibility, Treasurer Quinlan, are you, Madam Chair? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Doherty, Madam Chair. Um, it's a great question, uh, Mayor Hamlin. I would say that. Um, we were erring on the side of conservatism to say, well, at some point, and I, and I don't know if there was discussions back in 2009, 2010, when this PSAB came into place and council did want to fund it. Um, it's unfortunate that it was being funded incorrectly, um, but um, so we did err on the side of conservatism, but I completely hear you. That's why we laid out the third option that it is possible. Mm -hmm. um, we're just erring more on the side of conservatism. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I, I think I, you know, am looking or leaning towards something to do with the third option. Um, and also, could you just clarify through you, Madam Chair, uh, what the Life Cycle Reserve Fund is for? Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Um, through you to Mayor Hamlin, uh, the Life Cycle Reserve is for asset management, um, as we've talked about quite a bit, and I'm sure everybody hates hearing me say those words again, but... Um, 
Uh, it's a key part of what we are concerned with for, as staff um, and understanding that the non-core asset management uh, pieces aren't yet included in our financing gap, um, which we expect to be coming out in the next uh, little while and expect to be quite big. So um, that's what it's there for. Okay, well, thank you very much for all those answers. I have a clear picture now, and I guess where I'm leaning right now is that uh, if these funds have been been collected since 2009, we have 15 years of various uh, ratepayers paying for this. Um, and I know it's really easy to say, yippee, we have 3.5 million, where can we spend it? Um, but I think, you know, I just feel that the current, you know, people who are paying shouldn't have all the benefit in terms of, you know, something we can create to spend this or for next year's taxes. I do think the life cycle reserve fund, just to repeat what Councillor Baines has said, is is a good option. Three and a half million dollars into that uh, will help a lot of road repairs. If I can just use one example, <laughs> and we have a lot more uh, things on our plate than that. And uh, we're going to have to find some way to fund it. And if we can put three million and a half dollars into it uh, through this exercise, I do think that's a prudent thing to do. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And CAO Skinner. Um, yes, just a, wanted to make a brief comment about who who's paying for what and when from a staff perspective. Um, when we do a big investment, when you do a big investment, if you went to build an art center or a multi-use recreation center, and um, you know, typically you could do things like save up in advance, uh, which means that the current taxpayer is paying for something that they may or may not get the full use out of, or you can borrow all the money, in which case, you know, potentially uh, people who are being born now might be paying for something that, you know, they it's being enjoyed by many people before them. Um, and often there's a split, of course. Asset management is a little different, I believe, than some of those pieces uh, because the asset management is for the generally the current contracts. What we do when we set a certain amount that is the, the, the flat amount that one would pay every year for asset management is that we're saying some years there's big contracts and some years they're little, but it's just because sometimes we've got a rig, big road contract and sometimes we have a small one, but it's the total amount that the current taxpayer should be paying um, such that council is able to renew our existing assets when they need it. And we have the, the exact actual contracts that that money is planned for set out in the report for asset management. Um, so if you're over contributing to asset management, there could be an argument that the current taxpayer you know, shouldn't be over con contributing. Um, right now, and you'll learn more with the non-core assets when the report comes forward uh, this year, um, we're in a gap situation where the current taxpayer, um, and for some years before this, um, we have not contributed quite enough. There's a bit of a structural problem that we're going to have to get through together. Um, uh, so while I have some sympathy to those who've paid in over time, I do believe this is about um, assets and funding that will be spent in the relatively short term for the ongoing improvement of the roads, improvement of the light standards and those things um, that the current electorate uh, will see done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, did, were you going to uh, make an amendment? Okay, go ahead. I was just waiting to see if you had any comment yourself and before I did that. Yes, thank you, and I do. And that is um, that I uh, am also inclined to support option three, um, seeing as um, the likelihood that we would ever pay out is virtually zero. Um, seeing number two, that our life cycle reserves at the moment are so far behind. And uh, I think the CAO also has made a very good point that while uh, taxpayers of the past may have been paying into this fund, um, they were not paying into 
a life cycle reserve. And so we are now in a situation where we're a little behind. Uh, so for all those reasons, I actually would be inclined to support option three. Um, but I will allow the... Yeah. So... But we have a, an amendment that we're, do we have to do? do, 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 do. Uh -huh. So I guess we need, so I think the only issue is if we have the last two, the council, thank you, the council. So we should. Address the okay. And then we could also put, uh, Deputy Mayor, we could also put your option on. Since you've already been severed. Yes. Uh, so I believe what the clerk's suggesting is we vote on option one, which was presented, um, and see if that passes. Um, and I, I guess I'm okay with that. Um, because I did want to put option three on the table. Um, so I think I'm hearing pretty, I guess that's the issue is uh, I, I don't want to lose an opportunity to to have my option. Oh. The, option three doesn't designate where the other 50% is going. That's what I was going to amend um, uh, to designate where I was proposing it. Okay. Go. So let's, we'll, we'll go through um the balance of this motion vote on it and then we'll bring your uh, amendment on the table and vote on that so uh so um we have received oh so and the second part of the uh motion is that uh council direct staff to reallocate one point 774 million from the employee future benefit reserve to the life cycle reserve fund. And I will call the vote. Oh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just to be clear, um, because uh, this got a little more confusing than I thought it was going to be. Um, I actually support the staff recommendation about the first 50% going to life cycle reserve. It's just that I want to put something forward about the other 50 percent so um i'm just making sure that i'm clear to everybody that i'm going to vote in support of this but then i'm going to put something forward about the other 50 percent i just okay. i thought i better be clear about that and if anybody has any questions then then they can bring them forward so okay yeah. great thank you Okay, so then we will call the vote on reallocating 1.774 million um, to the Life Cycle Reserve Fund. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, everyone except me. Okay, post. Sorry? I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Councillor Barry. He's he's behind my laptop here. Okay. So, um, yeah. So that then passes uh, to alloc reallocating that part. Now, then, um, uh, I guess we'll go to the third uh, part of the motion, and then we can go to the amendment because that is just the question of continuance or discontinuance. Hey, Chair, I, I think the decision about the other allocation could impact this final one. Um, so I submit that we consider concern or consider uh, the amendment I'm gonna put forward about the, the other 
Okay, uh, go ahead then, Deputy Mayor. Okay. So, um, in regards to this, to the second fifty percent, um, we have heard, uh, and and one of the factors for me was the uh, very very minimal chance that it would be necessary. And my immediate thought came to um, some more immediate needs. And I was supportive of the LCR getting 50% uh, of it. And what I'd like to propose about the other 50% is it be turned over to another pending liability we're gonna, or, or, or responsibility we're going to have, and that's the hospital fund. Uh, I'd like to propose, um, a, 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 I guess it would be a, a motion uh, that the other 50% uh, go to the hospital fund um, and further that the 2023 portions um, not be recorded into the employee future benefits. Um, that's the wording I have. Uh, Kirk Thomas, are you okay? With what I said there. Clear comments. Sorry, your remaining piece was in further that the 2023 expense amount not be recorded into employee future benefits. Okay, thank you. So but just so I under, if I may, just so I understand your motion. So what you're saying is that, um, in effect, that um, the funding of the future benefit liability would end in December 31st, 2022. Okay. Um, Treasurer Quinlan, did, were you going to comment on that? Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Doherty. Um, I think that um, included in the option for like, what the options that were proposed was that, you know, we would go one way or the other. Transferring the um, the additional 1.7 is is really what we need to deal with. The, I think overall you've accepted staff's um, proposal to carry on with um, no longer funding it um, and taking the 1.7, but I'm happy if it's included to make it more clear for sure. So what's in there now is fine. Deputy Mayor. And through you to the treasurer, I guess what was throwing me was um, I was thinking the third part of the motion would cover things, but it says effective December 31st, 2023. And I think that's why Councillor Doherty or, or Chair Doherty, um, mentioned what you mentioned. So um, I'm fine with just dealing with the 50%, and then when we come up with the other one, I'll propose that it's December 31st, 2022. And I think that'll okay. cover it. So, so I have put the motion forward uh, for the second 50% to um, be allocated to the hospital reserve. Okay, um, Councillor Bain, uh, Councillor Baines. Eve, uh, Mayor Hamlin was before me, so. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Ham. I'm uh, sorry, Mayor Hamlin. I didn't see your card. That's okay. I'm because I don't have it. I'm raising my raising my hand. Um. So I'm I I am conflicted about what to do uh, with the seven point seven million uh, and that we're now talking about. And I, it would be helpful for me to have staff advice on this. I know our community is going to be asked to assist in the funding of the hospital uh, once a new hospital, once the province makes the announcement. Uh, there will be considerable fundraising going on in our community uh, and in the communities around us uh, to make up the funds that are needed. Um, and of course, we're now trying to balance, you know, fixing, you know, our roads and light standards and all the other things that we need in place to have our our municipality uh, operate properly. And I would like some advice on this. I don't, I don't know if this is uh, something I'd like to hear from our CAO. If you think there'd be advice that we should wait to hear from, because um, this is a hard one for me. <laughs> CAO Skinner. Through the chair, I think this would be a hard one for staff as well that we would want to to 
take it away and think through the potential options outside of the life cycle fund. Um, certainly we have no, um, we have a general um, thrust of support for the hospital in, in general. Uh, we definitely would like a new hospital here in Collingwood. Um, that said, I don't think we could think through it, um, all the implications live um, mm -hmm. tonight. Thank you. So with that in mind, uh, if I wanted a staff to provide some advice on this before we vote, should I be asking for a deferral of this particular motion, part of the motion, uh, Clerk Gomez? I'm okay. saying the clerk nod yes to that. Okay, yeah. so I will ask for a deferral of this uh, last 50% of 1.774100 uh, for staff uh, advice. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Second. Um, we... Hold on. Okay. Uh, Councillor Bain said yes. You, you you can second that alternative to defer back to staff for advice. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Hamlin, and I, I can appreciate the um, uh, Mayor's comments about uh, wanting further information. Um, I just want to inquire, um, does this mean that uh, it could still come to the table in, um, in, at the next meeting uh, for, for um, approval at the formal council meeting? Um, the reason I'm asking is because uh, the way it'll time out if it can't is I won't be here um, when uh, on April 22nd and it seems to me like the timing of it would come to the table then for the formal approval. So I guess my question through you to the to the clerk is it, it would the referral allow it still to come to council on in I guess three weeks is not two weeks right? Thank you. Thank you. I guess for clarification, we should uh, receive the input um, from the mover of the motion. Are you referring it back for staff advice to come forward at a committee of the whole, or would you like to come back directly to council? Sorry, I would like it to come back to committee of a whole, okay. and I'm more than uh, happy to have it come back once uh, Deputy Fryer, or Deputy Mayor Fryer's uh, able to participate after his when he's away. Thank you. Okay, then, uh, is that are you is that satisfactory? Well, I, I, as I explained, yeah. I think the timing yeah. will will mean that it I, it'd be coming to table, so I won't be supporting the, the referral at this point in time. Okay, the committee of whole. All right, so I I have a motion. Oh, I uh, think I need to clarify that because I think what I said was to a date after, so that a day after the deputy mayor uh, is back at the council table. So we could say on or after whatever date you're going to return. Is it April twenty second? So I, I you know I'm just trying to accommodate your schedule. I'm not trying to do anything else. So I think if we could add that bit in, I think I would be happy with that. Okay, so uh, we have a motion to refer back to staff to return uh, after her comments. Certainly. Out here. Jen, yeah, just to provide clarity, it can come back to the committee, the whole, and if at the time the, the motion is carried unanimous, whatever the recommendation is, it potentially could come back to council on the 22nd or council can make the, or the committee can make the decision that the report not go to the next, the council meeting until the first meeting in May. I understand so, we can make allowances. It's yeah. the 22nd that I'll miss. So I just wanted to ask. Okay. Town, uh, Vice Chair Ring, did you want to make comment? No, only that I was just going to confirm what the mayor just said. Okay. All right, then uh, I will call the vote to refer um, that part of the uh, funding question back to staff. So, uh, all in favor? 
and opposed. Okay, so noted. Okay, so that will go back to staff and um, then we can move on to item 14.2.7, the heritage So my understanding was that that's what we were doing, because yeah. it's attention. Thank you. So just just confirming then that the the remaining part of that po uh, motion would also be deferred based on the feedback that we're receiving regarding the use of the money for the hospital funds. Was it? That was, that was not your intention. Okay. Defer the 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 other part. Okay. Well, then I will call the vote on the, on the other part. Um. So, um. Councilor Jeffrey, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just thought I heard that there was an amendment from 23 to 22, so. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Doherty, and that's what I had said I would put forward is, is that it's 2022. Okay. Uh, so I, I do believe it can be voted on. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily um, with what uh, Mayor Hamlin wanted done uh, with regards to the other 50%. Like to okay. Say. All right. So uh, the amendment then to the third part of this motion um, is that staff would discontinue funding to the employee future benefit uh, on a go forward basis effective. The last fiscal year, which was December 31st, 2022. Uh, so uh, seconder for that. Okay, Councillor Jeffrey. So I will call the vote on Mayor Hamlin. Yes, I have some questions around that of the treasurer through you. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, if we're picking up all the funding, which is three and a half million and you know, doing other things with it uh, that's been collected. Haven't we picked up the funding to all for all of 2023? I mean, we're in 24 now, and I just I just don't understand why we're not double counting by making this December 22. So I'm just asking if the treasurer could explain that. Treasurer Quinlan. Thank you, Chair Doherty. Um, so just to be clear, we have not booked the entry for 2023 yet. Um, we always book it on December 31st, 2023. That's why we use that dating. So it doesn't, going back to 2022, um, wasn't what I was trying to explain, wasn't quite necessary because the booking, it says effective December 31st, 2023. So the entry gets booked in the last day of the year. So um, for 2023, which happens <laughs> in 2024, just to make it extremely confusing for everybody. Um, but we have not booked what the actuarial assessment is for this, for the end of the last fiscal year, 2023. So that 100,000, 101, 400 that's listed in the report is not included in the 3.6 million that we've been discussing. And sorry, through you, Madam Chair, just Go trying ahead. to understand this. So the 100,000 for 2023, we've collected property, we've collected taxes for that. Is that correct uh, through you, Madam Chair? Treasurer Quinlan? We, in general, do not budget this amount on an annual basis. So it says in the report that we have not budgeted for it in the past. It gets sort of soaked up in the annual surplus calculations at the end of the year. Um, so um, no, we did not raise taxes specifically for the 100,000 that we were referring to in 2023. Okay, so my last question, well, I hope uh, through you, Madam Chair, is what is the impact then to, you know, financially to the town if we make this December 31, 2022? If I may, uh, um, Chair Doherty. 
So all it means is that we will no longer um, book this amount as an expense to the organization um, each year. We'll still book a liability, um, but it will go directly to our PSAB um, accumulated surplus. So the liability will still show up on our financial statements, but it will be listed as an unfunded liability, similar to our grain terminal um, liability that's listed on our financial statements today. That $8 million we have booked um, a few years back is not a funded liability. So it would be the same situation for this. Okay, so I'll just, uh, here's my last question then through you, Madam Chair. So it doesn't really matter from your perspective if it's 22 or 23, it's the same result? If I may, Councillor Doherty, no, it doesn't really matter. Thank you, that's all good. Okay, good, okay. thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Just for clarification, um, if the 101 gets booked, then it's $3.7 million instead of 3.6 that we're splitting up. And and Treasurer can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and all I was saying by going to the 22nd or, or, or 2022, um, it'll, it'll come through into the operating surplus for the end of 2023. Um, so. Yeah. Treasurer Quinlan. Uh, thank you, Councillor Doherty. Just, just to be clear, the entry gets booked on December 31st, 2023. And what we're saying is that we would no longer fund it effective December 31st, it, December 31st, 2023, which means that the 2023 101 would not get booked regardless of what, um, it, of changing that to 2022 because the entry actually occurs on December 31st, 2023. And we're saying effective that date, we will no longer book it, which means the 101 will not be booked for 2023. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I was looking at it at the end of December 31st and you're saying it's actually the, the beginning of December 31st. So um, I don't need to put that amendment forward because as the treasurer just mentioned, the entry won't get booked anyway. Yeah. Okay. So you're w withdrawing the amendment. Yes. yes. Okay. So then uh, we'll just bring back the third part of the motion as originally pro proposed, uh, and that council directs staff to discontinue funding the employee future benefit liability on a go forward basis effective December 31st, 2023. All in favor. And that carries unanimously. Clerk Columbus. Thank you. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I have been informed that the county is doing server maintenance at 9 p.m. tonight. So we have 15 minutes um, to finish the meeting. So I don't know if there's some priority items that you would like to proceed with or defer to items to the next meeting. Okay, so uh, I haven't noticed a moment. The heritage. I can make a suggestion. Oh, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you. I have a notice of motion and I had three other businesses, but it's too bad we didn't know ahead. I think it'd be useful uh, for the notice of motion about Councillor Doherty being elected to the ammo board to go ahead this evening. Thank you. I actually I was going to ask uh, if if that would be possible. Um, and um, uh, Deputy Mayor, just a suggestion that perhaps we can uh, leave fourteen point two point seven, and uh, in the reports and minutes of boards, mm -hmm. and just try to get in what you get in. Uh, yes. Just go right yes, to the and, AMO. and uh, I, well, I... Just, just uh, go right to the AMO. I believe that we can do that. I'll just, um, just look to Director Valentine just with regard to the Heritage Reserve Fund review. Or is this a, this is, oh, sorry, this is Treasurer Quinlan. Is there any issues with deferring this? I, I don't think so, Councilor Doherty, thank you. No, I think it's fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, so then we will defer 14.2.7. Uh, 
IT is checking the county. So. Okay, well, then we can. Okay, well, then, um, uh, if I uh, may, um, we have uh, one notice of motion that was uh, posted on the agenda. And then, um, depending upon the response from IT, we can carry on with the rest of the items. Uh, so, um, if I can turn the chair to the vice chair, just so I can bring a uh, notice of motion with regard to AMO board. Uh, so, um, whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario is a nonpartisan entity that represents the interests of municipalities on policy and program matters that follow that fall within provincial jurisdiction, and whereas AMO's board of directors is comprised of elected municipal officials from all regions and sizes of communities to form a broad base of support and provide AMO with feedback and emphasis required to carry the municipal message to the provincial government. And whereas the AMO annual conference will be held in Ottawa on August 18 to 21, 2024, during which the annual general meeting will occur, followed by the election of AMO's board of directors and reporting caucuses, be it resolved that the Council of the Town of Collingwood endorse Councillor Doherty to stand for election on AMO's Board of Directors and Small Urban Caucus, and further that Council assume all costs associated with Councillor Doherty attending AMO's Board of Directors meetings up to the allocated approved budgeted amount. So. Seconder to that motion? It's a, it's a notice. Oh, it's a notice, yeah. Sorry, yeah. It, yeah, we're only, yeah. okay, I thought yeah. you. It's a notice, um, but just to make my timing. Um, and? So, Council of Jeffrey has one too, but you don't need to read it. If she just wants to say the time of the Okay, um, right, okay. Um, Councillor Jeffrey, um, you have a notice of motion that is. You can put on the table yep. forthwith. Yep. Therefore, be it resolved that the federal government work with agreement signatories and municipalities to maintain the Canada Community Building Fund as a source of direct, predictable, long-term funding for local infrastructure priorities, and be it further resolved that the federal government commit in Budget 2024 to the next generation of infrastructure programs, including a new program for water and wastewater infrastructure and an increase to the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, and be it further resolved that the federal government convene provinces, territories, and municipalities to negotiate a municipal growth framework to modernize the way that municipalities municipalities are funded in order to enable Canada's long-term growth and further that this motion be circulated to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities of Canada, MP Terry Dowdle and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Thank you. And uh, that will come forward at our next meeting of council. Uh, and uh, Councillor Baines, you had one, but it has already been put forward. Great. Okay. Have we heard from IT? Okay. Um, all right. Then the clerk has suggested that we will just go back to our previous items. So the next item on the agenda was the Her Heritage Reserve Fund Review. Staff report being on a scale spinner. Staff report point. And then do all the other council seat items. Uh, the Heritage Reserve Fund staff report, yes. Yeah, we can wait. So all we have then is the reports and minutes of other committees. Yep. So and wait. then rise. And that's it. The notice of motion. Registered deputations. We can do a check right now, friend, and show you the Yeah, okay. 
We're just going to do a check right now for any unregistered deputations that might wish to address uh, the community as a whole. If you'd like to speak to the committee, please press the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Okay, um, so it looks as though we have 14.2.7, just to confirm, we will defer that and we can defer um, the acceptance of reports and minutes of other committees and boards to our next meeting, which leaves us, uh, is there any old or deferred business? Is there any new business? Councillor Potts. Thanks, Chair Doherty. Um, I can certainly, uh, with the forgiveness of time, um, have this on maybe the agenda for next meeting, but I wanted to kind of speak on the, I've received a quite a bit of correspondence the last couple of days that generated from a conversation on backyard chickens. So I thought uh, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it's something that we can get added onto the agenda. Um, I've had lots of correspondence actually in the last 24 hours, so I would be con felt compelled that I should bring it forward and and uh, do that. So if that's something maybe to the clerk that we could have added to the next committee agenda, which is, is that proper? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um... New business, <laughs> then we have to, uh, I will make the motion then to rise from Committee of the Whole. It doesn't matter, it's okay. Councilor Jeffrey? Yeah, if new is, is the new other, uh, I, I'm good. I just wanted, I wanted to ask really quickly to get the answer, I know that we were, uh, for time with the premier, but I wondered if we got to a question about inclusionary zoning. I um, wanted to propose that we do a review with respect to the decision of the full-time mayor from the perspective of when we did it last time, we simply attached money to it. We didn't put any parameters and I know the mayor has had some feedback and I think going forward, um, you know, we've had feedback from the public, should we attach um, minimum office hours, maximum holidays? Should we reimburse the deputy mayor full-time when he takes the place of the, a full-time mayor when she's away? And I think we should have a policy review and it would have been ideal for a governance committee had that come to fruition. I don't know where we're at with that, but I think that's, um, I think for the fairness of everybody, for the mayor too, to be able to bring her input from that position, whether it's resources or things that she felt she didn't have. Uh, I think that we should put um, something to that going forward. So I had that one, that one, and just to offer, I'm a Georgian College graduate if Councillor Ring needs any uh, wingman. And um, to ask if the CAO would bring the key performance measurements forward on economic development so that we can see what shifts were made as a result of COVID and those things. And the other thing is just to announce that I was featured in UCLG Global Publication um, as a leader in women's issues and uh, at the invitation of the CEO of Carol Saab. And if anybody wants that link, I can send it to you. Thank you. Glad I asked. I thought you were waving your card to adjourn. Is there any other new business? Okay, then um, we will then, um, I will make a motion or I will accept a motion to rise from Committee of the Whole. Councillor Baines, Councillor Houston. All in favor. Okay. And I will turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you. Uh, the last uh, matter of business here is a recommendation that bylaw number 2024-025 
being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular meeting of council held March 18, 2024, be enacted and passed this 18th day of March, 2024. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Houston, seconded by Councillor Ring. All those in favor? And uh, we can just sneak in a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Councillor Potts seems to have it. All those in favor? <laughs> and we're adjourned. One moment, one minute to spare. Thank you. <sighs>